Chapter 1 Sammy Lopez, a.k.a. Angelina Morales, threw a worried glance over her shoulder. She couldn't see anyone following her, but the dark clouds rolling in made it difficult to be sure. She was still reeling over the events that had taken place on shore. Her cover had been blown in the worst way possible. The strong scent of gasoline wafted toward her. Not an unusual scent while out on a low-slung speedboat, but strong enough to give her pause. She'd spent her teenage years on the water and in boats, but there was no denying that while she was speeding across Lake Michigan, a lake that was over 2,200 square miles across, the inability to see either shoreline was unnerving. She was literally in the middle of the lake, where the depths could reach over 900 feet. The wind kicked up, the dark clouds swirling fast along the horizon, bringing another rush of concern. The gasoline scent grew stronger. Something was terribly wrong. As a Drug Enforcement Administration agent working undercover, Sammy had long since learned to trust her gut. Bad enough things had spiraled out of control when she'd left Cambridge, Michigan, and now this? The situation had gone from bad to worse. She wanted to take a closer look at the large Mercury Marine engine on her boat's stern, but the impending storm would not make that an easy task. Cutting back on the speed, she fought hard to keep the bow of the craft pointing west. Her ultimate destination was the small town of Shady Lane, located about 50 miles outside of Milwaukee along the Wisconsin shoreline. At least, that had been the plan. Now, she'd take just about any city along the coast of Wisconsin as long as she made it there alive. Come on, come on, she whispered, the wind making it impossible to hear her own voice. You can do this. The boat engine abruptly sputtered and died. Without the engine to power the craft, the wind took control, buffeting the low-slung boat from side to side, threatening to dump her up and over the edge. She wore a life jacket with a rope and buoy attached as an extra safety measure, but there were no other boats around as far as she could see. The average temperature of Lake Michigan in the summer even in July, was 72 degrees. How long would she be able to survive in the water before hypothermia claimed her? No, don't think about it. Grabbing the radio, she flipped the switch to call for help. There was nothing but dead air, not even static. Alarm skittered across her skin. A huge wave almost knocked her off the boat, but she clung to the wheel and bent over, trying to troubleshoot the radio. Droplets of water stung her eyes, making it difficult to see. The bucking up and down of the boat didn't exactly help either. Using her fingers, she checked the connection, reaching all the way up into the console. The sharp ends of two wires stabbed her fingertips. It took a moment for her to realize the wires had been cut. Her radio had been sabotaged. The scent of gasoline was even stronger now, deepening her sense of apprehension. If the radio had been tampered with, she had little doubt that the engine had been too. She needed to get away. Without hesitation, she kicked off her shoes, stepped up onto the captain's chair, and jumped off the rocking boat, propelling herself as far from the craft as possible and into the white-capped waves. Water closed over her, giving a brief reprieve from the wind. As she broke the surface, she gasped for air. The waves were much higher than she'd anticipated, crashing over her head and dunking her deeper into the depths of the second largest of the Great Lakes. Swimming was her strong suit. She'd won several medals in high school and college, but that was in long Olympic-length pools, not choppy lake water in the middle of a storm. Still, she had confidence in her ability. Sputtering, she quickly pulled the chained buoy toward her. Tucking it under her chest, she used it to keep her higher above the water level, as she did her best to swim away from the boat, silently praying for Jesus to keep her safe from harm. She hadn't gotten very far when a loud explosion rocked the air. Sammy instinctively turned onto her back, lifting her arm to protect herself when a chunk of fiberglass sailed toward her. Pain exploded in her head. Then there was nothing but darkness. Lou, Finnegan, we... Report of an explosion, roughly 20 nautical miles 
your location. The voice over the radio was occasionally broken up by static. The storm on the horizon was wreaking havoc with the transmission. Requesting, on scene to determine, rescue. 10-4. Quinn Finnegan understood the garbled message. Unit 12 responding. He pushed the throttle of the Coast Guard cutter forward, sending the boat leaping over the choppy waves. An explosion was hardly a normal call, although much of the summer months were spent in rescue efforts. Boat engines didn't just blow up. Every one of Quinn's senses was on red alert. Was this some sort of trap? The Coast Guard was a highly competitive branch of the military, one he proudly served. But over the past few years, more and more boats were being used to transport drugs. And no one hated the Coast Guard more than drug runners. The feeling was mutual. He reached for the radio again. Dispatch? Who called in the report? The captain, charter fishing boat, came the response. They saw, heading back to shore. Ten four. Quinn decided he'd have to size up the situation once they got there. His junior partner, Callum Jenkins, came up to stand beside him. What was that, about an explosion? Cal shouted above the wind. Report was called in by a charter fishing boat. He didn't glance at his junior ensign, his gaze glued to the horizon. In the distance, he could see a ball of orange bobbing in the water. Was that their target? The wind buffeted their Coast Guard cutter, but he didn't slacken his speed, using all his strength to hold the wheel steady, keeping them on course. If there were survivors in the boat or in the water, they were likely injured or dead. Having been raised as a Christian, attending church with his eight siblings when he wasn't scheduled to work or deployed by the Coast Guard, he was very familiar with the concept of forgiveness and redemption. That didn't mean he had much sympathy for drug runners. He despised the poison they spread, especially to the younger generation. Deaths from fentanyl were on the rise among teenagers. The synthetic drug was easy to make and cheap to buy. It made him sick to know the occupants of the boat might be involved in that. Yet, who these people were, or what they did, wasn't the point. His job was to rescue anyone in need. Besides, he could be wrong. The boat might belong to a couple of kids who thought it would be fun to take a joyride despite the impending storm. Yet, that wouldn't explain the explosion. In his experience, boat engines didn't just blow up, not without help. The ball of orange grew bigger and brighter as they raced toward it. Quinn scanned the surface of the lake, searching for survivors. He didn't see anything, but in water this choppy, he would need to get closer to know for sure. Even if the victims were wearing life jackets with a flashing reflector, finding them bobbing beneath the waves wouldn't be easy. Based on the velocity of the wind, calling for the Coast Guard chopper wasn't an option. He and Cal would just have to haul any possible survivors in by themselves. Adrenaline surged as the cutter drew closer to the wreckage. He could see that the stern of the boat was engulfed in flames. No one was behind the wheel. It was possible the captain had been knocked unconscious during the explosion and was lying along the bottom of the vessel. I don't see anyone. Do you? Cal asked. Negative. The moment the word left his mouth, he spotted something bobbing in the water on the opposite side of the craft. It wasn't the usual reflector on a life jacket, but it was definitely a person. There, do you see it? One victim overboard. Keep your eyes peeled for others. Yes, sir. Quinn pulled back on the throttle, bringing their speed down. Cranking on the wheel, he made a wide berth around the damaged boat to approach the victim. He didn't dare go any faster, lest there be other victims floating nearby. But he didn't see anyone else. When he was roughly 40 yards away from the bobbing person in the water, he throttled back, putting the cutter in reverse for a moment to slow their momentum. The victim didn't wave or acknowledge their presence, giving him a sense of dread. Was he already dead? Cal, man the wheel. He waited until the young ensign stepped forward to take his place, then shifted out of the way. I'm going in after him. Sir? Cal sounded alarmed. 
Are you sure? Yes. Someone had to jump into the lake, and Quinn had five years of experience over the younger man. Even though he was only 31 years old, there were times he felt downright ancient. Your job is to hold her steady, understand, and search for other survivors. Yes, sir. The kid looked overwhelmed, but Quinn trusted Cal to follow orders. The Coast Guard was a competitive branch of the military. They only took the best of the best. The fact that this kid was with him now meant he'd already passed rigorous training. Still, they'd been riding together for the past two months without ever experiencing a rescue like this. After hitching himself to a safety line and double-checking his life jacket and rescue gear, Quinn moved to the aft side of the vessel. Up ahead, he could see the victim still bobbing in the water, head tilted to the side as if the person was unconscious. On one hand, he was glad to be hauling in someone who didn't fight you with every stroke. He just hoped the victim was still alive. As he prepared to jump overboard, the skies above opened, sending a deluge of rain down upon them. The wind kicked up, the rain stinging his eyes, making it hard to see. The rain would help keep the boat fire under control, even if fueled by gasoline, but it would have the opposite effect on his rescue efforts. The wind and the rain would make it much more difficult to get to the victim before he drowned. Quinn jumped off the edge of the cutter, stealing himself as the cold water enveloped him. He was already drenched from the rain, but the lake water was chilly against his skin. He took a moment to gather the rope with the red Coast Guard life preserver ring attached to it. Then he struck out in a side stroke in the direction of the victim. Between the water pummeling him from above and the waves crashing into his face, he was breathless by the time he managed to get within 15 feet of the boat passenger. Tossing his head to get water off his face, he eyed the victim. Dark hair was plastered around a face with dainty features. A woman. A dark gash over the left side of her forehead indicated she was injured, or worse. He kicked his legs, propelling himself closer. His training was such that he knew it wasn't a good idea to get too close to a victim. Drowning people had been known to drag their rescuers down in a surge of panic. But the way the rain pounded her face without any movement from her made him think that wouldn't be a problem. Hey, he shouted against the wind. I'm Lieutenant Finnegan with the Coast Guard. Can you hear me? She didn't move, didn't lift her head or acknowledge him in any way. He continued swimming closer, noticing the wide section of fiberglass floating a few yards away from his victim. After several powerful kicks, he finally managed to reach the woman's side. She'd been smart enough to have a buoy clipped to her life vest. The small beacon on the vest, though, was broken, maybe a result of the explosion or the fiberglass wreckage. He had no idea what had transpired before he'd arrived. He quickly searched for a pulse, silently praying she wasn't dead. With the rain getting in his eyes, he couldn't see her clearly to verify that she was breathing. Her skin was cold and clammy beneath his touch. A large wave rolled over them, making him sputter. His fingers found her carotid artery, and he was reassured to feel the faint beat of her heart. At least he wouldn't have to do CPR while hauling her back to the cutter. Relieved, he turned the victim so that her back was facing him. Blinking against the rain, he fought a momentary surge of panic when he didn't immediately see the cutter. There, he swallowed hard, realizing it was almost 50 yards away. Maybe Cal didn't trust himself to get any closer. Quinn took a deep breath and began swimming again, slowly bringing his female victim along. It didn't seem possible, but the waves were worse now. Crashing over him and the woman with such velocity, he feared they wouldn't make it. The high waves forced him to glance back at her, to make sure the woman's face was clear and not submerged in water. The fact that she didn't cough made him worry she wasn't breathing. And if that was the case, her pulse wouldn't last long. He kicked his legs again and again, but the cutter didn't seem to be getting any closer. He tried tugging on the line to get Cal's attention so the younger officer could haul them in. Out of nowhere, a second explosion rocked the night. He instinctively ducked his head while reaching behind to pull the woman's head and upper torso closer to his body to protect her from falling debris. 
Bits and pieces of fiberglass and boat parts pelted the lake water around them. Something hard struck his arm, sending pain zinging through him. They weren't going to make it. As soon as the thought entered his mind, Quinn shoved it out. They would make it. Failure was not an option. Please, Lord Jesus, keep us safe. The silent prayer brought a sense of calm, soothing his nerves. When he was convinced that they were clear of any more flying debris, he shifted the woman back into a rescue hold. Then he struck out swimming again, pushing himself harder than ever, kicking with as much strength as he could muster. He had to get this woman to the cutter. Quinn had no idea how long he and his victim had been in the lake or how much water he'd swallowed, but soon the lights of the cutter came into view. Cal must have finally began pulling on the line, as the going was easier now. He was relieved to have the kid's help in bringing this victim in. Lieutenant, Cal shouted, should I send down the skid? The skid was a long flotation device that used to bring unconscious victims into the boat. Fighting the waves and the wind had sapped his strength, but Quinn didn't think he needed to use the skid. The woman didn't weigh that much, from what he could tell. I've got her. Three more powerful kicks brought him to the edge of the boat. He reached up and grasped the ladder, holding it for a moment to catch his breath. The waves continued to batter him, slamming him up against the side of the cutter. He tightened his grip in sheer determination. He could do this. Getting his feet under him, he propped them on the lower rung of the ladder. Then he used one arm to pull himself upward, holding on to the victim with the other. He drew the woman up with him, one rung of the ladder at a time, until he was close enough to the top where Cal waited. I need you to grab her, he said, between panting breaths. Yes, sir. Cal bent over the side, grabbed the woman's life jacket, and hauled her the rest of the way up and into the boat. Thank you, Lord. Relief washed over him as he managed to climb the last few ladder rungs to get to safety. He almost fell on his face, his legs giving out from exertion. The rain continued to pelt him in the face, though, so lying on the deck wasn't an option. He rolled to his knees, took another deep breath, and pushed himself to his feet. Thankfully, his muscles seemed to cooperate by supporting him. His shoulder throbbed, but he ignored it. Shivering, he hobbled over to where Cal had carried the woman into the cabin of the vessel to protect her from the rain. Grabbing a towel from the stack stored on every cutter, he swiped it over his head and face, then draped it over his shoulders. Blood ran down his arm, so he used a smaller blanket to staunch the flow. Then he knelt on the other side of the woman as Cal removed her life jacket and buoy. Alarm raised the hair on the back of his neck. Does she still have a pulse? Yes, but she's not breathing. I'll give her rescue breaths. You grab the medical supplies. There's an ambu bag and mask in there. Without waiting for Cal's response, Quinn bent and gave the woman two rescue breaths. Nothing. He tried again, giving two more breaths. She abruptly threw up, gagging as her lungs expelled the water she'd inhaled. He quickly turned her onto her side, using the edge of the towel to wipe her face. Now that he could see the victim more clearly, he realized she looked familiar. I've got it, Cal said breathlessly, setting the large red box beside him. Thanks, but we don't need it. She's okay. Coughing like crazy, but otherwise okay. You need it for your arm, he grimaced. Later, take the wheel. Circle around the boat to see if you see other survivors, just in case their reflector signals were damaged too. If not, get us back to shore pronto. You sure? Cal's eyes brightened at the opportunity to drive the boat. Yes, hurry. Quinn searched for another towel and used it to pat the woman's damp hair. Then he grabbed a foil blanket to combat hypothermia. You okay, ma'am? What's your name? She was still coughing, her face turned away from him. It took her several minutes to regain her composure. Pushing herself into a sitting position, she took the towel from him and buried her face in the cotton fabric. He draped the foil blanket around her, making her look like a skinny baked potato. Then she raised her head to look at him. Shock reverberated through him. 
She was his former fiance, Sammy Lopez. His mouth dropped open. This couldn't be right. Sammy was dead. Two years ago, he and Sammy had been planning their wedding. Then she'd abruptly told him she couldn't marry him. She'd returned his ring and told him she was moving to California. Just a few months later, he'd heard she died in the line of duty while in L.A. Her obituary was still in his home office. Yet here she was, looking at him. Sammy, what in the world happened? I thought you were dead. Were you on the boat by yourself? Or are there other victims we should be searching for? He knew he was peppering her with questions, but he needed answers. I don't know. A look of confusion crossed her features. She looked away from him, her gaze taking in her surroundings. You're with the Coast Guard? Yes, he frowned. Sammy knew full well he was with the Coast Guard. They'd struggled at times to make their schedules work, but he'd thought they were okay. Only they weren't. Sammy had made that perfectly clear. It was even more shocking, though, to realize she wasn't dead. The cutter buffeted with the wind. In the distance, he saw another cutter heading toward the burning boat, no doubt to help tow it to shore. I need to know who else I need to be out there searching for. He didn't bother to hide his exasperation. You know as well as I do that it's dangerous to take a boat out all by yourself, especially this far from shore. I, uh, don't think there's anyone else. She did not sound the least bit confident. The dazed confusion was still in her dark eyes, and she lifted a hand to gingerly touch the wound on her forehead. My head hurts. I'm sure it does. He stared at her for a long moment. Sammy didn't usually avoid direct questions. She'd been a cop and had never hesitated to put herself in danger. The way she was looking around, as if she had no idea who he was, wrinkled. Two years wasn't that long. He couldn't have changed that much. Was it possible this woman wasn't Sammy? He'd heard everyone had a twin somewhere in the world. No way. He knew this was Sammy. Come on, Sammy. Talk to me. Tell me what happened. He gentled his tone, hoping to reassure her. You're safe now. Am I? She frowned. I would like to tell you what happened, but I don't know. He stared at her. You must know. You were there, on the boat. What happened? Do you have any idea why the engine exploded? Boat engines don't explode, she protested. Swallowing another surge of frustration, he nodded. Yeah, I know, which is why I need to understand what happened. Wincing, she dropped her hand to her lap. Honestly, I'd like to help you, but I don't remember. A chill that had nothing to do with the weather snaked over him. You don't remember being on the boat? No. She stared at him for a moment. I get the sense you know me. You called me Sammy. Is that my name? The chill coalesced into ice. He held her gaze. Yes. Your full name is Samarita Lopez. You go by Sammy. And I'm Quinn Finnegan, a lieutenant with the Coast Guard. You don't remember me, either? I'm afraid not. She looked upset. I'm sorry if we were friends. I wish I could remember you. I don't understand what's happening, other than my head hurts. I... maybe I'll remember more after I get some rest. The woman he'd dated for over a year, had been engaged to for another three months, didn't remember her own name. Or him. And she wasn't dead, the way it had been reported. Quinn had a bad feeling about this. What had Sammy been doing out in the middle of Lake Michigan in a boat that had exploded, resulting in her nearly drowning to death? Chapter 2 Fingers of panic tightened around her throat. Her name was Sammy? 
And she knew this tall, handsome lieutenant who thought she was dead? Quinn Finnegan. She rolled the name around in her mind, but couldn't come up with a memory associated with him, or with anything else for that matter. Her gaze darted around the Coast Guard cutter. This didn't make any sense. She didn't understand what had happened. How had she ended up here? I... what happened? She reached out to grasp Quinn's arm. Where are we? In the middle of Lake Michigan. He held her gaze, a frown furrowing his brow. You were on a speedboat. Witnesses say the engine exploded. That doesn't make sense, she murmured. Tell me about it. His gaze narrowed. Seems you've retained your memory as it relates to boating. For some odd reason, that brought a sense of relief. The pounding in her head must be clouding her mind. Surely, it wouldn't take long for her to remember who she was and what she'd been doing. Rain pelted the top of the cutter, making her realize only an idiot would have driven across a lake as wide as Michigan in bad weather. I, uh, thanks for rescuing me. You're welcome, his tone was dry. It would help if you could tell me what you were doing out here. As a member of the Coast Guard, it's my duty to report any illegal activity. Illegal activity? She stared at him. Do you think I'm a criminal? A terrible thought hit hard. Was I a criminal when you knew me before? A flash of compassion darkened his gaze. No, Sammy, you weren't a criminal. You were a cop. Last I heard, you'd landed a job in L.A. Just a few months later, you were killed in the line of duty. California? Killed in the line of duty? That didn't seem right. How could it be? Are you sure about that? His expression hardened. I have your obit at home. You didn't bother to explain what your plans were after returning my engagement ring. We were engaged? That seemed as foreign a concept as her going to California or being a criminal. He sighed. Look, our past relationship doesn't matter. The cutter picked up speed, bouncing as it hit the turbulent waves. Nausea churned in her stomach, but she believed that to be a symptom of her head injury, not motion sickness. She gripped the edges of the foil blanket, grateful for the warmth. We'll get you checked out at the local hospital when we reach shore. It's clear that head injury is worse than we thought. Yeah, okay. She couldn't argue his reasoning, but she wasn't convinced the doctors would be able to restore her memory. And deep down, she felt a keen sense of urgency, as if there was something important she had to do. But what? The more she tried to concentrate, the more her head ached. The hard bouncing of the cutter over the choppy waves didn't help. She took several deep breaths, fighting back the urge to throw up. Are you okay? Quinn looked concerned. She almost laughed at the ridiculous question. No, she wasn't okay. She'd awoken in this boat, only to discover she'd landed in the middle of a nightmare. This guy thought she was his former fiancé, and that she was dead. Nothing made any sense, but she did her best to think logically. How long until we reach shore? Twenty minutes, maybe less, Quinn frowned. I really hope there wasn't anyone else on the boat with you. She wanted to reassure him that others weren't lost in the lake, but couldn't. I hope not too. Frustration flared in his gaze as he rose to his feet. Sit tight. He moved over to where the younger Coasty manned the wheel. She heard something about a second cutter being assigned to bring in the wrecked boat. The boat she'd been in was the least of her worries. She scooted over to rest against the side of the boat, still clutching the foil blanket. Closing her eyes, she cleared her mind. Maybe she was trying too hard to remember. Her headache was bad, so she focused on breathing through the pain and swirling nausea. After some indeterminate period of time, the boat slowed. She instinctively knew they were approaching the shore. Quinn was right about one thing. 
she'd retained some knowledge as far as being out on the water. Knowing something wasn't the same as remembering, though. She tried to picture another time when she'd been out on a boat, but couldn't. A flicker of panic erupted, but she ruthlessly pushed it back. No sense in worrying about the void in her mind now. The doctor would have some advice for her, some way for her to remember who she was and what she needed to do. There had to be a reason she was on that boat in the middle of Lake Michigan, especially during terrible weather conditions. Sammy, are you ready? Quinn returned, offering his hand. Even though it sounded like she'd broken off their engagement, he'd been nothing but kind and polite. He'd risked his life to save hers. Granted, that was the job of the Coast Guard. He would have done the same for anyone else. Still, she knew she was alive only because of Quinn's efforts. Gripping the blanket with one hand, she placed the other in his, allowing him to help her upright. She frowned at the blood stains on his arm. You're hurt. It's fine. He didn't seem concerned about his injury, so she let it go. The boat rocked rhythmically beneath her feet, even though they were no longer moving across the water. She bent her knees, absorbing the rolling motion as she followed Quinn toward the pier. He jumped out of the cutter first, then took her hand to help her over. She wasn't nearly as graceful, but managed to stay upright. Another flash of panic hit hard as she realized she didn't know how to get to the hospital or even where it was located. Tightening her grip on Quinn, she had the irrational desire to have him accompany her. Quinn, I'll need a ride, as I don't remember if I have a car here or not. He nodded. I figured. Cal, take care of the cutter. I need to get our victim to the hospital. Our shift is just about over anyway, but I'll let the commander know what happened. Understood, Cal agreed. I'll make sure she's in tip-top shape. Thanks, he turned to her. Let's go. She sensed it was unusual for Quinn to leave the cleanup duty to his subordinate officer, but she was secretly glad he'd chosen to take her to the hospital. At least this way she'd be with someone who knew her, and he could also get his arm looked at. You won't get in trouble for doing this, will you? For some reason, she didn't want to cause Quinn any grief. No. He led the way down the pier to the shore. The rain had lightened in intensity now, or maybe they'd simply ridden away from the worst of the storm. The temperature seemed warmer too, less windy here than out on the water. Quinn gestured to a dark SUV in the parking lot of the marina. She had no idea what time it was and hesitated to ask. Hold on a minute. Quinn rounded the back of the SUV to grab a couple of beach towels. He also used a smaller towel to wrap around his arm. We'll use these to sit on. Keep that blanket with you. She waited until he'd covered the seats, then slid inside. The towel helped soak up the water from her cargo pants, which was probably Quinn's intent. He didn't seem the type to worry about getting water on his leather upholstery. Once Quinn was settled behind the wheel, he cranked the heat, then drove out of the parking lot. She appreciated the warmth, but couldn't help looking out her passenger side window searching for something familiar. Streetlights cut through the darkness. She was surprised to see the hour was later than she'd realized, nine o'clock at night. Where are we headed? She frowned when he headed for the interstate. Aren't there hospitals close to the lakeshore? I'd prefer to take you to Trinity Medical Center. He glanced at her as if expecting her to acknowledge that was a good choice. Too bad she had no idea if it was or not. They are the best level one trauma center in the state. Okay. She would have to take his word for it. I'm not that bad, though. I'd think any emergency department doctor could handle a head injury. Maybe, but I'm more familiar with Trinity. He paused, then added, My sister Alana works there. Oh, is she a doctor? No, she's a nurse in the emergency department. He frowned again, as if annoyed by her lack of memory. It set her teeth on edge because she wasn't exactly having a grand old time with it herself. 
I have eight siblings. Eight? She echoed in surprise. It occurred to her that if they had been engaged, she'd have met most, if not all of them. I, uh, wow, that's a lot. Yeah. He didn't add anything more. She gave up trying to identify landmarks. The passing scenery only made her headache worse. Driving to the hospital didn't take as long as she'd anticipated. She opened her eyes when the car slowed. The hospital was huge, and she could see the bright red emergency sign above the door. Leaving the foil blanket on the seat, as it belonged to the Coast Guard, she pushed out of the car and joined Quinn. He took her hand, a sweet gesture she was grateful for. Quinn was like a buoy bobbing on the water, holding her out of the murky depths. The moment Quinn mentioned her losing consciousness and stopping breathing, the staff whisked her into a room. Quinn hovered in the doorway as a helpful employee pulled out a hospital gown. You'll want to take off your wet clothes, the staff member said kindly, eyeing Quinn. You need to have your arm looked at, too. I will. First, I have a few calls to make. Quinn took a step toward the door. She turned to face him. You'll be back? Yes. He held her gaze for a moment. I'll give you some privacy. They'll need time to examine you anyway. Watching Quinn leave was the hardest thing she'd ever done. Well, to be fair, she didn't remember any other things she'd done. Still, it took all her willpower not to run after him, begging him to stay. Leaving Sammy to the care of medical professionals should not have been so difficult. Yet, he couldn't help feeling as if he needed to stick close, to provide her a modicum of reassurance. At first, he doubted her memory loss was real. But the more she looked around in confusion, as if she'd never been in Milwaukee before, the more concerned he'd become. No one was this good of an actress. Sammy had always been honest and straight to the point. Two years apart wouldn't change her basic personality, would it? And what was she involved in? Obviously, she wasn't dead. That must have been set up to protect her. From what? Or whom? He had no idea. Giving himself a mental shake, Quinn focused on the tasks at hand. He headed out to the SUV to find the first aid kit Alana had made for each of them. The wound on his arm wasn't deep enough to need stitches, so he simply cleaned it with antiseptic and wrapped it with gauze. He grabbed his phone from the holder, then reached for his duffel. He always carried a change of clothing. He carried the duffel inside and stripped out of his wet things in the men's room, the dry clothing feeling wonderful against his skin. When he was finished, he contacted his lieutenant commander, Louis Calderon. Sir, we rescued one victim from the boat and did not see any others. Unfortunately, the female victim was unconscious and needed some basic rescue efforts. When she came to, she did not remember why she was on the boat, or if there were others with her. Is this woman stringing you along, Finnegan? She's probably a drug runner, trying to cover her tracks. Sir, I recognize the victim as Samarita Lopez, a former Milwaukee police officer. However, there is an obituary out of L.A. announcing she was killed in the line of duty. I don't have any reason to believe she's involved in anything nefarious, but I suspect she may be in danger. She wouldn't be the first cop to go bad, his commander growled. As you know, we have another cutter towing her boat in, but it's in rough shape. Not sure we'll get much intel from the vessel. I understand. Frankly, he'd been more concerned with getting Sammy the medical care she needed than worrying about evidence from the boat whatever was left of it. Do you want me to head over later to look it over? Not yet. We'll wait until she cools down. Your job is to find out what this Samorita Lopez was doing out there in the first place. Yes, sir. Quinn agreed with the commander's plan. I'll get my report written and submitted ASAP. Sounds good. Nice work out there, Finnegan. There was a pause, then his boss added, We may need to call the local police to let them know about this, especially if she was reported dead. I'll take care of it. 
he quickly ended the call, silently admitting he wasn't about to call the local precinct just yet. Not until he knew more about what was going on here, but he would call the police. Or rather, his brother Ryland, captain of the Milwaukee Police Department Tactical Unit. Rye was also the head of the Finnegan household, after their parents had been killed in a terrible car crash over ten years ago. Back then, Rye and Taryn, his second oldest brother, had moved back home to help take care of the youngest Finnegan siblings. At the time, Alana and Aiden, the twins, were seventeen, while Ellie, the oops baby, was only fourteen. Quinn had a lot of admiration for how Rye and Taryn had held the family together. He'd been in college with the goal of joining the military and working for the Coast Guard. He'd offered to quit school and to come home, but his brother had refused to hear it. Rye and Taryn had both already been somewhat settled in their respective careers with the Milwaukee Police Department and had insisted he and Brady stay in school. What's up, Quinn? His brother asked. Hey, sorry to call so late, but I have a bit of a dilemma. Just hearing his brother's voice reassured him he was making the right move. You remember Sammy? Yes, of course. Has she returned to the city? Is she interested in getting back together with you? The hint of excitement in his brother's tone made him wince. His family had been disappointed when things had ended between him and Sammy. No, nothing like that, he hastened to reassure him. He hesitated over how to phrase the next part, since he hadn't told his family about Sammy's death. At the time, it seemed there was no point, since they weren't together anymore. Actually, it's worse. I just pulled Sammy out of Lake Michigan after her boat engine exploded. What? Is she all right? Are you? Rye demanded. It was touch and go for Sammy, but we're at Trinity now. The docks are checking her over. Quinn sighed, then added, She doesn't remember anything, Rye. Not me, not why she was on the boat, or even her name. Rye let out a low whistle. Amnesia is rare. Are you sure she's not faking it? Rye sounded just like his commander. Anything is possible, but I don't think so. She was hit on the head and wasn't breathing when I pulled her out of the water. There was no recognition in her eyes when she saw me, or when I called her name. I guess we'll see what the ED doc says, but the bottom line is, she needs help. Once she's been released from the hospital, either tonight or tomorrow depending on if they keep her for testing, I'd like to bring her to the homestead. Their parents had always referred to the large six-bedroom house in Brookland as the Finnegan Homestead, and the name had stuck throughout the years. Sure, that's fine. Rye didn't hesitate to agree. We have several empty rooms these days, with only Ellie and Aiden staying here. Quinn knew that. It was the reason he'd even considered taking Sammy there. His condo was closer, but being alone with her didn't seem like a smart idea. Appreciate that, Rye. But maybe tell Aiden and Ellie not to badger Sammy about our breakup. There's no point in that. Sure thing, Rye said. I just hope her memory loss is real, Quinn, not some sort of attempt to play to your feelings. I hope so, too. Quinn couldn't deny having the same thought, but knowing she couldn't remember, on top of her faked death, he felt certain there was more to this story. Don't worry, it's not like I expect to reconcile with her or anything. Just the opposite. I intend to keep a close eye on her. If she's faking, we'll know. Yeah. She won't be able to fool us for long. Let me know the time frame, Rye said. I'll make sure the rooms are ready just in case you end up heading over tonight. Thanks again, bro. Later. He slid his phone into his pocket and walked back through the emergency department. The door to Sammy's room was open, and he could see her lying on the cot, her eyes closed, with the monitor hanging over her head, beeping in time with the beat of her heart. He stood simply watching her for a long moment. He'd loved her once, and she'd broken his heart when she'd called off their wedding. Seeing her after two years was a bit of a shock, yet he hated to admit that she was as beautiful as ever. What on earth had she been doing in the middle of Lake Michigan? And why had her death been faked? 
for her protection, no doubt, but then why was she here? What was going on? Nothing good. He inwardly winced at the depressing thought that flashed in his mind. No, he wouldn't go there. Innocent until proven guilty, right? He remembered a conversation with Sammy about how cops tended to look at things from the opposite perspective. Everyone is a potential suspect until they've been cleared. Would she remember that saying if he mentioned it? She hadn't remembered anything about their time together so far. Get over it, he told himself sternly. This wasn't about the past, it was about the present, and whatever had brought Sammy back to Wisconsin. Stepping silently, he entered her room and lowered herself into the plastic chair in the corner. He didn't want to wake her, hoping she was right about rest helping to restore her memory. He didn't mind watching her sleep, even though he had questions that needed to be answered. When the nurse came in, she looked surprised to see him. Lieutenant Finnegan with the Coast Guard, he introduced himself in a low voice. Related to Alana? She smiled. You share similar features. Yes, she's my younger sister. No surprise this nurse would know Alana. How is our patient? Stable, she answered warily, likely concerned about saying too much in deference to patient privacy. He'd learned all about that kind of thing from Alana. I'm fine, Sammy's voice sounded weak. Is it time for my brain scan? You know this man, the nurse gestured at him. Is it okay for me to talk about your care in front of him? Yes, that's fine. He noticed she didn't admit to knowing him. Then yes, I'm taking you to the CT scanner. She began disconnecting the wires to Sammy's monitor. Dr. Willis is concerned about bleeding into her brain. He straightened with concern. That sounded serious. How long will it take? Not long, 15 minutes at the most. The scanner is right down the hall. We have a small radiology department down here. The nurse smiled at him, and he saw her name tag identifying her as Nettie. Don't worry, we'll be back soon. True to Nettie's word, they returned in just under 15 minutes. She quickly reconnected Sammy to the heart monitor, then turned to leave. When will we know the results? he asked. Soon. Dr. Willis is probably reviewing them now. He'll be in shortly. Nettie flashed another smile, then left the room. She's flirting with you. Huh? He turned to look at Sammy. No, she isn't. She knows Alana, that's all. Your sister, the nurse. Sammy lifted a hand to her head. I guess it's a good thing I can remember what you told me an hour ago, even though the rest of my memory is a blur. He wasn't sure how to respond to that, so he held his tongue. The silence stretched between them for several long minutes. You mentioned eight siblings. Alana is one... Who are the others? He held her gaze as he responded, searching for signs of recognition as he listed them off. In order of age, Rye is the captain of the tactical unit of the Milwaukee Police Department. Taryn is an MPD detective. Kylie is a Milwaukee County Sheriff's deputy. Brady is an FBI agent. Colin is a firefighter and paramedic. Aiden is with the National Guard. Alana is a nurse and Ellie is an emergency medical technician. Where do you fall in there? Smack in the middle. Four older and four younger. Nine total. It must be nice to have so many siblings. Your parents must be proud of all your amazing accomplishments, too. My parents died ten years ago. Her eyes widened in alarm. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. She had known when they were together but he had to admit her horrified response did not appear faked, the way her death had been. He gritted his teeth. The entire situation had him on edge. Before he could say anything more, Dr. Willis entered the room. Ms. Lopez, how are you feeling? The same, she grimaced. I still don't remember anything, though. I see, the doc frowned. I reviewed your head CT scan, and you do not have any internal bleeding in your brain. 
that's the good news. Do you remember having your appendix taken out? Sammy's eyes widened, and she put a hand to her abdomen. Yes, I do remember that. Not the details, but I know I have a scar from where it was removed. Then her brow furrowed. How did you know? All medical records have been computerized for well over a decade here at Trinity. You had your appendix removed seven years ago. Here at this hospital, in fact. I feel like I should remember something as big as having surgery, she said in a low voice. What's wrong with me, Dr. Willis? Why can't I remember? I'm not the neurology expert. He's on his way down to examine you. But it sounds to me like you're suffering from amnesia. Quinn couldn't hold back. That's not very common, is it? Willis glanced briefly at him, then back at Sammy. No, it's not. I've seen it one other time in the past few years. In that case, there was an emotionally traumatic event preceding the head injury, and the amnesia was temporary. Again, I'm not the one to ask. Best to let Dr. Yosef answer your questions. Sammy looked terrified, and he couldn't help feeling sympathy for her. He'd been hurt when she'd broken things off, devastated when he'd read about her death in the line of duty. But even after all of that, he hated seeing her suffer. Willis had no sooner left than Yosef arrived. The neurologist asked dozens of questions, and surprisingly, Sammy knew the answers to basic questions like correctly identifying the President of the United States and the year. She remembered other significant dates in history, too, but nothing about her personal life. If he hadn't been there to hear her responses for himself, he would have found it hard to believe. But it was clear the doc didn't think she was faking. I think you should meet with a psychiatrist, Dr. Yosef said. In my experience, many forms of amnesia are related to emotional trauma. Do you have one to recommend? The fact that she seemed willing to meet with one was a bit surprising. I'll give you two names. Hopefully one of them will be able to see you soon. Yosef scribbled on a notepad and handed it to her. I don't see any reason to keep you here in the hospital. It may be better for you to be in familiar surroundings. Okay, thanks. Sammy took the note, then glanced at him. After Yosef left, she turned to him. I don't see how I can be in familiar surroundings when I don't have a clue where I live, especially since I supposedly moved to California. I'll take you with me to the homestead. He rose and crossed over to her. Your brother's house? She echoed. How did you know that? He asked. Her eyes widened, and she reached out to grab his hand. I don't know. It just popped into my mind. Well, that settles it then. He managed a wan smile. You spent some time at the Finnegan homestead when we were engaged. Going back there may be exactly what you need to help your memories return. Oh, I hope so. She looked happy to have a destination in mind. Quinn forced himself to release her hand and to step back. He was only doing this to help understand why Sammy had been out in the middle of Lake Michigan and her death had been faked. He needed to be careful partially because of the potential danger she was in, but even more so because of the risk to him personally. The last thing he needed was to become emotionally entangled with her all over again. Chapter 3 Sammy quickly changed out of the hospital gown and into a pair of scrubs provided by the nursing staff. While grateful for the dry clothes, she wished she had shoes or underwear. While removing her soaked clothing, she was surprised to find a small hidden zip pouch crammed with several hundred dollars. Scanning the bills, she didn't bother to count them, but pocketed the pouch with the cash, squelching a flash of concern as to where the money had come from, especially as there was nothing but cash, no debit or credit cards. Very odd. Did she have personal items on the boat? She must have, but after learning about the explosion, she doubted there was much left to salvage. Her head still pounded. The gash on her forehead had been closed by a plastic surgery resident who'd placed a row of tiny stitches in her scalp. He assured her the wound shouldn't leave much of a scar. She'd politely thanked him, 
even though a scar was the least of her worries. Drawing in a steadying breath, she walked over to the door. Nettie, her nurse, had already given her the discharge paperwork with a list of instructions on how to manage her head injury. She was to return to the hospital if her headache grew worse or if she had double vision or other neurological problems. Quinn, I'm ready. He was standing with his back to the door like a sentinel on duty. He turned to look at her, his gaze raking over her. When he noticed her bare feet, he frowned. We'll need to get you some shoes. It's too late to stop at a store. She may not remember the city, but logic dictated that stores wouldn't open past 10.30 at night. I'll be fine. He stepped back, gesturing for her to walk ahead of him. There was a large lobby sign with an arrow pointing down a hallway. At the end, she saw a door. The hospital lobby was full of people, many looking sickly. Quinn stepped forward to open the door leading outside. Glancing around, she realized the rain had stopped. The storm must have blown over, leaving a damp, earthy scent in its wake. The sidewalk was wet and cool beneath her bare feet. She took a few steps, then gasped as Quinn swept her into his arms. You can't walk across the parking lot in bare feet. His tone was curt, as if he anticipated an argument. I noticed glass fragments lying around. Okay. His warm male scent niggled at her senses. She longed to lean her head against his chest, to inhale deeply, filling her head with his unique smell. For the first time since she'd awoken on the Coast Guard cutter, she experienced a sense of familiarity, as if, deep down, she remembered being in Quinn's arms before. Or maybe her exhausted mind was playing tricks on her. When he reached his SUV, he set her down, then unlocked the car. He opened the passenger door for her, and after shoving the wet towels aside, she quickly climbed in. The July air was warm enough, but the scrubs were thin. Quinn slid in behind the wheel and started the car. She noticed the bandage on his arm and wondered if he'd taken care of it himself. As he exited the parking lot, she asked, How far to your family home? Ten minutes, he glanced at her. My brother Rye and his wife Devin will be there, as will Aiden and Ellie. There's a security system now, too, which is nice. Okay, she wished she could remember. I'm hoping the surroundings help spark your memory, he continued. I think you're in danger, and the sooner you can remember what you were doing out in the middle of the lake, the better. I know. Don't you think I'm aware of my situation? She did her best not to sound annoyed. I feel as if there's something critically important I need to do, but I have no idea what it is. I'm sure that's frustrating for you. He was silent for a moment, then said, I never told my family you were dead. Since you were in L.A. at the time and we'd already been broken up, I didn't want to add to their misery. Ellie in particular would have taken the news very hard. She really liked you. Liked as in past tense. She winced, realizing his family would probably not be happy to see her. Then a curious thought occurred to her. How did you know about my so-called death? Cops who are killed in the line of duty on the West Coast aren't usually broadcast to the Midwest. I mean, sometimes if the circumstances are a big deal, but not every single time a brother or sister in blue is lost. He didn't answer for a long moment. I searched for information about you regularly, Sammy. I wanted to know how you were doing. I see. She understood she'd badly hurt him by breaking off their engagement. Too bad she had no idea why she'd done such a thing. She glanced at Quinn sitting beside her, taking note of his tall, lean, and muscular physique. He was devastatingly handsome, and he had sweetly cared about her bare feet, not to mention the way he'd saved her life. It didn't make sense that she'd have left him voluntarily, certainly not for another guy. But if she had... She hid a wince and put a hand to her forehead, careful not to touch the stitches. It must have been a serious lapse in judgment on her part. Or she'd had a really good reason, one she couldn't remember. 
I was horrified to discover you'd been killed, he murmured. I kept thinking that if you'd stayed here, you'd still be alive. He shot her another pointed glance. Obviously, you are alive, so that was just some story put out there to protect you. She spread her hands. I don't know what you want me to say. I wish I knew what happened, why there was a story on my death, and how I ended up here. But I don't. All I can do is pray that my memory returns. The entire Finnegan family will be praying for that too, he agreed. I'm glad to hear you kept your faith. The idea of praying had come naturally, but it wasn't until he mentioned it that she realized the implication. Had she always believed in God? Her brain refused to answer. Quinn pulled into the driveway of a large, red brick house with black shutters and white trim. In addition to the three-car garage, which she assumed was full of vehicles, there was a black truck parked off to the side. Unfortunately, seeing the house didn't spur any memories. Feeling the weight of Quinn's quizzical gaze, she sighed. Sorry, I don't remember. Trust me, I'll tell you when I do. Yeah, see, that's the problem. Quinn shut off the car engine. I don't trust you, Sammy. Not by a long shot. His words stung, which didn't make any sense. What did she care if Quinn Finnegan trusted her? She couldn't honestly say whether she was trustworthy or not. Without answering, she pushed open her door. She stood, wincing as she stepped on a pebble with her bare feet. Quinn went over to open the garage door, then gestured for her to follow him inside. There were three cars parked in the garage, in addition to the truck and now Quinn's SUV. One vehicle for each of the people living there? Maybe. Quinn stepped up to the door leading into the house, entering a code into the security system. When it had been disarmed, he opened the door. Bracing herself, she followed him inside. There was a small light on over the kitchen sink. A man with blonde hair who resembled Quinn pinned her with a direct gaze. Welcome home, Quinn. Sammy, I can't deny that it's a surprise to see you. Ah, well, thank you for your hospitality. She felt herself flush. Rye was polite, but clearly not enamored of her. His reaction was likely what she'd experience from the rest of the household, too. You didn't have to wait up, Rye, Quinn said as he re-engaged the alarm. But I appreciate you allowing us to stay the night. You're always welcome here, Quinn. Sammy noticed the eldest Finnegan hadn't included her in that statement. Alana's old room is ready for Sammy. You can use the guest room. Sounds good. The corner of Quinn's mouth tipped up in a small smile, the first she'd seen since her rescue. It's nice to be back. Oh, Sammy might need to borrow a few items from Ellie. All she has are these hospital scrubs, which we're supposed to send back with Alana at some point. She especially needs shoes. Rye nodded. You know Ellie will be happy to share her things. She's the most easygoing of the Finnegan bunch. He frowned and glanced toward the rug in front of the door to the garage. Sammy noticed there were several sets of shoes and sandals there. I think the pink flip-flops are Ellie's, if you want to use them temporarily. That would be nice, if you're sure she won't mind. She won't. Quinn crossed over and picked them up from the floor. He dropped them beside her. She quickly slid them onto her feet. Oddly, it felt nice to have shoes, even if they were a cheap pair of flip-flops. Surprisingly, they fit. Thank you. You're welcome. Quinn lifted a brow and glanced pointedly around, silently asking if the kitchen looked familiar. It was all she could do not to snap at him. Her head hurt, her stomach still churned, either from the headache or swallowing too much lake water, or both, and she was exhausted. Her gratitude toward the Finnegan family was fading fast. Thanks again for allowing me to stay, but I'd like to get some sleep, if you don't mind. Quinn frowned but nodded. Are you hungry? Maybe soup would help settle your stomach. She dropped her hand from her abdomen, realizing he'd picked up on her discomfort. To her surprise, soup sounded good. Chicken noodle? 
she asked hopefully. Our pantry is full. Help yourself to whatever we have. Rye stood, and she realized he and Quinn were roughly the same height. Quinn was leaner than Rye, though both men were muscular. No doubt a requirement of their respective jobs. I'll head up now. Quinn, I'll talk to you in the morning. Thanks, Rye. Quinn opened the pantry door and pulled out two cans of soup. Ellie makes homemade soup in the winter, but usually not in July. Canned soup is fine. She glanced around the spacious kitchen, trying to imagine what it was like when all the siblings were here. I can make it, Quinn. Just help me find the can opener. I've got it. Sit down. You look pale. His tone had softened compared to the ride over. This will only take a few minutes to heat in the microwave. She sat, watching him. It was difficult to comprehend she'd been here before, been engaged to marry him, and that she'd broken things off to head to California? Why had her death been faked? Something nagged at the back of her mind, but it was more elusive than fog on the water. A memory fragment hanging just out of reach. No matter how hard she concentrated, she couldn't quite grasp it. Quinn brought two bowls of soup over to the table, taking the seat beside her. She automatically clasped her hands together and bowed her head for the blessing. After a long second, Quinn began. Dear Lord, we thank you for keeping us safe in your loving arms today. We ask that you continue to guide us on your path, and that you please heal Sammy's wounds and restore her memory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. She lifted her head to find him staring intently at her. Now what? Did I do something wrong? No, you did exactly what you used to do when we were together. He picked up his spoon, regarding her intently. Interesting that you prayed without being told. Makes me wonder if this isn't an elaborate act for my benefit. An act? A flash of anger hit hard. No! It's not an act. I get that you are having trouble believing me, Quinn. I can even understand your position, as this entire situation sounds like the premise of a low-budget Hollywood movie. But I am not faking, and I certainly didn't blow up my own boat engine. She blew out a breath and tried to calm down. If she wasn't so hungry, she'd have left him. But she sensed she needed this nourishment. They ate in silence, not tense, but not full of camaraderie either. Sammy wanted to ask Quinn to drop the attitude, but decided there was no point. He'd believe her, or he wouldn't. She couldn't change that, unless, of course, her memory returned. She felt better after eating the soup. She stood, carried her bowl to the sink, and then turned back to face him. I'd like to get some sleep. Are the bedrooms upstairs? Can you point me in the right direction? He nodded and finished his own soup. I'll take you up. He set his bowl beside hers, then led the way into the living room. The curved staircase was beautiful, and a strange sense of coming home washed over her. Not that she planned to tell him that. At this point, she wasn't sure she trusted her own feelings. Maybe she just wanted to feel at home here. It was better than being in a motel. Quinn headed upstairs, so she followed. There were many bedroom doors, but two were open. One she assumed was the guest room Quinn was to use, according to Rye, the other Alana's old room. Quinn paused outside one of the open doors. You can stay here. Sleep well, Sammy. Don't be alarmed if I check in on you to make sure you're doing okay. Since that was what both Dr. Willis and Dr. Yosef had recommended, she didn't argue. Good night. Without waiting for his response, she ducked into the room and closed the door behind her. Then she stood for a moment as a wave of emotion hit hard. Who was she? Why was she here in Wisconsin? And most importantly, who had tried to kill her? Raking his hands through his hair, Quinn tried to tell himself he hadn't made a mistake bringing Sammy here. He'd hoped the familiar surroundings would have sparked a memory, but so far that hadn't happened. And in truth, Sammy hadn't lived at the homestead. 
He hadn't either as an adult. They'd spent plenty of Sunday dinners there, but that wasn't the same as spending time in a place all day every day. Yet he'd felt certain seeing his siblings and spending time at the homestead would spark some memories. Maybe they had. He couldn't help but wonder if Sammy would tell him when her memory returned. He wanted to believe her and that she wasn't making this up. But it wasn't easy. Sure, she looked confused, but maybe she'd learned to become an A-list actress in the two years she'd been gone. He shook off the doubts and went back downstairs to use the computer. He needed to submit his report to his commander. Better to do that now when the details were still clearly imprinted in his mind. Besides, despite his bone-weary fatigue, he was pretty sure sleep wouldn't come easily. There was a small alcove off the main living space containing a small desk and computer. The homestead didn't have the privacy of an actual office, but the alcove worked well enough for the Finnegan's needs. He was surprised Rye hadn't turned one of the bedrooms into an office, but then again, he had a feeling it wouldn't be long until he and Devin added to their family. Not to mention, the Finnegan siblings often popped in to stay for a day or two when needed. Writing out the report didn't take too long. When that was finished, Quinn took a moment to search on Sammy's full name. As before, a picture of her bloomed on the screen. Her full name was listed alongside the words, End of Watch. Seeing her professional photo with those words were like a punch to the gut. Thankfully, it wasn't true. There was no doubt in his mind that Sammy's death had been faked. The former LAPD and MPD officer was sleeping in Alana's old room. He cleared the memory on the computer so Ellie wouldn't inadvertently see Sammy's memorial from the LAPD, then shut it down. Far too many questions continued to swirl in his mind, but he knew he needed to get some rest. Returning to the guest room, he set his phone alarm to go off in three hours. He may not trust Sammy as far as he could throw her, but he couldn't live with himself if he ignored her medical condition. Just the thought of her suffering and the possibility of bleeding into her brain made him sick with worry. He wanted her to be healthy and for her memory to return very soon. It gnawed at him that he didn't know what she'd been up to, what had happened once she'd left him to move to L.A., or maybe the real question was why she'd left him to go to L.A. At the time, he'd assumed she'd realized she hadn't loved him and had moved across the country to avoid running into him. But maybe that wasn't the case at all. Not that he thought she still loved him, but maybe her decision to move had been related to something completely different. If Sammy's memory returned in the morning, he was pretty sure there would be a lot to discuss and to follow up on. He ducked into the bathroom to wash up, then paused outside Sammy's door to listen. Hearing nothing alarming, he turned away. In three hours, he'd do as Dr. Willis had suggested, waking Sammy to ask her questions and check her pupils. He wasn't a nurse like Alana, a paramedic like Colin, or an EMT like Ellie, but he could handle basic first aid and of course could perform CPR. Those skills were required to be enlisted in the Coast Guard, since so much of their time, especially during the summer months, was spent on search and rescue. He crawled into bed and surprisingly fell asleep. When his alarm chirped, he bolted upright, his heart pounding. Then he relaxed when he saw the light from his phone. Time to wake Sammy. Easing from the bed, he drew a t-shirt over his head and padded down the hall to Sammy's room. The house was silent, and he was glad Ellie had already been sleeping by the time they'd gotten home. Aiden hadn't come down either, but his brother was known to sleep for twelve hours straight after a long deployment. Quinn opened the door a crack and waited for his eyes to adjust. Sammy was in bed, one arm thrown off to one side, making him wonder if she'd experienced bad dreams. He was glad she'd chosen to sleep in the scrubs and made a mental note to get her a change of clothing from Ellie, first thing in the morning. Crossing to her bedside, he carefully stepped over the pink flip-flops and stood watching Sammy sleep for a moment. The line of stitches across the side of her forehead made him frown. What if something bigger had struck her, like the boat itself? She'd have died out there, this time for real. 
He told himself to get a grip. Sammy was safe now, and he intended to keep her that way. Sammy, he whispered, resting a hand on her shoulder. Wake up. Hmm? Her eyelids flitted open. She stared up at him in confusion. What? Is something wrong? It's Quinn. He felt silly identifying himself, but he wasn't sure she remembered. I need to check your pupils. Can you tell me who the President of the United States is? Using the flashlight app on his phone, he checked her eyes. Her pupils looked equal and reactive. He relaxed a bit, convinced her head injury wasn't getting any worse. Mickey Mouse. What did you say? He couldn't hold back the sharp response. During their time together, she used to joke about how Mickey Mouse, Goofy, and Donald Duck were running the country. Her slang terms for the President, Congress, and the House of Representatives. Not a slur against any particular party, she treated all politicians the same. I'm fine, Quinn. That was a lame attempt at a joke. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be so disrespectful. She offered a wan smile. I know I'm at the Finnegan Homestead and that you're with the Coast Guard. Should I list all your siblings in birth order? No need. Do you know why you were out on Lake Michigan? No, I still don't remember anything about why I'm here or what happened on the lake. She yawned and put a hand to her head. I'm tired, Quinn, and my head still hurts. Could we save the rest of the interrogation for the morning? It's not an interrogation. I had to ask. He turned his phone off, plunging the room into darkness. This is only to make sure your head injury isn't getting worse. Good night, Sammy. Good night. Quinn returned to his room, yawning himself. He set his alarm for another two hours from now, then crawled back into bed. This time, he didn't fall asleep as easily. Her Mickey Mouse comment had come to her automatically. It made him think that her memory might come back the same way, gradually in bits and pieces without a big revelation. When the alarm went off for the second time, he sat up more slowly, until he realized the sound wasn't from his phone, but from the security system. Someone was trying to breach the house. Chapter 4 The shrill sound of an alarm dragged Sammy from slumber. It took her a moment to remember she was in the Finnegan homestead with Quinn. Remembering the alarm system Quinn had activated when they'd arrived, she jumped out of bed, pushed her feet into the pink flip-flops, and rushed into the hall. Her hand went to her hip, but of course she only wore hospital scrubs and didn't have a weapon, despite the way it seemed that she should. Quinn was already in the hall, dressed and holding a gun in his hand. To her surprise, Rye was there too, also armed. A pretty dark-haired woman she assumed was his wife hovered behind him. Aiden staggered out of his room, also carrying a weapon. When Ellie stepped out of her room, Sammy wouldn't have been surprised to see yet another gun, but the youngest Finnegan wasn't carrying. All three women need to stay up here. Rye's firm tone left no room for argument. Aiden, I'd like you to stay close to guard them, just in case. Quinn, you and I will sweep the lower level. To Sammy's surprise, Aiden didn't argue. As Quinn and Rye headed downstairs, he turned to her. Sammy, I'd like you and Ellie to join Devin in the master suite. Good idea, Devin said, opening the door wider. We need to stick together. Sammy reluctantly followed Ellie into the room, even though she wanted nothing more than to be downstairs with Rye and Quinn. Running and hiding from danger didn't seem right, but since she wasn't armed, not even with a knife, there wasn't much she could do to help the guys sweep the lower level. The blaring alarm was turned off, leaving a heavy silence. As if on cue, everyone in the room remained quiet, straining to listen. Sammy half expected to hear gunfire, but all was quiet from the guys downstairs. Did that mean the threat was over? Maybe, at least for now. Sammy, it's nice to see you again, Ellie said, breaking the prolonged silence. I don't think you've met Rye's wife, Devin. 
They got married in March. No, I haven't. It's nice to meet you, Devin. Sammy looked toward Ellie, not sure what else to say. Aiden stood near the doorway, his face expressionless. She assumed she'd met him before, too. After a long pause, she decided to stick with the truth. I'm glad to be here, Ellie, but I'm having some trouble with my memory. I, uh, don't remember anything about my life before today. She turned to glance at Aiden. I'm sorry, but I don't remember any of the Finnegans. I wish I did. That's terrible, Devin said. What happened? Quinn said he found me in the middle of Lake Michigan. My boat engine exploded, and I was unconscious in the water. She lightly touched the area near her stitches. I assume I was hit by debris, but I don't remember that either. Sounds rough. Ellie's expression turned to one of compassion. It's good that Quinn brought you here. We're safe in the homestead, Devin added, then frowned. At least most of the time. I'm hoping whoever tried to get inside ran for the hills the minute the alarm sounded. Maybe a couple of teenagers playing a prank, Ellie suggested. Aiden shook his head. I doubt it. Most of the kids know Rye is a captain with the tactical unit. I don't think any of the kids in the neighborhood are eager to mess with him, or any of the Finnegans. Three pairs of eyes landed on her, making her inwardly wince. Easy to know what they were thinking. Yes, it's possible this intruder could be related to me. But that would mean someone would have had to know Quinn rescued me from the lake and brought me here. She looked at each one of them. I don't see how that could have happened. Coasties use radio communications, Aiden mused. If someone had access and was listening in, they may have heard the rescue. Sammy sighed. Yes, that's possible, but to know Quinn would bring me here? That's a stretch. Anyone who knows the Finnegans knows they willingly go out on a limb to protect the innocent, Devin pointed out. The way she touched her hand to her abdomen made Sammy wonder if she might be pregnant. Rye, Taryn, and Brady have all done that. Even Kylie put her life on the line to protect ADA back Scala, now her husband, when his life was threatened. From what I know about Aiden and Colin, I'm sure they would do the exact same thing. You're saying someone knew Quinn rescued me and deduced he'd bring me here to the homestead? That didn't seem rational. Why not? As you said, anything is possible. Aiden shrugged. You're sure you don't remember what happened? Being in a boat explosion sounds extreme. She bit back a flash of anger. It was difficult to blame Aiden and the other family members for being suspicious of her. If anyone she'd rescued had claimed to have amnesia, she'd have been skeptical too. But having no memory was not only scary, it was frustrating, especially when she had a feeling there was something important she needed to do. I wish I did remember Aiden, but I don't. She lifted her chin. I wouldn't choose to be sitting here with no memory and no personal items, except for a thin pair of hospital scrubs and Ellie's borrowed flip-flops. I have clothes that will fit you, Ellie quickly interjected. The sound of footsteps on the stairs had Aiden turning to the door. Aiden, it's Quinn. Aiden opened the door, inviting his brother in. What did you find? The back door has been damaged, but whoever set off the alarm must have taken off. Quinn's tone was grim. Sammy, we need to get out of here. Hold on, Quinn, Aiden protested. Leaving now isn't smart. The alarm system has already warned the intruder off. Besides, we'll need to fix the door to keep Ellie and Devin safe, even if you're not here. Rye is working on that already. Quinn paused, then added, I think he'd prefer it if I took Sammy to a motel for what's left of the night. It's my fault Rye is upset, Devin said in a low voice. We weren't going to make the announcement until the next family dinner, but I'm pregnant, and that news has sent Rye into major protective mode. How exciting, Ellie exclaimed. The next generation of Finnegans. Aiden's features softened into a smile. 
Congrats, sis. I'm happy for you and Rye. But that does change things. He shot Quinn a pointed look, then brushed past him. I'll see if Rye needs help. Quinn looked stricken. Devin, if I'd known, I wouldn't have brought Sammy here. Why not? Ellie demanded. Did you think Sammy was in danger? We don't really know if the intruder was here because of her, or if this was some random attempt to rob the place. Sammy could see the guilt weighing heavily on Quinn, as if it was his fault that Devin and Ellie might be in danger, when really the blame rested solely on her shoulders. She rose to her feet. Okay, let's go. Wait, please, don't rush off in haste, Devin protested. Let's go down to the kitchen, okay? We'll talk this through together. I agree with Devin, Ellie said. It's three o'clock in the morning. Seems silly for you and Sammy to leave now. Quinn sighed. Heading to the kitchen sounds like a good plan for the moment. The only way we could even think about staying is if we have someone stay up to remain on guard for the rest of the night. Sammy, come with me. Ellie grasped her hand. Let's get you some proper clothes and shoes. Looks like no one is going back to bed anytime soon. She hesitated, but at Quinn's slight nod, she followed Ellie down the hall. Quinn's youngest sibling provided everything she could have asked for, including a pair of slip-on running shoes. She wore a pair of capri pants and a short-sleeved blouse, but Ellie also provided shorts and a tank top to wear as pajamas. Perfect, Ellie announced. Let's join the others. Thanks, Ellie, you're incredibly kind and generous, she murmured. Ellie blushed, then shrugged. Not that kind. I want to grill you with questions over what happened between you and Quinn. But since you don't even remember us, there's no point. But you should know, I've really missed you, Sammy. I'm sorry, Ellie. She didn't know what else to say. I don't like knowing how much I've hurt you and Quinn. She must have had a good reason for leaving. But what? She had no idea, but sensed it was connected to her boat exploding. As she followed Ellie down to the kitchen, she prayed for her memory to return before anyone got hurt, especially those within the Finnegan family. Quinn couldn't sit. He paced the kitchen while Aiden and Rye repaired the back door. Thankfully, there were plenty of supplies left over in the basement from some work Rye had done in the garage. Glancing out the front window, he stopped mid-stride. His SUV was parked in the driveway where he'd left it. Was it possible his vehicle had somehow been tracked here? He hadn't noticed a tail on the trip home from the hospital. Then another thought occurred to him. Sammy had left the plastic bag containing her sopping wet clothes in the laundry room. Spinning on his heel, he strode over to open the bag. Her clothes smelled fishy like Lake Michigan. He poked through the pockets of the cargo pants, then felt along the seams of the slacks and the thin, long-sleeved top to make sure there were no bugs sewn into them. He didn't find anything, but he still wasn't reassured. Her life jacket? He'd left that on the cutter to be taken in as evidence. The intruder must have come for Sammy. It was the only thing that made sense. Ellie was working for an ambulance transport company, and Aiden being with the National Guard wouldn't have any personal enemies. Sammy's boat hadn't exploded by accident. Of that, he was certain, especially since there had been a secondary explosion too, one that had almost killed them both. The gash on his arm wasn't bad, but if he'd been hit in the head, the outcome could have been much worse. Sammy might not remember what she'd been doing there, but he knew she'd landed square in the middle of something big and dangerous, and he'd foolishly brought that danger to the homestead. The door is fixed, Rye announced. The alarm has been activated. If anyone tries to break in again, we'll hear them. You're awesome, Rye, Devin said with a warm smile. I'm sure we're safe here. Quinn wasn't at all convinced and could tell by the concerned looks between Aiden and Rye that his brothers weren't either. He decided not to wait for them to comment. I think it's best if Sammy and I head out to a motel. The American Lodge isn't far from here. Rye, you said that Gary, the owner, claimed the Finnegans are always welcome. 
I thought this was going to be a family discussion, Ellie asked. We don't know for sure this is related to Sammy, do we? And what's the point of going now? Why not wait until morning? Hold on, Quinn. Rye took a seat next to his wife, putting his arm around her shoulders. I admit I was upset at first, but Ellie has a point. The night is almost over. I agree that you and Sammy should stay until daylight. That will be in a couple of hours, Aiden gestured toward the window. Sun rises early this time of the year. Quinn blew out a breath. He appreciated his brother's support, but it didn't change the facts, especially since Devin was pregnant. In his humble opinion, her condition raised the stakes. He would never forgive himself if anything happened to Devin or her baby. I don't think that our staying another couple of hours changes anything. We can always take turns standing guard, Aiden said. I'll stay down here to keep an eye on things. Quinn should have known his family would insist on staying together. If anyone stays up, it should be me. Nope, I had more sleep than you did, Aiden swiftly countered. I'm fresh, while you look like death warmed over. Gee, thanks, Quinn said in a dry tone, although he couldn't deny the truth. By his tally, he'd only gotten about three and a half hours of sleep. I find it interesting that someone attempted to get in at all. Rye said thoughtfully. It's not as if the alarm system is hidden away. Why hadn't the intruder noticed it before taking a crowbar to the door? Quinn frowned. Maybe the perp wasn't paying attention? As much as I've seen my share of stupid criminals, Rye drawled, it seems odd to be that dense. The normal way to approach a house is to check all the doors and windows before choosing an entry point. Quinn stared at him. What are you saying? Rye lifted a shoulder. That maybe this was nothing more than an attempt to scare us, or more specifically, to scare you or Sammy. For what purpose? Sammy asked. That makes even less sense. Maybe the goal was to flush you and Quinn out, where the perp could more easily follow you, Aiden said. Obviously, we're in a nice neighborhood, even without an alarm system, most of us are armed with weapons. But pushing you to go on the run isolates you from the rest of the family. A chill snaked down his spine. Was Aiden right? Was this an attempt to force Quinn to take Sammy elsewhere? A place where he wouldn't have his family nearby as backup? I don't like this. He dropped into the chair beside Sammy. She looked cute wearing Ellie's clothes ankle-length navy slacks, a short-sleeved blouse, and best of all, rubber-soled shoes covering her bare feet. Better to be dressed if they ended up going on the run. Now I really don't know what to do. Stay at the homestead for now, Rye advised. We can discuss it more later. Aiden, I would like to take you up on your offer to stand guard. I doubt this perp will return, but it's better to be safe. Consider it done, Aiden agreed. Then he grinned. I'm off tomorrow, or rather today, anyway. My next assignment is this upcoming weekend. Good, that's settled then. Rice stood and gently tugged Devin up too. We'll say goodnight. Me too, Ellie chimed in. I have to work the night shift tonight, so a couple more hours of sleep would be nice. Good night, Ellie, Sammy said. Thanks for the clothes. You're a sweetheart for loaning them to me. Anytime. Ellie slipped out of the kitchen to head back upstairs. I'm going to make rounds. Aiden left the kitchen. Quinn knew it was no accident that his siblings had left him and Sammy alone in the kitchen. He held her gaze for a moment. I assume you haven't remembered anything? No, sorry. Her tone was clipped, but then she sighed and added, I told you I'd let you know if I did, Quinn. When the alarm sounded, I headed into the hallway. I did reach for my waistband as if to grab a weapon. She frowned. I didn't have one when you pulled me out of the water, did I? No, he regarded her thoughtfully. But you were a cop, Sammy. I think it's natural you would have reached for a gun. Maybe. She ran her fingers through her tangled hair 
an achingly familiar gesture. I guess my instincts are the same, with or without my memory. Yeah. He tore his gaze away, feeling off balance. His feelings for Sammy were convoluted. He didn't trust her, but he cared about her. He remembered their good days, romantic dinners, laughing and kissing in the park. But he also keenly remembered the heartbreak when she'd returned his ring and announced she was leaving. He abruptly stood. Come with me, I need to show you something. Sammy eyed him warily as he crossed the living room to reach the alcove study. He booted up the computer and typed her name into the search bar. Then he pointed to the image on the screen. Does this bring back any memories? Sammy stared at the screen. He'd hoped to shock her into remembering the day the LAPD department photograph had been taken. Her life as a cop, carrying a badge and a gun. And most importantly, the words written above her photograph. Samarita Lopez, end of watch. No, I'm sorry. Sammy turned away. I think I'll try to get some rest. Sammy, wait. She ignored him, walking across the room and taking the stairs to the second floor. He didn't understand why she seemed upset. Didn't she want to remember what had happened? With a frown, he shut down the computer and turned away. Sammy claimed she did want to remember, said she felt as if she had something important to do. What's going on, Quinn? Aiden asked. I get the sense there's something you're not telling us, and you know very well that keeping secrets will only make Rye angry. Quinn hesitated, then realized anyone in his family could uncover the truth by doing a search on Sammy for themselves. Sammy was allegedly killed in the line of duty 18 months ago. I searched for her online, and the LA Times had an article about her being killed. But as you can see, she's alive and well. Aiden let out a low whistle. Witness protection? That's one possibility, among others. Quinn slowly shook his head. Since she was a cop, I was thinking along the line of being undercover. But WITSEC is a good thought, too. Either way, she's in danger, Aiden. Unfortunately, her amnesia makes it difficult to understand who the enemy is or why they're after her. Based on the scrubs, I assume you took her to the hospital. Aiden said. What did the doc have to say? That familiar surroundings might help her remember, he shrugged. So far, that hasn't worked. I have to admit, it doesn't seem like she's faking it. Then again, you would know that better than the rest of us. Quinn nodded. If you could have seen the confusion in her eyes when I pulled her out of the water, you'd believe her too. I don't think she's faking it. At least, he sincerely hoped not. Maybe you need to visit her old apartment, Aiden suggested. Or other areas where the two of you used to hang out together. Her favorite coffee shop or the parks you used to visit. I mean, sure, you both spent time here having Sunday dinner, but that may not be personal enough to spark memories. That's not a bad idea, if we can do that without being followed by whoever found us here at the homestead, Quinn admitted. Maybe you should kiss her, Aiden joked. That might bring back some memories. Quinn couldn't help but chuckle. Yeah, I have a feeling she'd smack me if I tried. Don't forget, she doesn't remember me or our time together. Just saying, it's worth a shot. Quinn tried not to think about how much he liked the idea of kissing Sammy. Not that he'd cross the line like that. He was still a stranger to her, even if he knew better. I'm going to head up. Quinn waved a hand toward the staircase. Thanks for agreeing to keep watch. I could use another hour or two of sleep. Go ahead. I've got things covered here, Aiden assured him. Thanks. He headed for the stairs, then paused, thinking again about his SUV parked in the driveway. If the intruder was just trying to scare them into running so they could follow, maybe the SUV had been tagged in some way. He abruptly turned back to the kitchen. I need to check the SUV, he muttered. Wait a minute, Aiden lunged forward to grab his arm. What do you mean? Do you think the perp planted a bomb or something? 
That was an even worse possibility than the SUV simply being tagged with a GPS tracker. Back in January, Devin had been stalked by a bomber. Her car, her apartment, and the mailbox in her building all had bombs planted inside. Stay here, Quinn told his brother. Keep the door locked. I'll check out the SUV. If there's anything suspicious, I'll call. Be careful, Aiden warned grimly. Maybe we should get Rye down here. He'll call his tactical unit to respond ASAP. I know, but I want to check it myself first. He didn't want to drag everyone here on a false alarm. He crossed to the front door, avoiding the one that was damaged, and disarmed the alarm system long enough to slip outside. Then he quickly re-engaged it. He stood on the porch for a moment, scanning the area. The neighborhood was quiet at this hour, but the darkness meant that someone could be hidden nearby, watching the place. Based on Aiden's theory of trying to get Sammy out of the house, he thought it highly likely there were eyes on him right now. Tucking his weapon into his waistband, he headed toward his car. Using the flashlight app on the phone, he quickly checked the exterior for obvious signs of tampering, but found nothing. A rustle of leaves caught his attention. He crouched along the side of the vehicle, listening intently. There were plenty of wooded lots in Brookland, and they'd often seen deer and coyotes roaming around the area. Since there was no hunting allowed, the deer were downright tame. The coyotes, not so much. Casting another glance over his shoulder, he went down on the ground and aimed the beam of light along the underside of the car. He felt a bit vulnerable in this position, but forced himself to take his time. He didn't want to miss anything. Starting at the front, he slowly worked his way to the rear. That's when he saw it. He froze, his pulse kicking into high gear. The intruder had planted a bomb beneath his SUV. Chapter 5 Voices in the hallway woke Sammy from sleep. Her headache was slightly better, but she winced as she rolled out of bed. Sudden movements were not her friend. She couldn't make out the words from the hallway, but the sense of urgency was impossible to ignore. She opened her door to hear better. I need everyone to get in the basement. Rye's voice was tense. I'll get my team here ASAP. Okay. Quinn glanced at her. Sammy, stay here with Devin. I'll get Ellie. What's going on? Sammy could tell by the grim expressions on the men's faces that something was amiss. Rye had turned away to make a call, so Aiden answered. A bomb has been planted beneath Quinn's SUV. A bomb? She stared at him, wondering if she'd heard correctly, then thought about the boat explosion that had brought the Coast Guard to her rescue. Had that been the work of a bomb, too? Now what? Ellie sounded cranky as she joined them. Down to the basement. Hurry. Quinn ushered them toward the stairs. Is there a tornado? Ellie frowned. I didn't hear a siren. Sammy felt sick at knowing danger had followed her to the Finnegan homestead. Quinn led the way down to the main level, then took a second stairwell to the basement. She'd expected to find a typical dank concrete type of space, but there was a large section that had been finished off with drywall, paint, furniture and even a television. Canned ceiling lights let out a soft glow. Sit on the sectional, Quinn said. The three women did as he asked, Devin in the middle between Ellie and Sammy. Just thinking of Devin being pregnant made Sammy feel even worse. This is not a tornado, Ellie. There's a bomb under the SUV. Rye's team is on their way to take care of it. That's his area of expertise. But I need the three of you to stay down here, until we give the all clear. Understand? A bomb? Ellie's eyes were wide. Who would do something like that? Sammy felt Quinn's gaze bore into her, but then he turned away. Stay put, he threw over his shoulder, before taking the stairs two at a time to return to the main level. A long silence hung between them in the wake of Quinn's leaving. Sammy braced herself half expecting to hear the bomb exploding above them. But thankfully, all was quiet. Sammy swallowed hard, 
hoping no one would get hurt by the bomb intended for her. No one broke the silence, each waiting for news from the Finnegans. But Sammy knew what Ellie and Devin were probably thinking, and she didn't blame them. I'm sorry, she whispered. I know this is all my fault. I wish I could remember what I was doing before Quinn found me in Lake Michigan. I assume the way my boat engine exploded was no accident either. As soon as this bomb has been removed, I'll leave the homestead to go somewhere else. I hate knowing you're both in danger because of me. This isn't your fault, Sammy. Devin's hands were pressed protectively over her abdomen. Back in January, I was in your shoes. I know all too well what it's like to be in danger. If not for rise, strength, and courage, I wouldn't be here, much less married and pregnant. A smile tugged at the corner of her mouth. I love being a Finnegan, and one thing I've learned over the past seven months is to never underestimate any of them. I have complete trust in Rye and his team. A shaft of envy hit hard, but Sammy ruthlessly pushed it away. It didn't make sense to wish for the same type of happiness Devin and Rye shared. Eliminating the danger surrounding them was far more important. Still, Quinn's handsome features flashed in her mind, making her wonder why she'd broken things off with him, and why she had the feeling she'd been crazy to do such a thing. I agree with Devin. This isn't your fault, Sammy. Ellie's words were kind, but there was a hint of reservation in her brown eyes. I trust my brothers to keep us safe. She hesitated, then added, I just hope you don't hurt Quinn again, the way you did two years ago. I don't remember doing that, but I can promise that's not my intent. She turned in her seat so she could face them. I owe Quinn a debt of gratitude for saving my life. The last thing I want to do is to hurt him. Ellie bit her lip, then smiled sadly. I know you won't intend to hurt him, but that doesn't mean it won't happen, Sammy. I think Quinn still has feelings for you. Feelings for her? She frowned. I doubt that. Quinn has been extremely reserved around me. Yes, to protect his heart, Ellie said. That's not the impression I get from him. Please know that I'll be out of the way soon enough although where she'd go and what she would do was unknown. Sammy could probably find a low-budget motel to stay under the radar, but for how long? Until her memory returned? And what if it didn't? She couldn't bear to consider that possibility. The sound of footsteps overhead caught Sammy's attention. Sitting down here where it was safe didn't feel right. Quinn had mentioned she was a cop and the way she constantly reached for a non-existent weapon on her hip made her realize that must be true. As a cop, she would normally have been upstairs with the others, helping to evacuate the area while the experts disarmed the explosive device. The footsteps grew louder as Quinn came down the stairs. Rice team has secured the device. As soon as they get it away from the area, you can come back upstairs. What do they know about it? Sammy asked. Is it a basic pipe bomb or something more sophisticated? Quinn looked at her for a long moment. More sophisticated than a pipe bomb. Rye's team doesn't have all the specifics yet, but I suspect the goal was to scare me into taking you somewhere else and that the movement of the SUV would trigger the bomb. She nodded, having come to the same conclusion. Horrifying to realize what might have happened if Quinn hadn't been smart enough to check beneath the vehicle. Her gaze darted to Devin and Ellie, two innocent women who'd almost gotten hurt because of whatever she was involved in that she couldn't remember. Why couldn't she remember? Waves of frustration washed over her. Quinn turned and headed back upstairs. It was all she could do not to follow him, wishing she could see the device for herself. See, I knew Rye and his team would take care of this. Devin's voice rang with satisfaction. Sammy just nodded, knowing the bomb was just the beginning. Obviously, she couldn't stay here at the homestead any longer. Quinn wouldn't allow it, even if she wanted to. All clear, Rye called down the stairs. Devin and Ellie popped up off the sofa. 
while Sammy followed more slowly. She had nothing but the stash of cash and Ellie's clothes. She'd need a cell phone and a way to get around the city. As she reached the main level, she saw Rye talking with a tall stranger. When Ellie arrived, the tall, dark-haired man turned to smile at her. Ellie smiled shyly in return. Thanks for all your help, Joe. Ah, uh, of course, any time. Joe quickly averted his gaze. Always here to help the boss. Well, I appreciate you. Was there a hint of flirtation in Ellie's tone? And why did she care? Ellie's love life was none of her concern. Sammy tugged on Quinn's arm, drawing him off to the side. I need help getting some supplies together so I can get out of here. Quinn's expression was grim. I've already arranged to have a rental car waiting for us, as the SUV has been compromised. I've asked Rye and Aiden to get my SUV taken away from here too. I need this guy to believe we're not here, so that my family isn't in danger. I wish I hadn't brought you in the first place, but there's nothing I can do to change that. The words stung, even though she completely understood where he was coming from. She wasn't happy about Ellie and Devin being in harm's way either. Will Rye ask for officers to be stationed here for the next day or two? I have a feeling his team leader, Joe Kingsley, is going to do that regardless, even if that means going against Rye's orders, Quinn said, glancing at the guy next to Ellie. No one on the team is happy about the bomb, especially the fact that it was planted here at Rye's home. His comment put her teeth on edge. I know this is my fault, Quinn. You don't have to keep harping on it. It's not your fault, Sammy, he sighed. I just wish I understood what we were dealing with. Me too. She turned away and headed upstairs to change, raking her fingers through her hair, wishing desperately she could remember who hated her enough to kill her. Joe will give you and Sammy a lift to the rental agency once they're open, Rye said. In the meantime, we'll continue keeping watch. I don't like this, Rye. Quinn watched Sammy disappear up the staircase. The close call was unnerving. What if he hadn't thought about checking the SUV? He and Sammy would both be dead. He turned his attention back to his brothers. I wish we could get away from here now. Look. My guys have swarmed the neighborhood and did not find anyone hiding out nearby. It makes sense that our perp would have taken off, not wanting to be anywhere near a bomb set to detonate once you drove away. Rye rubbed his jaw. I think you're safe to stay for a while. We'll have breakfast, then come up with a plan. We? Quinn shook his head. I won't drag you and Aiden into this mess. Not when I have no clue what Sammy's involved in. My only plan is to get Sammy away from here so that you and the rest of the family are safe. Hey, we're here for you, Quinn, Aiden chimed in. I have one more day off before I have to report in for duty. He appreciated his sibling's willingness to help, despite the threat level. The only thing I really need is cash, and maybe one more change of clothes for me and Sammy. Once we have secured a clean vehicle, I'll find a safe place to stash her. We'll happily give you whatever cash you need. Clothes too, Rye agreed. But I still think we need a plan. Hiding out is fine, but you also need to prod Sammy's memory. I had hoped being here would help, Quinn admitted. Based on the way my SUV was targeted, I don't dare take her back to my place. The only other option is to revisit the places we visited as a couple. That's a good place to start, Aiden said. Glancing at his watch, he added, And since it's already going on five in the morning, we may as well make a pot of coffee. I doubt getting more sleep is an option. Quinn nodded. A few more hours of shut-eye would be nice, but not a necessity. He put a hand on Aiden's shoulder. I'm going to help myself to more of your clothes. Go ahead. I'll give you all the cash I have on hand, too. Aiden was known to be the most fiscally responsible of the Finnegan siblings. The main reason he hadn't moved into his own place was because he was saving for a house and wanted a sizable down payment. The fact that Aiden was offering his stash of cash was humbling. 
I'll pay you back, Quinn said. A grin creased Aiden's face. I'll hold you to that. Quinn chuckled as he headed upstairs. In Aiden's room, he helped himself to a duffel bag, then grabbed more clothes and some toiletries. Then he headed to Sammy's room. Her door was open, and when he peeked inside, the room was empty. Then he heard the shower running and realized she was in the bathroom, hopefully not getting her stitches wet. Leaving the duffel near her bedroom door, he made his way back down to the kitchen. Devin and Ellie usually did most of the cooking, but he figured he might as well get breakfast started. Devin was already there, breaking eggs into a bowl. Hey, Quinn, coffee is almost ready. Why don't you let me make breakfast? Thanks, but I'm better with something to do. She flashed a smile and paused long enough to nibble on a slice of toast. Morning sickness is a bummer, but keeping busy helps. Ah, uh, sure. He knew nothing about pregnancy and morning sickness, other than the first aid he'd learned in the military. His older brother, Brady, had recently discovered he had a son who was already six years old. Grace and Brady had recently gotten married, officially making their son, Caleb, the first in the next generation of Finnegan's. Devin and Rye would soon add to the next generation, too, once their child was born. It made him smile to think about how much fun the cousins would have hanging out together, which only reminded him of the Callahan cousins. Technically, second cousins, he and his family hadn't known about until earlier this year, when Ellie and Maddie Callahan had each worked on creating a family tree on a popular DNA website. When their trees had connected, they learned they shared the same set of great-grandparents. DNA? Fingerprints? Instantly, his mind darted toward Sammy and the boat. He hoped it wasn't too late to get forensic evidence off the vessel. A clue would go a long way to figuring out what in the world was going on. He poured himself a cup of coffee, then used his phone to call his commander. Thankfully, he answered. What is it, Lieutenant? Do you have information from the victim? No, sir, not yet. Quinn quickly explained about the intruder and the bomb. After a long silence, he added, Sir, I won't make it in for my shift today. I need to protect this victim until her memory returns. However, I am wondering about testing her vessel for forensic evidence. We plan to check the boat later today for evidence. What if this woman's memory doesn't return? Or if she's playing you? Commander Calderon asked. I understand your concerns, but she's obviously in danger. And frankly, so am I. The bomb was placed beneath my SUV, which means whoever has come after Sam, or Ms. Lopez, knows where I live and what I'm driving. Quinn knew he was pushing his luck. The military was all about following orders, and the Coast Guard was no exception. I would like to formally request a five-day emergency leave to ensure my safety and that of my family. The long pause made Quinn's stomach knot with tension. If his lieutenant commander refused his leave, he'd be expected to report for duty as assigned or risk being declared AWOL, absent without leave. I'll grant your request, but I expect you to keep me informed on any intel you receive regarding the boat explosion, and whatever activities your victim is involved in, Commander Calderon finally said. Is that clear? Yes, sir, and thank you. I appreciate your support. Hmph, huh, his commander grunted. Summer is our busiest time of the year, Finnegan. I'll expect you to put in some extra time once this is over. Yes, sir, he repeated. That part wasn't a problem. Quinn had been working extra shifts and volunteering for additional assignments since his breakup with Sammy. I hope it's okay if I reach out to Cal. Go ahead. And remember, keep me informed. The last sentence was uttered in a curt tone, as if Quinn might have already forgotten his promise. After a quick call with his younger recruit, who sounded disappointed to be reassigned to someone else, Quinn was satisfied he'd done what was needed for the moment. His nerves were still on edge, and he knew they would likely remain that way until he was able to get Sammy away from the homestead and stashed someplace safe. The sooner, the better.
As if conjured from his thoughts, Sammy stepped into the kitchen carrying the duffel bag. She was wearing a different set of Ellie's clothes, looking refreshed from her shower. Her dark hair was soft and wavy around her face, the way he liked it. I hope you didn't get your stitches wet, he said by way of greeting. No, Ellie gave me a clear bandage thingy to put over the incision. I had to wash my hair. It smelled like fish. She also loaned me more clothes and gave me toiletries too. Your sister is sweet and generous. Sammy frowned. Time for us to get out of here, Quinn. I hate knowing I put Ellie and Devin in danger. He was touched by her concern for his family. We will, after we eat. The car rental place isn't even open yet. I submitted a rental request online, but there's no way to get a key until 8 o'clock. Her frown deepened. That's too long to wait. Maybe we should find a place to hang out near the rental car company. I'm sure there's a cafe or coffee shop nearby. Oh, please stay, Devin said from where she was manning a large fry pan. Breakfast will be ready soon. The beeping sound of their alarm being deactivated had Quinn spinning toward the front door. Get Devin out of here, he tossed the order to Sammy, who was already taking Devin by the arm and escorting her to the other room. Quinn pulled his weapon, but then relaxed when the door opened, revealing his younger brother, Colin. The Finnegans didn't curse. Their mother had made sure of that, but he was tempted to toss a few expletives toward his brother. What are you doing here at this hour? What's this about a bomb? Colin shot back. I have to hear about that through the radio? You and Rye don't bother to call me. Sammy, Devin, it's just Colin, he called. I guess you must have been on duty last night. Yeah, Quinn, I was, Colin scowled. Sammy? As in... He tried not to sigh. Yes, it's a long story, but the short version is Sammy has amnesia and is in danger. Really? Colin drawled as he turned to re-engage the alarm. He loved his family, truly, but getting the same reaction from each one of his siblings was getting old. Thankfully, Rye and Aiden came in too, with Ellie on their heels. It's practically a family reunion. Ellie's smile was bright. Great to see you, Colin. As Rye, Aiden, and Ellie chatted, Quinn noticed Sammy stood off to the side near Devon her expression a mix of appreciation and resignation. She'd probably heard the doubt in Colin's tone about her amnesia. Fifteen minutes later, the family was gathered around the table. As the head of the family, Rye always said grace. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this food and for keeping us all safe in your care today. Please continue to watch over us as we do your work. Amen. Amen. Quinn and the others echoed. He was touched that Sammy participated in the prayer the way she used to. A niggle of doubt flickered in the back of his mind. Sammy was acting exactly the way she used to when they were together. Because that was her basic personality? Or was he being duped by an elaborate ruse? His instincts rejected that idea, but there was no way to know for certain. When breakfast was finished, Sammy jumped up to help with the dishes. Rye pulled Quinn aside, with Colin and Aiden following close behind. His oldest brother shoved a thick wad of cash in his hand. This is from me and Aiden. It should cover you for a while. Thanks, Rye. He pocketed the cash. Sammy and I will hit the road soon. I'll give you a lift, Colin offered. Fill me in on what's going on. Rye gave him a brief overview, with Quinn adding a few details. He ended with, Joe Kingsley was going to give us a ride. Whatever works for the family is fine with me. My car is sitting in the driveway, Colin pointed out, and I have to head home soon anyway. Quinn glanced at Rye and Aiden. That's fine, Aiden said. I'll hang here and help keep the women safe. Thanks, Aiden. I have to head into work, so I appreciate you staying, Rye said. Joe Kingsley is going to sit outside the homestead for a while, too. Quinn was relieved to know Aiden and Joe would keep an eye on things here. He just hoped the perp who'd set the bomb quickly realized he and Sammy were gone, 
so there would be no reason to try to get inside again. Once Sammy and Ellie finished with the dishes, she crossed over to join him. Are we ready to go now? He nodded. Colin is giving us a ride. Sammy grimaced, likely expecting Colin to interrogate her, but she didn't complain. When she moved to grab the duffel, he quickly grabbed it. You want to go out the back? Colin asked, pausing at the door. I can drive around to pick you up outside the Petrowski's house. He hesitated, then shook his head. No, let's go out the front. On the off chance someone is watching from a distance, I'd rather he sees us leaving with a duffel bag. Maybe that will encourage him to leave the homestead and the rest of the family alone. Okay. Colin deactivated the alarm and walked outside. Quinn urged Sammy forward so that he could cover her from behind. There was no sign of the storm now, the blue cloudless sky promising a beautiful, hot summer day. Colin drove a jeep, and thanks to last night's storm, he had the top on. Normally his brother ditched it during the summer months. Quinn tossed the duffel into the back seat, waiting as Sammy slid in too. He joined Colin in the front. A rental is a good idea, Colin said as he backed out of the driveway. What about your SUV? Rye is going to have his guys take it in to be tested for prints. Not that I'm expecting much, he added. I can help in the next day or two if needed, Colin offered. I just worked my 48 hours straight, and I'm off for the next few days. Thanks. We're fine for now, but I'll let you know if anything changes. He shot a quick glance over his shoulder at Sammy. She was intently looking out the window. Colin looked as if he wanted to say something more, but then he scowled, his gaze darting to the rearview mirror. Know anyone who drives a dark green SUV? No. Quinn glanced behind them. How long has it been there? Since we left the Brookland city limits, Colin tightened his grip on the steering wheel. Hang on. Without warning, his younger brother cranked the wheel hard, making an abrupt right-hand turn. Then he hit the gas, speeding up to the next intersection. Quinn reached for his weapon as he noticed the forest green SUV did the same maneuver. Colin, he's gaining on us. I see that. Colin spoke between clenched teeth. He made another quick turn, but then had to slow down when a truck pulled out in front of him. Quinn didn't take his eyes off the green SUV, and when the sunroof opened and a man's head poked up, he yelled, Gun! Get down! Mere seconds before the sound of gunfire echoed around them. Chapter 6 the sound of gunfire had Sammy reaching to her hip, only to belatedly realize, for what seemed like the tenth time, that she didn't have a weapon. Quinn did, though, and he leaned out his passenger window to return fire. A shootout in a Milwaukee suburb was not an everyday occurrence. The thought flashed into her mind, even as Colin wrenched the steering wheel, taking the SUV up and over a curb. After passing a car that had slowed to a stop to avoid the gunfire, he picked up speed. Sammy, get down, Quinn barked. Frustrated by her inability to remember or to help hold the gunman at bay, she reluctantly ducked her head, making herself a small target. Hiding in the back seat didn't feel natural, but as she wasn't armed, there wasn't a whole lot she could do about it. You need to find me a weapon ASAP. Sammy said in a curt tone. This is ridiculous. I need to be able to defend myself and others. That's the Sammy we remember, Colin said with a hint of humor, as if she always issued orders. And maybe she did. What did she know? The gunfire abruptly stopped, so she risked poking her head up to look behind them. The vehicle turned right a few minutes after I returned fire, Quinn said. I thought I heard a metallic ping, Maybe I hit their engine. That's great news, Sammy felt a surge of hope. Turn around, Colin. We need to head back to see if we can track the vehicle. There may be a trail of oil or coolant or something that will lead us to the gunman. No, we need to get you somewhere safe, Quinn said firmly. She thumped her hand against his headrest. No, I'm telling you we need to go back. 
how else are we going to know who's behind this? She has a point, bro, Colin drawled. There were two men in that vehicle, and I'm sure they're both armed. We only have one weapon between the three of us, Quinn scowled darkly. We are not going back to confront two gunmen, understand? She wanted to argue, but the lack of being armed was difficult to ignore. Struggling to remain calm, she said, Fine, but you need to call this in. Maybe the local cops can track the dark green SUV. I didn't see a front plate, did you? No, it was missing. I don't know if the rear plate was also missing or not. Quinn pulled out his phone. I'll call it in, but don't hold your breath. I suspect the gunmen will abandon the vehicle. They can still get forensic evidence off it. She sighed, rubbing her temple. Her headache hadn't completely gone away as she'd hoped. Then again, it wasn't as if she'd gotten much sleep. She doubted Dr. Willis considered being shot at as resting. She listened as Quinn made the call, reporting the forest green SUV and the gunfire. When he finished, she asked, Did you happen to notice if the gunman was wearing gloves or get any other description of the guy? I mostly saw a hand wearing thin plastic gloves, and the weapon looked like a Glock, Quinn thought for a moment. I can't say I got a look at the gunman, but he was Caucasian if that matters. It's something, although not much. I'm sure the evidence collection team will find skin cells or hair fibers in the vehicle. Maybe we'll be able to get this guy's DNA. That would be helpful, if he's in the system. Quinn glanced at Colin. Do you mind taking the long route to the rental agency? Already on a long route, Colin said. And you'd better call Rye. Yeah. Quinn pressed a button, then lifted the phone to his ear. Rye, a forest green SUV tailed us from the homestead. Two occupants, one fired at us from what appeared to be a Glock. I returned fire, and I believe I struck their engine as they turned and gave up the chase. There was a long silence as he listened. Sammy could feel Colin's gaze on her via the rearview mirror. The suspicion in his eyes was impossible to ignore. She batted down the wave of resentment. Her memory loss was real, but she could understand how difficult it was to believe. If she wasn't living it, she wouldn't have believed it either. I'm not blaming the guys on your team. I know they searched the area around the homestead, Quinn said. It could be that the shooter was set up to watch with binoculars from several blocks away. I think the way the gunman used the sunroof worked against him. He must have misjudged the height of his gun and our vehicle because he thankfully missed. Another long silence as Quinn listened. Sammy wished he'd have put the phone on speaker so they could have all heard what was going on. Well, mostly her. She was the target in this mess. And amnesia aside, she preferred to be treated as a competent investigator rather than a victim. Will do. Later, Rai. Quinn ended the call. Rai plans to insert himself into the investigation once the green SUV has been found and processed for evidence. He glanced at her over his shoulder. He promised to keep us informed on any fingerprints or other trace evidence they find. Good. I don't suppose he can put a rush on any possible DNA. He'll do his best, but... Homicide victims tend to have a higher priority over random gunfire in the street, Quinn pointed out. Of course, murder victims were more important. She blew out a breath, realizing she was being overly demanding. The entire world didn't revolve around her. It was just the sense of urgency continued to nag at her, an unseen force pushing at her subconscious. There was something important she needed to do. But what? The rental car agency is four blocks from here. Colin's voice interrupted her thoughts. Do you want me to let you out? It may be better for you and Sammy to approach on foot, rather than in my SUV. Those gunmen may have gotten my plate number. I know, and that concerns me, Quinn sighed. I think you should park this thing somewhere and come with us to rent a different ride. It's not safe for you to be in this one, that's for sure. I'll be fine. Colin protested. You're a firefighter and paramedic, not a cop. Sammy heard the note of desperation in Quinn's voice, and it made her feel guilty all over again 
for bringing danger to the Finnegan family. Please come with us to rent a replacement vehicle, Colin, at least for a couple of days. I'll reimburse you for the expense. It's not the money, Quinn. Colin slowly nodded. Fine, I'll come with you. I'll leave the SUV in that strip mall over there. Perfect. Thanks. Quinn looked relieved. Colin slowed the SUV, then turned into the parking lot. He threw the gear shift into park and shut off the engine. Then he turned to look at Quinn. Just because I'm not a cop or in the military doesn't mean I'm helpless. Quinn lifted his hands. I never said you were, but I don't want to be responsible for you getting hurt either. Rye would be all over my case if I did that. Whatever, Colin muttered. Let's go. Sammy understood and shared Quinn's concern for his younger brother. The gunmen had likely been aiming at her, but they would not hesitate to use Colin, or any of the Finnegans for that matter, as leverage to get what they wanted. All roads led back to her, and whatever she'd been working on when she'd been out on Lake Michigan. She joined the brothers, waiting as Quinn removed the duffel from the back and slung the strap over his shoulder. He paused for a moment to store his weapon inside, before they struck out toward the rental agency. Though it was early, the sun was already warm enough to make her glad she wore one of Ellie's short-sleeved shirts with the capri-length jeans. Aiden will keep an eye on Devin and Ellie, right? She glanced at Quinn. Yeah, they should be fine. Having a security system helps. Quinn sighed. In a way, I'm glad the gunmen followed us. At least they know we're not at the homestead. True but I'm still concerned about the possibility they might try to grab one of your family members as a way to get me. She swallowed hard. I'd never forgive myself if something happened to one of your siblings. Thankfully, we have a lot of cops in the family and friends that are cops. Quinn offered a half smile. Rye is very protective. He'll make sure they stay safe. What about the siblings who don't live there? She couldn't help pressing the issue. I have a bad feeling that these guys will go to any lengths to get to me. You don't remember anything more? Quinn asked. Colin glanced at her, obviously interested in her response. No, I'm sorry. I don't have any memories of what I was doing. She hesitated, then added. But every time we're in danger, I reach for a gun I don't have. And I can't shake the sense... There's something important I need to do. Seeing the disappointment on Quinn's features, she added, Trust me, I'm just as frustrated as you. Well, I'm not sure about that, Colin drawled. We're the ones being shot at without even knowing why. To get to me. The words popped out of her mouth. She lifted a hand. That's not a memory, it's just my gut instinct. The boat was set to blow up with me on board, but somehow I survived. Now they're trying to clean up their mess. We'll figure it out. Quinn shot his brother a narrow look. The rental agency was up ahead. Sammy followed the guys inside. Quinn had submitted a request online, so he was able to obtain the keys to another SUV first. But he waited until Colin had secured a new ride as well. Outside, they parted ways. Call if you need something, Colin said. Will do. Maybe you could help spread the word to the other sibs about being on alert. I'm not as worried about Kylie. She's armed and can take care of herself, but Alana lives on her own near the hospital. I'd feel better if she moved into the homestead for a bit. I'll see what I can do to convince her, Colin agreed. Aiden might be able to sway her mind, too. They've always been close. Twins usually are, right? Sammy asked. Quinn looked surprised. How did you know they were twins? Uh, you told me? She thought back to their conversation the night before. No, I didn't. Quinn held her gaze. Did Ellie say something? She slowly shook her head. Ellie hadn't mentioned the twins, and neither had Quinn or Rye or Devin. I'm not sure how I knew she finally said. I can only hope and pray pieces of my memory will start to come back over the next few hours. She met Colin's suspicious gaze head on. 
He finally shrugged and turned away. See you later. Don't forget to call if you need me. Thanks, Colin. Quinn gestured toward the line of cars. That third one is ours. Moments later, they were settled in the rental, a dark blue SUV. She was glad Quinn had dropped the subject of how she'd known Aiden and Alana were twins. But as Quinn merged into traffic, she tried desperately to remember something more. Yet, the harder she tried, the more her head hurt. At this rate, Sammy feared she'd be dead before she remembered anything about her past, taking the identity of the person who wanted to kill her with her into the grave. Sammy's memory was starting to return. Oh, Quinn knew his family had their reservations about Sammy's amnesia. So had he. But he constantly leaned toward believing her. The Sammy he'd fallen in love with had been tough as nails and fiercely protective of the innocent. From the danger they'd faced over the past 12 hours, he could honestly say her basic personality hadn't changed much, if at all. Easy to see how much she'd hated being relegated to the basement with Ellie and Devin while the guys had been upstairs, waiting for Rai's team to assist with the bomb. You must be working a case, he glanced at her. But when you were part of the Milwaukee Police Department, you weren't a detective, she frowned. Maybe I took a promotion in L.A. Your obituary listed you as LAPD Officer Lopez, not Detective Lopez. He frowned. Or maybe you're in witness protection and your cover was blown. Witsec? She tipped her head to the side as if contemplating that. Anything is possible, but that doesn't fit with the feeling I have something important to do. And if I was in Witsec, relocating me to the Great Lakes region would never happen. Not if I once worked here in Milwaukee. That was a valid point. He stifled a sigh. No use in spinning their wheels on something she couldn't remember. Might never remember. He silently acknowledged. The neurologist had warned them her memory loss could be permanent. As he navigated through the city, he kept a keen eye on his rearview mirror. But there was no sign of a tail or any danger. Feeling reassured, he decided to drive past Sammy's apartment building. Where are we going? Sammy had noticed he'd switched directions. The doc mentioned being in familiar settings might help you remember. Yeah, so where are we going? She repeated. You'll see. Just give me ten minutes or so. He took the interstate to head down to the lakefront. Lakeshore Drive provided a great view of Lake Michigan. He and Sammy had spent a lot of time on Bradford Beach, too. When he took the Lakeshore Drive exit, Sammy straightened in her seat. Oh, the lake is beautiful. So calm and peaceful today, compared to last night. Yeah, it is. He was partial to the water, too, and knew she'd grown up near the lakefront. Her uncle had a boat, and after her parents had been senselessly killed in a carjacking, she'd eventually gone to live with him. And while she'd enjoyed spending time on the water, Sammy had remained focused on becoming a cop. Lots of people out on the beach already she commented as they rode along the lakeshore. I imagine the area will be packed in another hour or so. I see several boats out too. It made him wince a bit, knowing he wouldn't be reporting in for his shift later that day. This time of the year, at the peak of summer, people fell overboard far too often. Excessive drinking played a role, but so did reckless driving. Many boaters who were more accustomed to being on the smaller lakes scattered across the state did not appreciate the difference of boating on such a large body of water as Lake Michigan. Did we spend a lot of time here? Sammy's question interrupted his thoughts. Yes, he shrugged. To be fair, we spent as much time here as possible while coordinating our different schedules. She nodded thoughtfully, her gaze going back to the water. Makes me wonder why I left. I can't answer that one. He tried not to sound hurt or angry. The danger dogging their steps was real, and far more important than their broken engagement, or his heartbreak. But keep in mind, 
The city of L.A. is on the ocean. Maybe that's what drew you to the coast. Her brow furrowed, but she remained silent. He continued driving along the lakefront before turning to head back to the neighborhood where she'd grown up. So far, being in familiar surroundings wasn't working. She seemed curious enough, but there was no sense of recognition. Nice area. She gestured with one hand as he headed away from the lakeshore. Is this where I worked as a cop? Yes, this area was in your district. That gave him an idea. We'll drive past the precinct shortly. Okay. She seemed more than willing to do whatever was necessary to help fill the void in her memory. He slowed the vehicle as he went past her three-story apartment building on Milwaukee's east side. He hid his despair when Sammy barely looked at the building, seemingly more interested in the handful of restaurants and coffee shops. When that didn't work, he drove past the house where she grew up, along with the home she moved into with her uncle after losing her parents, just a few blocks apart from each other. The loss of their parents had been one of the things they'd bonded over. Unfortunately, looking at both properties now, he silently acknowledged they'd been painted and generally updated, so they didn't look anything like the way they did back when she was young. Her face registered absolutely no recognition as he passed by. Zero for three. She abruptly turned to face him. You brought me here for a reason, didn't you? I was supposed to remember being here before? Yes. There was no reason to lie. You grew up in this area. I had hoped it would spark a memory or two. Her tortured expression hit him square between the eyes. For a moment, he wondered what it would be like to wake up not knowing your own name, much less your siblings, parents, or your friends. Devastating was putting it mildly. Hey, don't stress. He put a hand on her knee, trying to sound reassuring. I'm sure your memory will return. I'm not sure of that at all. Sammy's voice was a low whisper. She reached up to massage her temple. I'm so afraid this is my new normal, that I'll spend the rest of my life like this, remembering nothing. Maybe we should consider making an appointment with a psychologist, as recommended by the neurologist. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Her easy acceptance of the proposal only reinforced how badly she wanted to remember. The tough-as-nails Sammy he knew would not have jumped into therapy so easily. He left the neighborhood where she'd grown up to drive past the police precinct. She sighed and shook her head when he sent a quizzical look. Nope, nothing. One last stop, he said, turning to head back down to the lakefront. I could use more coffee and a restroom break. Me too, she agreed. The coffee shop at the bottom of the hill had been their early morning meeting spot, especially when they were both scheduled to work the day shift. It was still early enough that there was available parking. Over the next few hours, though, the entire lakefront would be lined with parked cars in both directions, as far as the eye could see. Sammy glanced around curiously as they got out of the car. Looks like a nice place. It is. He swept his gaze around the area then stepped forward to open the door for her. Another couple was just leaving their table, so he quickly snatched it. You want to use the restroom first? She nodded and automatically turned to head toward the back corner of the shop where they were located. Interesting that she hadn't had to search for a sign, instinctively knowing where to go. Granted, the coffee shop wasn't that large, but still, most people had to search for a sign first. Did this mean her memory wasn't completely lost? This was the third time she'd known something without being told. It gave him hope that her memories weren't buried too deep. Ten minutes later, they both had fresh coffee. Thanks, she murmured. This hits the spot. He had to smile at the phrase she'd used so many times before. Do you still have the card the doc gave you? We can call the psychologist now if you'd like. It's in the duffel bag in the SUV. She stared down at her cup for a moment before meeting his gaze. I really need you to buy me a handgun. I would offer to buy it myself, but 
I don't have my ID. He grimaced and reluctantly nodded. If the situation were reversed, he'd want a weapon too. Okay, that's fine. I have a permit to carry, obviously, so it shouldn't be difficult to get another one. But Sammy, you need to promise to only use it in self-defense. Without an ID or a permit, carrying a gun is illegal. What makes you think I'd start shooting people willy-nilly? She demanded. Of course, I only plan to use it in self-defense. That guy in the dark green SUV was shooting at us, remember? You fired at him in self-defense. But if you weren't armed, we might both be dead by now. Then she frowned and added, Colin, too. I know, and I agree that you should be armed, as it's clear you're in danger. But don't try to make a complicated situation sound simple. It's not. He held her gaze. We can't contact the LAPD to get your ID replaced or your carry permit because they have you listed as being killed in the line of duty. If things go south and you get arrested, I don't know that we'll be able to get you out. Yeah, okay, I get that. She sighed, then straightened. Maybe I should call the LAPD, though. Talk to someone in charge. It may help shed some light on what I've been doing. I'm not sure that's a good idea. We don't know how high up the chain you'd have to go. He couldn't get past the idea that she was pronounced dead to protect her. Let's hold off on that for now. We'll try the psychologist first, then find a place to lie low for a few days. Rest may be the best thing we can do for you. Rest would be nice, she cracked a wan smile. My head is still pounding, but the first item on the agenda is to buy a gun, remember? Got it, he sipped his coffee. I take it this place doesn't look familiar? She gazed around the quaint decor. It feels comfortable to be here, Quinn. Like wearing a favorite pair of jeans. But does that come from a memory? Or is it just because this is the type of place I would normally go? She shrugged. I can't answer one way or the other with any degree of certainty. I understand. And remember, don't push it. Better to let your memory return naturally. If it does at all, she said on a sigh. After they finished their coffee, he led the way back outside. During the 30 minutes they'd spent inside, the lakefront had grown even more crowded. The coffee shop parking lot was full now, and several cars lined the streets. A scream from the beach drew his attention, but it turned out to be a group of teenage girls screaming and laughing while playing volleyball. As he turned back to unlock the SUV, a large gray truck coming down the hill toward the coffee shop caught his gaze. Why, he wasn't sure, but when the passenger window began to lower, he shouted, Get down! Sammy instantly dropped to her knees beside their rental as the barrel of a gun poked through the window. Quinn pulled his own weapon as he knelt beside Sammy, bracing himself as two staccato gunshots reverberated through the air. Chapter 7 she needed a weapon. This time, Sammy didn't reach for the non-existent gun. Instead, she peered intently at the gray truck, trying to get a glimpse of either the gunman, the driver, or a license plate. Anything to help identify those goons. But the truck quickly turned right, sailing through the intersection and nearly hitting another vehicle. Traffic moved at a brisk pace. No, he was getting away. Sammy pushed against Quinn to jump to her feet. She quickly ran, chasing after the car, doing her best to see the license plate. Sammy? Quinn's sharp tone cracked with anger. Stay back! She ignored him, sprinting along the sidewalk to keep pace with the truck. Running did not help her headache one iota. The pain grew with each step. And really, it was no use. She couldn't run at a pace of 30 miles per hour. The truck quickly vanished among the sea of traffic. Bending over at the waist, she took several deep breaths. The pounding in her head was so bad, she feared Devin's breakfast would make an unwelcome return. Willing her stomach to settle, she forced herself to straighten and turn back toward Quinn. He was running toward her, the duffel bouncing against his side with each step, his expression stern. 
come with me. If she'd felt better, she'd have balked at caving to his orders. He was treating her like a junior in the military rather than as an equal. Swallowing hard, she held on to her temper and her breakfast. Did you call it in? Yes, but our rental has a flat tire. He scanned the area suspiciously. I don't want to stay here out in the open. Let's head to the beach. She gestured across the street. We can mingle with the crowd. He glanced at the beach, then abruptly nodded. Okay, that's as good a plan as any. Gee, thanks. His lack of confidence was not endearing. Sorry, I didn't mean that to sound condescending. The light changed, so they quickly crossed the busy street. Reaching the other side, she noted the marina wasn't too far down from Bradford Beach. Maybe we need a boat. Seems like being out on the water is a good way to avoid more gunfire. I'd like to know how they found us at the cafe in a rental, Quinn scowled. I don't like it, Sammy. No one is that good. They couldn't possibly have tracked our rental that fast. There has to be something else going on here. She wasn't sure what to say to that, since she couldn't remember what she was supposed to be doing. Rather than heading toward the beach, she grabbed his hand and tugged him toward the marina. Let's get a boat. That will make it easier to spot anyone coming after us. And we can move to another city if needed. The marina must have rentals. They do, but it's the middle of summer, and there may not be one available. He fell into step beside her, still glancing around warily. Besides, we rented the car, and that didn't work out so well. I'm not doing that again. I have a friend with a boat here. I can call him and see if he's willing to let us borrow it. Good. For the first time since Quinn had rescued her, she felt as if they were on the right track. That being on the water was a good idea. Standing near the side of the marina facing the water, Quinn called his buddy. Sean, it's Quinn. I need a favor. It didn't take long for Quinn to get Sean's permission to borrow his boat. The keys were in a lockbox, and thankfully, Sean hadn't hesitated to provide the code. I have the key. Thanks again, Quinn said as he removed a key attached to a yellow foam float from the box. I owe you one. Sammy swept her gaze over the sea of boats bobbing on the waves. She doubted Sean's boat was one of the larger vessels, but didn't really care if it was little more than a fishing boat, as long as it had a decent-sized motor. Deep down, she couldn't wait to get out on the water. Being on shore had only brought danger to her and Quinn's family. This way? Quinn took her hand to lead her along one of the many piers. Slip number 22. Wow, a Malibu wake setter? She's a beauty. She scanned the navy blue and cream-colored speedboat with admiration. There was even a small canvas top over the driver's seat to protect them from the searing July sun. I was expecting something a step above a fishing boat. Sean uses this for fishing at times, too. Quinn tossed the duffel inside, then helped her step down into the Malibu. But his family was always big into water skiing. She arched a brow. Skiing on Lake Michigan isn't easy. That's a sport for smaller lakes. Oh, he and his sisters manage just fine. They perform in boat shows all summer. Quinn went over to check the gas tanks, then lifted the cover to inspect the inboard engine. Then he made his way back to the bow of the boat. Let's get out of here. Aye, aye, skipper. She jumped out onto the pier and untied the ropes, mooring the boat in place. Then she quickly hopped back in and pushed away from the pier as Quinn started the engine. The low, rumbling sound was music to her ears. Dropping onto the passenger seat across from the captain's chair, she let out a sigh. She trusted Quinn's ability to navigate on the water. That was his job as a coastie, after all. Relaxing beneath the warmth of the sun, she let her eyes drift shut to help combat the thumping pain in her temple. Between the gunfire and their mad dash from the coffee shop, they'd abandoned their plan for her to see a psychologist, something she still thought was important for getting her memory back. Soon, she thought. At some point, 
she'd be able to slow down long enough to try to regain her past. After five minutes or so, the boat picked up speed. The jostling didn't help her headache, but that didn't prevent a surge of relief from washing over her. There was no way the gunmen could follow them from the truck onto the water. They were finally safe. You're heading south? She frowned. Why not north? He eyed her curiously. I can go either direction, but I'm curious if there's a reason you want to head north. I don't know. She glanced around at the open water around them, feeling the same nagging sense of urgency as she had last night when Quinn had rescued her. I guess I just thought you'd head that way. With a tiny nod, he pulled back the throttle and turned the Malibu in a wide circle to head north instead of continuing in the direction he'd been going. I think we're better off trusting your instincts. They seem more reliable than your memory. He isn't wrong about that. The few things she'd seemed to know had come without warning, not from a burst of memory. Any place in particular you'd like to visit? His question was light, but she sensed the underlying tension. Not yet, but maybe something will come to me. She wished she could be of more help, that she could easily identify where they should go and who was after her. But that wasn't the case, at least not so far. For now, she tried to enjoy this time on the water. Suddenly, she sat up straighter. Wait a minute, what about the rental? And the police who responded to the call about gunfire? We should have stayed long enough to provide our statements. I'll give Rye a call soon, he shrugged. One of my siblings will take care of the rental car, and giving statements will have to wait. My priority is to keep you safe. She appreciated having his protection, but it didn't seem right to leave the scene of a crime, especially when she'd been targeted by gunfire for the second time in a matter of hours. How had they been found at the cafe? She couldn't imagine a likely scenario where the gunman from the dark green SUV abandoned that ride, were able to obtain a gray truck, and then had come to the very location where she and Quinn had gotten a cup of coffee. Unless the person coming after her knew she and Quinn had frequented that coffee shop? A shiver snaked down her spine. Okay, so the perp coming after them knew her on a personal level, enough to know she'd once been engaged to Quinn Finnegan, not to mention being familiar with the places where they'd spent time together. Who? The void in her memory had never been more frustrating. Why couldn't she remember something so critically important? She pressed her palms to her temples as if to stop the pounding in her head. Quinn must have noticed because he pulled back on the throttle, slowing their speed. Are you okay? Do you feel sick? No, she wasn't okay, and yes, she did feel sick, but she refused to throw up in front of Quinn. I'll be fine. We'll slow down, Quinn said. There's no rush, especially since we don't have a firm destination in mind. Yeah, I know. She slouched in the seat, resting her head along the back cushion. The slower speed was slightly better, but the waves still slapped and rocked the vessel. No way around that on a lake the size of Michigan. Soon, the sunshine helped ease the tension along the back of her neck. In a way, she wished they could just stay out on the water forever. But while the Malibu speedboat was nice, it wasn't a luxury yacht with a sleeping compartment. For a brief instant, the memory of going down to a sleeping berth on a larger boat flashed in her mind. Then it was gone so fast, she couldn't even say for sure it was a memory or just her imagination of what a yacht might look like. She considered mentioning the flash to Quinn, but then decided to remain silent. Even if that image had been an actual memory, it didn't provide any intel to assist in navigating through their current situation. What good was it to remember being on a larger boat? According to Quinn, she'd grown up on the water. Her uncle allegedly had a boat. Maybe it was similar to the one she'd imagined. Either that, or a boat just like it belonged to a friend, or she'd seen pictures online. At this point, 
she couldn't be certain of anything, except that someone was determined to kill her. The boat slowed even more. Curious, she turned to glance at Quinn. Something wrong? No, just enjoying the view. His smile made him even more handsome than before. It's been a while since I was on the water for something other than work. You must get sick of being on the lake. That he spent most of his days on the water hadn't occurred to her. Not at all, he assured her. Then he offered a lopsided smile. However, being on the water all day is the primary reason I don't own a boat of my own. Figure the expense of maintaining a boat isn't worth it, considering how many hours I put in during the summer. Bring out another thousand, she said with a grin. Quinn laughed for the first time since he'd pulled her from the water. Yep, that's exactly what boat stands for, at least according to my buddy Sean. She was grateful he hadn't asked how she'd known that funny acronym. It was just like the other tidbits of information that came to her without conscious thought. Turning in her seat, she looked toward the shore. There were clusters of huge mansions overlooking the water, but also areas where there were smaller homes too. They came upon a long stretch with nothing but empty shoreline, making her wonder who owned the land. Knowing how much people valued property on the water, she suspected the state or nearby city owned it. A sign caught her eye. Welcome to Shady Lane. Quinn, she reached over to grab his hand. His fingers were warm to the touch. Have you been to Shady Lane? No. Why? He pulled back on the throttle some more, so they were just rocking gently on the water. Does it look familiar? She wished it did. It sounds familiar, as if maybe I lived there at some point. You didn't live there during the time we knew each other. A frown furrowed his brow. And after you left me, you went straight to the West Coast. At least, according to the obituary I read about you being killed in the line of duty. She couldn't tear her gaze from the sign. Can we stop here for a bit? Look around. It may help trigger my memory. Fine with me. He turned the wheel so they were heading on a diagonal path toward the small marina. Most of the cities on the lake had them but the size of the Shady Lane Marina was much smaller than the one in Milwaukee. As they grew closer, Sammy felt her pulse kick up a notch. Was Shady Lane the secret to unlocking her amnesia? Quinn divided his attention between the Shady Lane Marina, the other boats on the water, and Sammy. This trip to Shady Lane held promise. The fact that Sammy had stared so intently at the sign indicated she'd been there before, possibly in the not-too-distant past. He'd promised to buy her a gun, but there was no way to have done that before heading out on Sean's boat. Shady Lane was a much smaller city than Milwaukee, but that didn't mean there wasn't danger waiting for them on shore. Deciding to drive past the marina, he pressed the throttle forward. Sammy didn't seem to notice, her gaze still riveted on the part of the city that was near the water. He made another wide turn, intending to return to the marina. There was a public pier off to the side, where just one other boat was currently moored. Sammy stood and leaned forward to help bring the Malibu alongside the dock. She tossed the line, then nimbly jumped out to secure it. Soon, they were both walking up the pier toward the shoreline. He kept his pace slow, hoping she'd recognize something, or someone. But Sammy remained silent as they headed up the slope to the sidewalk leading toward the marina building itself. He'd been there once before, after rescuing a group of kids that had driven so recklessly they'd capsized their boat. One of the kids had been injured, suffering what appeared to be a broken leg. He'd carried the kid up here to be taken to the closest hospital by ambulance. They have a restaurant inside, he said, keeping his voice low. We can eat lunch there or try another place along the water. Let's walk for a while, if that's okay with you. Sammy's smile was strained, and he couldn't tell if that was from her headache or the situation. I want to look around town in case I've been here before. No problem. 
He caught her hand, feeling certain she had been in the town of Shady Lane very recently. Her memories might be blocked, but it also seemed as if her subconscious was trying to steer her toward the truth. Lead the way. She let out a choked laugh. As if I know which way to go. Let's keep heading north for a bit. He obliged, keeping their pace slow and easy. He wanted to give the impression that they were a couple enjoying a bit of sightseeing. As such, he pointed out a few things. That looks like a cute restaurant, doesn't it? Oh, and what about that picnic area across the street? Looks like a great place to relax. Are you trying to prod my memory? Her tone held an edge. Because that's not going to work. No, I'm playing tourist. He gently squeezed her hand. Relax, Sammy. Pretend we've never been here. Let's act as if we're curious about the city and the sights they have to offer. Good idea. He felt some of her tension ease, their joined hands swinging a bit as they walked. It's a little early for lunch, though, isn't it? Not at all. We ate breakfast at the crack of dawn. He swept his gaze over the area, pretending to look for a restaurant. There were plenty of people milling about, kids riding skateboards or rollerblades, parents pushing strollers, an elderly couple walking slowly while leaning on canes. There was not a single person who appeared to be paying them any attention. Frankly, he'd like to keep it that way. The road running parallel to the lakefront was not nearly as busy as it had been back in Milwaukee. He found himself eyeing every approaching car with suspicion, as if expecting the gunman to show up here. The more he thought about the shooting outside the coffee shop, the more he believed the men trying to kill Sammy knew her on a personal level. Otherwise, he couldn't fathom how they'd known to show up there at that precise moment. A tracking device? Impossible, since Sammy was wearing Ellie's clothing, and she didn't have a phone or a wallet, much less a purse. It was maddening, and reminded him of the need to update his brother. Let's sit in the shade for a bit, he suggested. I'd like to call Rye. Sure. She allowed him to lead her to a vacant bench beneath a large maple tree. He pulled out his phone, wincing at the four missed calls from Ryan Collin. He'd felt his phone vibrating while out on the boat, but the sound of the engine and the wind would have made conversation difficult. He quickly pressed the redial for Rye, who answered immediately. Where have you been? His oldest brother demanded. We've been worried sick. I'm fine and so is Sammy, he quickly reassured him. I'm sorry I couldn't call you back until now. I borrowed Sean Murphy's boat to get away from the gunman who seemed to know our every move. I'm texting Colin. He's driving around the lakefront searching for you. Rye was silent for a moment, then added, I don't understand how you were found at the coffee shop. Is there something you're not telling me? I was wondering how they found us there too, Rye. He caught Sammy's curious gaze and snuggled closer turning the phone a bit so she could hear. He didn't want to place the call on speaker, bad enough he was having this conversation in public in the first place. I think it has to be someone who knows Sammy well enough to be familiar with her favorite locations. Well, stop going to familiar places, Rye said curtly. This is getting out of control. Since he couldn't promise to stay away, he let that comment slide. I need help with the rental. The tire needs to be repaired before it's returned. Colin is already on that, Rye admitted. But the local police are not happy that you left the scene of the crime. They think you have something to hide. The coffee shop barista told them you ran across the street to Bradford Beach. We did, yes, but only to escape being tailed by the gunmen. They were in a gray truck this time. Do you have any information on the dark green SUV? It was found abandoned, five blocks from the shooting location. No witnesses have come forward yet with a description of the shooters. My team is culling through camera footage of the area now. The SUV is being swept for trace evidence though, right? Yes, but DNA will take time. No prints have been found yet that I'm aware of. Rye paused, then said, 
You didn't answer my question, Quinn. I can't. I think it's best for us to fly under the radar for a while. A truck came down the street in their direction. He rested his hand on his weapon, but it passed them without hesitation. He forced himself to relax. It would be highly unlikely for anyone to search and find them in Shady Lane. I'll keep you updated if anything changes. I don't like it, Rye repeated. But I understand your concern. Just know we're here for you if you need us. I appreciate that. He was blessed to have a family that would rush to his side at a moment's notice. But after the near miss at the homestead, he was not going anywhere near Brookland. Not until Sammy had her memory back and could help him find the people responsible. There were at least two men involved. Maybe more. Keep me posted, Rye said. You too. Thanks again. He straightened, lowering the phone to end the call. Your family is amazing, Sammy said. I love the way they rally around you when times are tough. I'm very blessed. He pocketed his phone. I was going to call my boss, too, but I'll do that later. His stomach rumbled and he glanced at his watch. Believe it or not, it's almost noon. Why don't we eat at that restaurant we passed a few minutes ago? What was it called? Skitters? We can keep walking around the city afterward. Sure. Sammy didn't immediately stand. Her gaze focused on their surroundings. So he waited, hoping something looked familiar. Lunch is a good plan, but I still need that weapon. Unfortunately, I don't see a store nearby that looks like it sells handguns. He pulled out his phone again, searching for well-known chain stores that he knew sold guns. There's a store five miles from here. After we eat, we'll call a rideshare and head over to buy that weapon. Really? Her expression brightened and a smile bloomed on her features. Thanks so much. The only other woman he knew who would be this excited to purchase a gun was his sister Kylie. Then again, she was a sheriff's deputy just like Sammy was a cop. He chuckled and rose to his feet, offering his hand. Food first, though. I'm hungry. Sounds good. She took his hand. Maybe when we stop to buy the gun, I can get some over-the-counter pain meds, too. This headache won't let up. That made him frown. Because you need rest. I doubt running from gunmen and speeding along the lake was on your discharge paperwork from the hospital. No, but I'll survive. She continued to hold his hand as they retraced their steps toward the Skidders restaurant that boasted a view of the lake. They were about 20 yards from the restaurant when a male voice called out from behind them. Angelina, is that you? Sammy's grip tightened painfully on his hand, tension reverberating through her muscles. Without giving himself time to think it through, he drew her closer and whispered, Don't turn around. Then he slowed to a stop, pulled Sammy closer, and kissed her. Chapter 8 Quinn's kiss caught her completely off guard. The moment his mouth captured hers, she melted against him. His kiss was better than anything she could have imagined. There was no denying she'd wanted this since the moment he'd rescued her. Losing herself in his embrace was easy, but when Quinn lifted his head, reality returned like a slap to the face. Angelina, why did that sound familiar? Quinn said her name was Sammy. That was very nice, Quinn murmured, keeping his arm around her waist. Don't look back. Let's just head to the restaurant, okay? Okay. Between the impact of his kiss and her headache, she was having trouble thinking clearly. Quinn strode at a leisurely pace, as if they had all the time in the world to spend in Shady Lane. It took all her willpower and then some not to look back over her shoulder to see the man who'd called out to her. Angelina. The name flitted like a butterfly in her mind, as if seeking a landing place, a bit of memory that would make sense of this. When they reached the restaurant, Quinn opened the door for her. She stepped inside, glancing around curiously. 
had she been here before? It didn't look familiar, although the sailing design of the restaurant wasn't anything super creative. She imagined there were dozens of restaurants just like this one scattered along the lakeshore. Table for two? The hostess smiled and picked up two menus. Inside or out? Outside, she and Quinn answered in unison. The hostess laughed and led the way through the restaurant to a large deck area overlooking the water. Each table had an umbrella to provide shade from the sun. She was glad to see they were offered a table in the corner, away from the other diners. Your servo will be with you shortly. The hostess set their menus down, then turned away. Now that they were seated, Sammy surreptitiously glanced around at the other diners. I hope you're not upset with me. Quinn kept his voice low. You vibrated with tension when that man asked if you were Angelina. I thought it best to act as if we were a couple in love to throw him off. Hard to be upset at the kiss, although she experienced a stab of disappointment that Quinn had used the embrace as a cover. I'm not angry. The name Angelina sounds familiar, but I have no idea why. She hesitated, then added, To be fair, Sammy sounds familiar too. It could be that I knew someone named Angelina. Quinn nodded, searching her gaze. That is possible. You don't have any siblings that I know of. You told me you were an only child. I am? That didn't seem right, but what did she know? Interesting. Their server filled their glasses with water. After chatting for a few minutes, she and Quinn placed their order. Once they were alone again, Quinn leaned forward, propping his elbows on the table. Sammy, is it possible you're working undercover? Maybe as part of a Mexican cartel? With your Hispanic heritage, I can see how you would fit in without much difficulty. And it would also make sense as to why there's a report of you being killed in the line of duty. Anything is possible. And based on what you've told me about my background, I'm leaning toward that theory too, she agreed. But what good is being undercover if I can't remember what I'm supposed to be doing? Quinn's dark brown gaze held hers. I don't know, but I don't think that guy called you Angelina by accident. Did you get a look at him? Any description at all? He shook his head. No, I didn't want to do anything that would raise his suspicions that you were, in fact, Angelina. Especially since you wouldn't remember him anyway. And we have no idea if he's a good guy or working for the gunmen. Yeah. She pressed her fingertips into her temples. This is driving me crazy, Quinn. I need to know what's going on. I feel like I'm walking through a minefield and could blow myself up any second. I know. His gaze was full of empathy. Somehow, we need to find a way to unblock your memory. She tamped back a flash of anger. I've tried, Quinn. I didn't mean to insinuate you haven't, but maybe that's the point. You need to stop trying. She sighed and sat back in her seat. Not an easy task, when I know there's something important I need to do. And some stranger thinks I'm Angelina. Let's try to look on the bright side. Quinn held her gaze. You wanted to come to Shady Lane, and it seems as if that instinct was a good one. Maybe we should find a motel here to stay the night. No, I don't think so. She instinctively rejected that idea. If one person believes I'm Angelina, others may too. I don't want to mess anything up in case I'm supposed to be doing something or meeting someone, sticking around may only put us both in danger. Quinn sighed. Okay, we won't stay. He leaned back in his chair when their server approached with their lunch. Looks delicious, thanks, Quinn grinned, falling easily into the role of tourist. He gestured to the lakefront. We're loving the view. It's nice, isn't it? Melanie set their plates before them. Do you need anything else? No, thank you, Sammy said. Melanie turned away, stopping to check in at her other customers' tables. Quinn reached across the table to take her hand. I'd like to say grace. Of course. She bowed her head, 
clinging to Quinn as if he were a buoy holding her afloat. Maybe the nautical theme of the restaurant was getting to her. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for keeping us safe in your care. Bless this food we are about to eat and continue guiding us on your chosen path. Amen. Amen, she echoed. Movement from the corner of her eye caught her attention. A Hispanic man wearing cargo shorts and a t-shirt strolled past the deck. When he glanced in their direction, she tightened her grip on Quinn's hand in a silent warning, then spoke in a loud voice. That was a lovely prayer. I'm so grateful God is watching over us. I'm truly blessed to be here with you. I'm blessed as well, Quinn responded, seeming to understand the diversion tactic she was using. We need to visit the church before we go. She smiled widely. Oh yes, let's do that. After a long moment, she released Quinn to reach for her silverware. The Hispanic man had continued walking toward the lakefront. She hoped he'd overheard their discussion and had decided once and for all she wasn't Angelina. You think that's him? Quinn asked as he picked up his burger. I do. She took a spoonful of her chicken tortilla soup, enjoying the spicy taste. The man was far away now and well out of hearing range, yet she continued watching him without being too obvious. There was no real evidence that the man who'd walked past was the same one who'd called out to her, other than the fact that he seemed far too interested in them. Wishing she'd been able to snap a picture of the guy, she ate another spoonful of soup, then took a bite of her half a turkey sandwich. Surprisingly, the meal helped settle her stomach. How are we going to get on the boat to get out of here? She eyed Quinn over her sandwich. Seems our Hispanic friend intends to hang out at the lakefront for a while. Don't forget, I promised to buy you a gun. Maybe by the time we do that and get back here, he'll have given up. She hoped he was right about that. They ate in silence for a few minutes, and she appreciated the warm breeze coming off the lake. Maybe Quinn was right about her needing more sleep. The interrupted bit of rest she'd gotten last night wasn't nearly enough to make her feel refreshed, much less allowed her brain to heal so that she might remember. Was she wrong not to stay the night here in Shady Lane? Doing so seemed like taking a big risk, yet the thought of getting a room and crawling into bed for a few hours tugged at her. Are you ready? Quinn asked, pulling cash from his wallet. Yes. She stacked her empty soup bowl on the empty plate. Her lunch had been just the right amount. As she rose to her feet, she could see the Hispanic man was still down at the lakeshore. She wondered how long it would take him to realize she and Quinn had left. Then she realized he could easily have a partner watching the front. Quinn paid for their meals, then escorted her back through the restaurant to the front door. Before he stepped through it, she gestured toward the restrooms. Let's take a break before we leave. She lowered her voice and added, We need to consider there could be someone out front waiting for us, with the Hispanic guy covering the back. Understood, Quinn murmured. After using the restroom, she quickly returned to the hostess stand. When Quinn joined her, she pulled him close. We need to go out through the kitchen. There's probably a side exit. I can't say for sure it will help much. There isn't a lot of cover here. Let's do it. He took her hand and headed straight for the swinging door. They'd taken only a few steps when one of the staff members frowned. You're not supposed to be in here. Sorry, we're leaving. Quinn didn't hesitate, walking straight through to the side door. Moments later, they were outside near a large dumpster. Another building was a few feet away, which she thought was maybe a tourist shop. This way, she gestured toward the store. They ducked inside. The place was busy, so no one paid them much attention. She tried to remember what businesses they'd passed on the way in. Why hadn't she paid more attention? There's a set of restrooms here, too, and another side exit, Quinn murmured. He was tall enough to see over the crowds. Let's get a hat and new shirts first, she suggested. Then change in the restrooms and get out of here. Good idea. It didn't take them long to change. 
Sammy pulled her hair back into a ponytail, and Quinn donned a baseball cap. The side exit took them to a cross street. Quinn used his phone to obtain a ride share. How long? Sammy asked, trying to appear nonchalant. There was no sign of the Hispanic man, but there were plenty of other people milling about. Any one of them could be another watcher. Three minutes, Quinn caught her hand. Nice idea on how to get out of the restaurant. I'm glad your cop instincts are working. She managed a smile. Me too. Minutes later, their rideshare driver pulled up to the curb. Quinn? He asked. Yes, thanks. Quinn stepped forward and opened the door for her. He gave the driver their destination as they settled into the back seat. No problem, the guy said. As they left the downtown area of Shady Lane, Sammy scanned the crowds, trying to find anyone who appeared to be watching and waiting. But she couldn't identify anyone suspicious, leaving her to wonder if the Hispanic guy was working alone, or if the team coming after her were exceptionally good at staying hidden from view. Quinn felt Sammy relax for the first time in what seemed like eons. That was close, he whispered. No kidding. He wanted to broach the subject of staying overnight again, but held off because of the rideshare driver. The town of Shady Lane wasn't quite as picturesque outside the downtown lakefront area. The neighborhoods surrounding the shopping complex could have been found in any town in the entire state. He gave the rideshare driver a tip, then walked with Sammy inside. Thankfully, Quinn's fingerprints were already on file, and he had his carry concealed permit with him too. Buying the gun and ammunition wouldn't take long. I'm going to grab a few personal items. Sammy released his hand. I'll meet you at the cash registers. He hesitated, then relented. Sounds good. They should be safe enough here. There was no sign of the Hispanic guy they'd seen outside the restaurant, and if the guy had a partner, Quinn didn't see how they could have been followed. Still, he was anxious to buy what they needed quickly so they could duck out. The sooner the better. He purchased the same make and model handgun that he knew Sammy had used as a cop with the Milwaukee Police Department. Once his ID and permit had been accepted, he was given the weapon and a box of ammo. He added a belt holster too, then paid the bill. The purchase put a dent in his cash reserves, but Rye had given him more than enough that he wasn't too concerned. Walking back through the store, he stopped to buy a disposable phone, then found Sammy near the front self-checkout lane. She had a small basket of over-the-counter meds along with toiletries. He was touched she'd included two toothbrushes, one for him too. Minutes later, they were back outside. This way, he gestured toward the nearby grocery store. We'll call another ride share from there. Thanks again for buying the weapon, she said as he handed the bag over to her. I feel better already. He wished he felt the same way. Not that he begrudged her the ability to defend herself against an unknown threat. He only hoped he wasn't wrong about Sammy, that she was, in fact, one of the good guys. I pray you won't need it. Even as he said the words, he knew he was fooling himself. He'd bought it for a reason. He had no doubt she'd be forced to use it, especially if the gunmen showed up again. Only as a last resort, she agreed. They walked along the front of the grocery store, then around the corner where there were less people. He stood in front of her so she could unpack the thirty-eight, load it, and connect the belt holster. Good thing Ellie loaned me a belt, she muttered, or we'd be heading back inside to buy one. Ellie would give a stranger the shirt off her back. He smiled at the memories of the various stray pets and people the youngest Finnegan had brought home during her teenage years. She has a heart of gold. I know, she would have given me half her wardrobe if I'd have let her. Sammy stepped up beside him, her new Shady Lane t-shirt covering the gun on her hip. Sure, a cop would likely be able to tell, but hopefully not the average person, including the Hispanic guy and his possible partner. Thanks for the disposable phone, she said. But it's useless, unless we can go somewhere with power to activate it. You're welcome, and we'll work on that soon. He'd purchased it on the off chance they got separated. He lifted his phone. 
Where to? Do you want to head back to the Malibu? I was thinking we should consider staying at a motel for a while. She lifted a hand to her head. I hate to waste money, but my headache is no better, and the ED doc did suggest rest. That's why I purchased more toiletries, despite having the duffel in the boat. Besides, the longer we stay away from the lakefront, the better. We can slip out of the marina at dusk. Sounds good to me. He liked the idea of Sammy getting some sleep and staying away from the lakefront for a while. He scrolled through his phone and found a relatively inexpensive motel. There's a place just two miles from here. No lakefront view, but it fits our budget. Works for me. She smiled wearily. If I don't get some rest, I won't be any good at fighting the bad guys. Agreed. I'll call a rideshare. It was a short trip, but walking two miles wasn't an option. To his chagrin, the same driver was the only rideshare vehicle available. Must be slim pickings in small towns like this. He put in the request, then led Sammy around to the front of the grocery store. Same car, Sammy let out a low groan. I hope the cops don't have to question him about us. I know, but for all we know, he's the only rideshare driver operating around here. The car pulled up alongside them. Better than walking. Hello again, the driver greeted them. Where to? The Shady Lane Motel, Quinn instructed. The driver frowned. There are much nicer places to stay in town. That's okay, we're on a tight budget. Quinn assured him. This is a great place to visit, though. Very nice. We like it, the driver agreed. He went on to talk about his wife and two kids during the less than five-minute ride to the Shady Lane Motel. Thanks again, Quinn said, adding a tip that would make the guy's time worthwhile. I'm here most days if you need me. The driver lifted his hand, then drove off. Guess that means we'll be riding with him back to the marina later. Sammy did not look happy with the idea. Maybe not. There may be a different driver for the evening shift. They stepped inside the small lobby. The place was shabby but clean, which went a long way in his book. Since they weren't planning to stay overnight, he only paid for one room with two double beds. Sammy didn't question his decision, and it was a testament to how tired she was that she set her gun aside and quickly crawled into bed without saying a word. He closed the drapes to darken the room, then sat on a chair in the corner to charge and activate the disposable phone, making sure to add the number into his phone so that he could easily reach her if needed. As he worked, he tried to think of another way to spark Sammy's memories. So far, all their attempts had been a complete bust. Oh, she'd had glimmers of knowledge that had appeared out of nowhere, but at this rate, summer would be over by the time she remembered what she was doing out in the middle of Lake Michigan. Hearing the Hispanic guy calling out to her using a different name added credence to his growing belief she was working undercover. For all he knew, Shady Lane had sounded familiar because it was a drop site. Interesting, though, that seeing the Hispanic guy had not brought forth a slew of memories. Maybe she hadn't known him well enough to make a lasting impression. Then again, she hadn't remembered him either. Not their relationship, their engagement, or planning their wedding. Kissing her had seemed like a good idea to fool the Hispanic guy, but it had also been a keen reminder of everything he'd lost. He'd missed Sammy far more than he'd realized, more than he'd admitted to his family, especially after hearing about her death. Now she was back and involved in danger up to her pretty neck. Even worse, he didn't know the source of the threat against her. Setting the new phone aside, he stifled a yawn. Rest wasn't a bad idea, so he crawled into the other bed and closed his eyes, smiling a bit as he listened to Sammy's deep, even breathing. The next thing Quinn knew, he was staring at a clock that read 7.45. Not seven in the morning, but in the evening. Five hours. With a renewed sense of energy, he rolled out of bed and ducked into the bathroom. When he was finished, he found Sammy sitting at the side of her bed, blinking groggily. How are you feeling? He searched her gaze. 
Good, thanks, she stood. But if you're asking about my memory, it's still nothing but fog. I wasn't trying to push, he said mildly. I'm more concerned about your pain level. My headache is much better. The meds and sleep really helped. She brushed past him to take her turn in the bathroom. Five minutes later, she asked, Ready to head back to the marina? It's not dark yet, he cautioned. I know. The sun is going down, though, so that will help. She pulled on her holster and tucked the thirty-eight inside, then covered it with the hem of her shirt. She ducked into the bathroom, returning with the shopping bag of their toiletries. I'm ready. He called for another rideshare, thrilled to see a different driver. This guy wasn't shatty, which suited him just fine. Quinn requested to be let out a few blocks south of where they'd left their boat, so they could approach the Malibu from the opposite direction. The sun was making its slow descent to the west. He pulled the brim of his ball cap low on his head and led the way around the back side of the marina to reach the public pier. See anything? he asked in a low voice. Negative, Sammy replied. The length of the pier seemed inordinately long. Upon reaching the Malibu, he quickly jumped inside and began checking the engine and fuel supply, while Sammy untied the lines and tossed them inside the boat. Looks fine. I don't think anything has been tampered with. The duffel is still here too. He started the engine. Time to get out of Dodge. I'm with you on that. Sammy leaned over the side of the boat and pushed them away from the pier, then pulled up the rubber buoys that were used to keep the boat from smacking against the pier. They hadn't gone more than a few yards when she abruptly dropped to the bottom of the boat near him. He's here. I see him. The Hispanic guy that had called out to her earlier was hard to miss as he was sprinting toward them. Cranking on the wheel, he put the boat in reverse and hit the throttle backing away from the pier. Gun! Sammy shouted, peering over the front edge. Without hesitation, he pulled hard on the wheel, forcing the bow of the boat toward the open expanse of the lake. He slammed into drive and pushed the throttle forward. The boat leaped forward, speeding away from the shoreline with blatant disregard for the no-wake signs. Bending low over the wheel, Quinn mentally braced himself for the sound of gunfire. Chapter 9 Sammy crouched beside Quinn, facing the stern of the boat, watching the Hispanic guy on the pier with her newly purchased thirty-eight in hand. If the stranger fired at them, she'd return the favor, but as of yet, he hadn't. Even from a distance, she could see the look of confusion on his features. She felt the same way. What in the world was going on? Was the Hispanic guy her contact? She couldn't remember and had no way of knowing which side of the team he was playing for. It only took a few minutes for Quinn to get them far enough from the shoreline that the Hispanic guy was no longer a threat. When she couldn't see him anymore, she holstered her weapon and turned to Quinn. Thanks for getting us out of there safely. He nodded, then asked, Why didn't he shoot at us? We were close enough initially that he probably could have taken me down. I have no idea. The dark abyss in her mind was maddening. Maybe he's one of the good guys. Quinn shrugged. We could head back, see if talking to him helps you to remember. No, I'm afraid I could put others in the operation at risk if I say something wrong. Now that she thought about it, she wondered if she had messages on her old phone, the one she'd likely lost in the boat explosion. Obtaining a replacement phone was impossible, though if it was under an assumed name. Angelina what? Something Hispanic, surely, but that fact alone was no help. The sun hung low on the horizon. Turning her back on the glorious sunset, she made her way to the seat across from Quinn's. Do you have a destination in mind? She lifted her voice to be heard above the roar of the engine and the slapping of the boat against the waves. Anywhere but Milwaukee. Quinn's smile was wry. I was thinking we'd go a little south to Ravenswood. Sounds good. She knew the city of Ravenswood was roughly 30 miles south of Milwaukee, knowledge that had nothing to do with remembering. Had she been in Ravenswood before? She had to assume so, but 
couldn't conjure an image of her being there, alone or with someone, like Quinn. Despite her memory loss, she was comfortable around Quinn. She hadn't worried about him taking advantage at the motel either. Granted, she'd been exhausted and in pain, but she hadn't been the least bit wary of their close proximity, the way she would have been with a stranger. Their five-hour nap had helped tremendously. Her head still ached, but it wasn't nearly as bad as before, even while being jostled in the boat. Quinn eased back on the throttle, taking their speed down a few notches. She enjoyed the wind in her hair, along with the cooler temperatures on the lake, thanks to the sun disappearing below the horizon. If not for her memory loss and the danger that stalked them, she'd enjoy this time on the water. Quinn had gone far enough out that it was difficult to see the shoreline, but that didn't concern her the way it had before. Before? She straightened in her seat, desperately trying to grasp the memory fragment. Nothing but water surrounding her on all sides with storm clouds rolling in, bringing the promise of rain. For a brief moment, she could see herself at the wheel, feeling the fear laced with sheer determination that pushed her forward. But when she tried to remember back further to what had sent her out on the water in the first place, there was nothing but fog. Okay. Sammy drew in a deep, calming breath. A fragment of a memory was better than nothing, a good sign that more bits and pieces would fall into place soon, hopefully before the gunman had her in his sights again. She wanted to share the news with Quinn, but since the bit of memory didn't give them anything more to go on, she held back, telling him would only get his hopes up and she hated to disappoint him. Doing her best to clear her mind, she silently counted to ten, while relaxing against the seat cushions. Fighting to remember hadn't worked, but meditation techniques might. Sammy? Quinn's voice had her opening her eyes. His concerned gaze lingered. Are you okay? Are you feeling sick? I can slow down more if necessary. I'm fine, truly. She smiled reassuringly. It will be completely dark soon, so there's no need to slow down. Better we get to Ravenswood sooner than later. Okay. He pushed the throttle forward, picking up speed. I'll need to talk to my commander when we get there. He granted me five days of leave, but also asked me to keep in touch. Her heart squeezed at the thought of Quinn putting his career on the line for her. Yet the thought of being completely on her own was terrifying. Not that she couldn't protect herself, because she could. The Hispanic man had already recognized her as Angelina. What if she stumbled across others who knew her too, as either Sammy or Angelina? Without her memory, it would be impossible for her to differentiate between friend or foe. Quinn turned the wheel heading closer to shore. His confidence at the helm was reassuring. With his focus on the shore, she reveled in the opportunity to watch him. Their incredible kiss had caused her to wonder why on earth she'd broken off their engagement. The chemistry between them wasn't fake, at least on her part, and she'd sensed he'd been all in on the kiss too. So many unanswered questions, so many unknown details. Why had she gone to LA? What was she involved with now? Did she still love Quinn? Difficult to think about being in love when you didn't know who you were. Would she recall falling out of love with him once her brain began working again? It seemed inconceivable. But then again, that word pretty much described the entire situation. Giving up on the relaxation techniques, she watched the landscape, searching for familiar landmarks. She made sure not to push herself, but simply looked around as if visiting Ravenswood for the first time. Did we spend time here? Quinn glanced at her. Yes, we came to the beach a few times. The Ravenswood Marina is less crowded than the one next to Bradford Beach. She nodded, wishing the shoreline looked familiar. The sandy shore appeared similar to the one back in Shady Lane. Then a red fire tower came into view on top of a platform settled over a rocky area of the lakefront. I've been there. 
The fire tower. She glanced at Quinn. Were you with me? Did we climb it together? We did, he smiled. You remember us? She grimaced. I remember the tower. Can't say that I remember much else. Was the tower significant in some way? It seemed odd she'd remember that and not any of the other beaches Quinn had passed or the coffee shop where they'd spent time together. Quinn pulled back on the throttle so that they were riding slowly past the fire tower. Again, she had a strange sense of deja vu. She knew, deep in her bones, she'd been up on that platform. She remembered being happy, looking out over the water as the waves lapped over the rocks below. It's beautiful. Technically, it wasn't. The paint was faded, and there were some rust stains, but she didn't care. Finally, Quinn broke the silence. The platform on the fire tower is where I proposed to you, Sammy. That's where you agreed to marry me. I, uh, really? His quiet revelation was like a punch to the gut. The feeling of joy faded, leaving her feeling sick and shaky. It didn't make sense. She didn't know what to say. Deep down, she couldn't imagine taking a marriage proposal lightly or breaking a promise. Why, Lord, why? Her silent prayer went unanswered. A myriad of emotions crossed Sammy's features. Her happiness at remembering quickly followed by guilt and confusion over the reason for her brief memory. It was telling that she only remembered being on the fire tower, not his proposal or their engagement. He pushed aside the stab of disappointment to focus on the positive. I'm glad you remember the fire tower, even if you don't remember anything else about us being there. A small memory is progress. Is it? She tucked a stray strand of wind-blown hair behind her ear. The trip down the shoreline had caused much of her hair to escape the ponytail. I want to believe more memories will follow, Quinn, but so far, nothing important has come back. What good are bits of memory if they're useless? She sighed with frustration. We need to know who the gunmen are and why they're coming after me. Oh, and it would also be nice to know if I'm working undercover as Angelina and who the Hispanic guy was, too. Give it time, he urged. We don't have time, she snapped, then winced. Sorry, this is hardly your fault. No need to apologize. I'm encouraged that the rest you've gotten so far seems to be helping. He turned the wheel to head back toward the marina. His intent was to use the public dock to keep the boat overnight, then find a place to stay. Maybe a cheaper place since he'd already spent so much of the cash Rye had given them on other necessities. The biggest problem facing them was the need to create a plan, a way to figure out what was going on, to understand the source of the danger. Too bad he was completely out of ideas. Quinn maneuvered the Malibu into a slip on the public pier. As before, Sammy readily jumped in to help bring the boat in, instinctively knowing what needed to be done. I wouldn't mind getting something to eat. He glanced at her as they walked up the pier toward shore. He'd left the duffel in the boat for now, figuring they'd grab it later. There are plenty of places within walking distance. Sounds good. She cocked her head. You're all about the food, Finnegan. He stumbled at her teasing. The comment was something she'd often said to him during their time together. Hey, you didn't grow up with eight siblings. I had to hold my own with Rye, Taryn, and Brady, or I'd never get enough to eat. Those guys were chow hounds. At least you had food, Sammy shot back. Being in foster care meant that was never a certainty. You remember the year you spent in foster care? Quinn asked. Before your uncle took you in. She abruptly stopped. I lived in foster care? I must have, or why would I have said that? She answered her own question. You did. You told me about it. You lost your parents the way I did. You had an uncle, but there was some problem with your parents' estate. They had to get that settled before they'd allow you to live with your uncle. 
A shiver of excitement rolled over him. First the red fire tower, now this? Sammy's memory was starting to return. Did I say anything else about my childhood? Sammy resumed walking, glancing up at him along the way. It seems odd that I would have spent any time at all in foster care if my uncle was around to take care of me. Well, he challenged your parents' estate, and the lawyer assigned to represent you as a minor wanted to be sure his motive wasn't just the money. But he had a boat, which means he must have had plenty of his own money, she argued. He lifted a hand. That doesn't mean he didn't want more. But honestly, Sammy, I'm only repeating what you confided to me, that you eventually went to live with your uncle and everything was fine. Your uncle passed away a few months before we met, so I didn't know him. How did he die? He shrugged. I believe he had a massive heart attack. Again, that was what you told me. I didn't pry because it seemed as if you didn't have many happy memories of that time of your life. That's odd, though, isn't it? Sammy's brow furrowed. If I spent a lot of time on the water on my uncle's boat, we must have been close. So why wouldn't he have just taken me in? It doesn't make any sense. Her questions were alarming, more so because he didn't know the answers. They'd been more focused on their respective careers and their upcoming wedding, not on the past. He took her hand, turning her to face him. What are you saying? That the danger you're in now is related in some way to your uncle? I, that's crazy, right? She searched his gaze. I mean, how could the gunman coming after me be related to a man who died who knows how many years ago? Five years ago, he clarified. So, yeah, that doesn't seem to make sense. They resumed walking, crossing the sandy beach toward the closest restaurant. Sammy was lost in thought, so he didn't interrupt. Was he my dad's brother or my mom's? Different last name, so I'm assuming he was your mom's brother. Your uncle was Chris Sewell. You inherited your Hispanic genes from your dad, Manuel Lopez. He paused, then added, From what you told me, your parents were very happy together, and you did spend a lot of time on your uncle's boat out on Lake Michigan prior to losing your parents. Unless you remember something significant, I don't think there's a reason to consider criminal behavior among your family. It may have been that your parents' estate went into probate or something. Okay, thanks. She offered a lopsided smile. I guess that helps. It's hard not to be suspicious of everyone. All are guilty until ruled out, he said, quoting her. He read my mind, she joked, then sobered. Well, you would have read my mind if there was anything worthwhile in my brain to read. Don't be so hard on yourself. You didn't cause your amnesia. He opened the restaurant door. The place wasn't crowded because of the late hour. Restaurants often closed their kitchens by 10 p.m., and it was 9.30 now. Two, please, for dinner. No problem, the woman smiled. This way. Their table overlooked the lakefront, but as the sun had disappeared by now, there wasn't much to see, a few boat lights out on the water, and some stragglers on the beach. They didn't linger over the menu both choosing the grilled salmon special. You should tell me more about my past, Sammy said when they were alone. Hearing details might spark memories. Maybe, but I don't want to create memories for you. Her jaw dropped. You think I lied about my past? No, but it would be better for the memories to return naturally. Not that he was any expert. Besides, we need to figure out our next steps. Other than keeping you safe, I'm out of ideas on where to go next. Like I'm any help, she muttered with self-derision. My brain is useless. You're smart, and you still think like a cop. He arched a brow. If you were a cop trying to help a woman find a gunman coming after her, what would you do? Go back to the scene of the crime. She spoke without hesitation, then slowly shook her head. That's not really an option, though, is it? 
I doubt being in the middle of Lake Michigan will help me remember. Your boat, he snapped his fingers, realizing he should have thought of it earlier. I'll find out where they towed it so we can head over to take a look. A spark of interest flared in her dark eyes. That's a great idea. Do you think it's my boat? Like, registered in my name? Not sure. He glanced around, then pulled out his phone. I'll call my commander. Lieutenant Commander Calderon, his boss answered. Where have you been, Finnegan? Is this your idea of regular updates? No, sir. I would have called earlier, but I don't have anything new to report. However, I do have a question. Was the victim's boat towed in? Is it docked at the Coast Guard station? Yes, and yes. Calderon's tone was curt. We ran the registration. The vessel belongs to an Emilio Vasquez out of L.A. We're still trying to get in touch with him. Emilio Vasquez out of L.A.? He repeated for Sammy's benefit. Do you think it might be stolen? Who knows? Calderon sounded annoyed. Your Vic still hasn't remembered her past? I'm afraid not. The Coast Guard station was closer to Milwaukee, as it was the largest city along the state's shoreline. He'd purchased a small condo nearby after Sammy had left him, using the money he'd saved for their wedding. Sensing his boss's impatience and fearing he wouldn't be allowed to keep the full five days of leave, he provided the little bit they had learned. While we were in Shady Lane, a Hispanic guy called Sammy by the name Angelina. He clearly recognized her, which makes me think she could be working undercover. Angelina, huh? He could almost hear Calderon drumming his fingers on his polished desk, despite the late hour. Yes, sir. And when we left Shady Lane via boat, the same man ran toward us, as if intending to jump aboard. He also had a gun, but didn't use it. A contact? Calderon asked. Maybe the Hispanic guy is Emilio Vasquez, and your Vic was using his boat. Very possible. He gave Sammy a reassuring smile. Looks like I'll need the full five days, sir. I know it's asking a lot, but I am concerned about Sammy being in danger from an unknown assailant, especially if she is working undercover. Fine, Calderon said. But don't forget, you owe me. I won't. Thank you. He lowered the phone. We'll head over to the Coast Guard station to see the boat after we eat. The stolen boat, you mean? She grimaced and sipped her water. I would like to say I didn't steal it, but I have no clue if I did or not. I only hope going to see the vessel helps shake something loose. Me too. Keep in mind, you may have borrowed the boat, Sammy. Maybe. She didn't sound convinced. Their server arrived a few minutes later with their grilled salmon. Anything else? The kitchen will close down soon. This will be fine. Thanks. When she left, he reached for Sammy's hand. I'll say grace. Lord Jesus, we thank you for keeping us safe in your care. We ask for your strength and guidance as we continue to bring the gunmen to justice. And, Jesus, please, please help restore Sammy's memory. Amen. Amen, she said, holding on to his hand for several seconds before releasing it. I'm not sure God cares about my memory. He frowned, as it was uncharacteristic of Sammy not to believe. My favorite Bible verse is from the book of Psalms. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked on to him and were lightened. Their faces were not afraid, she added. Then she looked surprised. Is that right? Yes, that's right, he smiled. Your memory is starting to come back, Sammy. Not to knock the Bible, but remembering what I'm involved in and who wants to kill me would be a little more useful. He shrugged, unable to argue her point. They dug into their food, enjoying the tender salmon and asparagus. Now that they had a destination in mind, he was anxious to hit the road. Or, in this case, the water.
they'd make better time getting to the Coast Guard station using the Malibu. Less than 20 minutes later, they reached the Milwaukee shoreline near his headquarters. He tied up at the pier, leaving the duffel behind. Sammy jumped out, and he quickly followed, leading the way to the clearly damaged vessel. The entire stern was submerged underwater. It's good they were able to tow it before it sank, Sammy said with a frown. I agree. He looked down at the area where the engine would normally be. There's nothing left of the motor, and most of the back is submerged in the shallow water. I noticed. She put her hands on the bow and leaned in. Looks like any other speedboat. Yeah. He came over to stand beside her. When she reached out even farther, he lightly grabbed her waist. Be careful. This thing will go completely under if you get inside. I'm checking something, Sammy said. Then she abruptly held up a handful of wires. See this? The radio was sabotaged. You remember that? His pulse kicked up with excitement. We knew the explosions were likely set intentionally, but the cut radio wires sealed the deal. I remember checking the radio, finding the wires, then jumping out of the boat. Sammy straightened. There was a strong scent of gas, too. He was thrilled. Her memory was starting to return. Seeing the boat had been a good decision. You knew the boat would explode. I knew something was wrong and bailed out, Sammy corrected. Then she frowned. I wish I knew why I was out there, though. We'll find a place to stay for the night, he shrugged. More rest can only help, right? Right. She turned to stare at the boat as if there was something nagging at her. But then she sighed and stepped away. The sense of urgency is stronger now than ever. It will come, he looped his arm around her shoulders. Have faith, Sammy. God is with us. Look how much you've remembered already. Yes, I know. She smiled and leaned against him. You've been a rock through this, Quinn. I wouldn't be here if not for you. I'm thankful to have been here when you needed me. He couldn't deny thinking God had brought them together again for a reason. Yes, to help keep Sammy safe, but maybe there was something more. No, he shouldn't put that on her shoulders. Just because their brief kiss had knocked him off balance didn't mean she was ready for a reconciliation. The truth was, when she regained her memory, she'd know exactly why she'd left him two years ago. A dark shadow caught his gaze. He instinctively jutted sideways, pushing Sammy toward the side of the building as a gunshot reverberated through the darkness. The gunman had found them. Chapter 10 her left shoulder hit the wall of the building as gunfire rang out. Sammy tried to reach for her weapon, but Quinn's weight pressing against her made that impossible. This way. He finally moved enough that she could grab her gun. He drew her back along the wall toward the lakefront and away from the gunman. We need to split up, she whispered. See if we can't get one of them in custody. No, Quinn's tone was curt. There could be more than two guys out there with weapons. Splitting up is not an option. We're getting out of here. She opened her mouth to argue, but heard another gunshot as the wood splintered far too close to her head. As much as she hated to admit it, retreat was probably for the best. For now. But she despised hiding from the threat rather than approaching it head on. How would they ever figure out why these men wanted to kill her if they didn't toss them into the box to question them. Quinn drew her around the corner, then gestured toward the lakefront. Understanding his intent, she sprinted toward the public pier where they'd moored the Malibu. Concerned by the way Quinn stayed resolutely behind her, placing himself between her and the gunfire, she leaped over moored lines to reach the boat as quickly as possible. In the distance, the sound of sirens filled the air. Someone inside the Coast Guard headquarters must have called 911 to report the sound of gunfire to the authorities. She hadn't seen anyone come out, but it was dark, and she may have missed them. Seeing the Malibu, she jumped inside. Keys, 
she yelled at Quinn. He tossed them to her, dropping to the pier to untie the lines. She started the engine as he threw the lines into the boat, then quickly joined her. Without hesitation, she put the engine in reverse to back away from the pier. From the corner of her eye, she saw Quinn pull in the buoys, then crouch beside her, weapon in hand. Hurry, he urged. On it! When she was far enough away from the shore, she pushed the throttle forward. The Malibu leaped over the waves. She headed straight toward the center of the lake, taking them away from the danger. What about the police response? She asked, once they were well out of range from the threat behind them on shore. She raised her voice to be heard over the engine. Will you get in trouble for leaving the scene? No, I'll get in touch with my commander later. Quinn's expression remained grim. That was too close. I don't understand how they're tracking us. There must be something we're missing. She nodded, sharing his concern. Throttling down a bit, she turned the boat to head back toward Ravenswood. Do you think they had the wrecked boat under surveillance? Risky, Quinn said. Lots of people going in and out of the Coast Guard headquarters. Yeah, she couldn't quite bring herself to believe it either. Maybe the boat has a tracking device on it. And they just happened to show up as we were there? Quinn snorted. That's a pretty big coincidence. No such thing, she agreed. Where are you headed? Quinn asked. Back to Ravenswood? You have a better idea? I'm open to suggestions. No, Ravenswood is fine. I don't think those guys have a tracker on this boat, especially since they came in from the road, not the lakefront. We need to find a safe place to stay for the night. Safe? She swallowed a bitter laugh. There was no such thing. Maybe once she regained her memory, they'd be in a better position to go on offense. All this running away was extremely frustrating. They reached the Ravenswood Marina quickly, traveling on the water by boat faster than driving by car. She slowed their speed as they went past the public pier, searching for signs of danger, but saw nothing. It looks clear, Quinn whispered. She was about to turn the Malibu around, but then hesitated. The public pier was a logical place for the gunmen to search for the Malibu. Maybe we should go farther down the lakefront. We don't have access to a private pier. The more distance we put between us, the better. Good idea, he nodded, then gestured to the wheel. You okay, or do you want me to take over? I'm fine, she flashed a grin. It's nice to be the captain for once, he chuckled. Good thing your boating expertise is not linked to your memory loss, or we'd be in trouble. True. Her smile faded as she considered the few bits of memory that had returned. Her boat had been sabotaged, something she must not have known or she wouldn't have taken it across Lake Michigan. The Hispanic guy in Shady Lane had referred to her as Angelina, likely an undercover identity provided to her by which agency? The DEA? That made the most sense if drugs were being transported via Lake Michigan. Sure, there was a Coast Guard presence here, but not with the numbers of Coasties guarding the well-known drug portals of entry, specifically along the California and Florida coastlines. No use speculating as to what she may have been doing or who was coming after her. Her headache was better, but not gone. Getting more sleep was probably the best thing she could do to improve her chances of remembering her mission. Not just her mission, but her time with Quinn, too because she absolutely could not comprehend why she'd let a man like him go. Other than being a bit bossy, she hadn't found many flaws. Clearly, something had caused her to end their engagement. But what? She had no clue. Lights in the distance grew brighter as they approached. Noting the sign indicating they'd reached the city of Kennedy, she slowed their speed to find the public pier. This time, she was relieved to see several boats moored there. Maybe they would act as a layer of camouflage for the Malibu. She thought briefly of digging out the boat cover, but decided against it. Better to have the boat ready to go in case they needed another quick getaway. Quinn helped moor the boat, grabbed their duffel and over-the-counter meds she'd purchased in Shady Lane, then held out his hand so she could climb out. She passed over the key 
falling into step behind him as they walked up to the shore. He had his phone out, staring intently at the screen. There's a motel six blocks from here. He held up the phone so she could see the image on the screen. It's nothing fancy, but should suit our needs. Sounds good. Who was she to argue? While she'd recognized the name of the city, she could not remember having been there before. Staying in a place close to the lakefront was smart. The Malibu offered their only way to make a quick escape. Quinn carried the duffel. They walked quickly, keeping a wary eye out for possible threats. When they reached the motel, Quinn surprised her by asking for connecting rooms. She was about to protest, then thought better of it. The main problem with motel rooms was there was generally only one way in or out. The door and the windows were typically on the same wall, forcing the occupant to stay inside to take cover, if the bad guys showed up. Corner units were sometimes available, but from what she could tell, this place didn't offer one. A connecting room offered some additional protection. They could draw the bad guys into one room while escaping out the other. Five minutes later, they were settled in their respective rooms. Sammy unlocked and opened her connecting door, waiting for Quinn to do the same. The rooms were decent and clean. She was glad they'd been able to haul the duffel from the SUV outside the cafe, where the gunman first found them. No, the first time they'd been found was at the Finnegan Homestead. The second time, after leaving the Finnegan Homestead, the third time at the coffee shop across from Bradford Beach. Tonight, they'd been discovered at the Coast Guard headquarters. Far too many instances to be a coincidence. Dragging her fingers through her hair, she abruptly turned when Quinn's door opened. Oh, hey. She willed her pulse to return to normal. You startled me. Sorry, he shrugged. I wanted to check on you. Make sure you don't need anything. I'm fine. She offered a weary smile. I plan to get some sleep, too. But I'm wondering if these gunmen are tracking you somehow, Quinn. Me? His brow lifted. How so? I don't know. But the bomb placed beneath your SUV indicates they know you're with me. They found us at your family's home, at the coffee shop, and again tonight. She shrugged, then added, Maybe they're able to track your phone. They'd need some high-level access to track a phone provided by the military. He pulled the device from his pocket, then powered it down. Do you want me to walk a mile or so away to dump it? It was tempting, but the phone was already here, so dumping it elsewhere wouldn't work. No, let's hold off. If they find us here then we'll know for sure they're tracking the phone. He frowned. I don't like that plan. We're sitting ducks here. We already have the rooms, she felt compelled to point out. Waste of money to leave here to find a new place. Quinn's scowl deepened. I don't care. If we run out of cash, I'll ask Rye or my other siblings for more. I'm not sitting here all night like bait, waiting for the snakes with guns to arrive. I have money too. Reaching into her pocket, she pulled out the wad of cash in the thick plastic bag. This is the only thing I had on me when you pulled me out of the water. May I see that? He held out his hand. She readily handed it over. It's only a couple hundred or so. I didn't count each bill, but that should be enough to find a new place to stay if needed. Although, I'd still rather wait to see if the bad guys show up here. We need to find out what they know. Quinn opened the waterproof bag and pulled out the cash. He fanned it for a minute, then began counting the $20 bills. A small flat disc fell onto the floor. For a long moment, she could only stare at it in horror. Is that what I think it is? She asked hoarsely. That's how they've been tracking us? Tracking me? Seems so. He bent to pick it up. I have a plan. Her knees felt weak. Sinking down onto the edge of the bed, she tried to gather her scattered thoughts. Someone had slipped that tiny disc into her cash reserves, which meant the person behind all of this was someone close to her. Likely, someone she'd trusted.
Quinn sympathized with Sammy's reaction to the tracker. It was so small and slender that it was no wonder she hadn't noticed it earlier. It's not your fault. She let out a harsh laugh. Oh, it clearly is. But I'm glad we found it. At least we know your phone is safe. It wouldn't hurt to dump the phone too, but not yet. This device was likely what had led the bad guys to them. Not in Shady Lane, though. Why? Because they'd been out of transmitter reach while they were out on the water? Maybe. Could be the bad guys would have eventually found them in Shady Lane, if they hadn't left when they did. He was sure that being out on the water for so long had helped. No cell towers out there. There's a gas station just a few blocks from here. I'll be back soon. You're going to place it on a moving car? She grimaced. No, I don't want these gunmen to attack innocent people. He nodded thoughtfully. Good point. Okay, here's a better idea. I'll take the Malibu out to the middle of the lake and drop it into the water. They'll know we found it, but that can't be helped. I'll tag along if you'd like, she offered, stifling a yawn. He hesitated, torn by indecision. On one hand, he'd rather she stay here to get some rest. Her memory returning was the key to this mess. Yet, he also didn't like leaving her alone. Yeah, she was armed, and her cop instincts were intact, but still. Since the moment he'd pulled Sammy out of Lake Michigan, she'd been at his side. Leaving her felt like he was leaving something important behind. Not good that his old feelings for Sammy had returned with a vengeance. Even after the way she'd broken his heart, he still cared about her. Get some sleep, he said finally. If the tracker isn't here, you should be safe. This won't take long. She shrugged. Okay, if you're sure. He wasn't sure about anything, but gave a brief nod as he turned away. After leaving the motel room, he jogged the six blocks back to the marina. The area was deserted, and it didn't take long for him to push the Malibu away from the pier and out into open water. He took the boat several nautical miles from shore before finding a buoy bobbing near a rock. He took a moment to set the disc on the buoy, hoping it would buy them some time. Satisfied, he took the boat in a wide arc to head back to shore. If not for the seriousness of the situation, he'd have enjoyed being out on the water on a moonlit night. Hundreds of stars winked in the darkness, brighter here away from the lights of the city. There was a sense of peace gliding along the water, away from others. But the atmosphere of peace was an illusion. He told himself he and Sammy were safe now, that the tracker had been removed. But he couldn't quite believe it. They couldn't relax their guard, not until they understood the truth. The guys coming after Sammy weren't stupid. They would soon figure out their tracker was no longer working. How long would it take for the bad guys to come up with a plan B? Not long enough, he thought. They needed a clue, something tangible to work with, to guide their investigation into who these guys were and why they wanted to kill Sammy. He brought the Malibu safely up to the pier. Not easy to do alone, but he managed. Once the vessel was secure, he walked back toward the motel. Quinn was only two blocks away when he noticed a man standing in the shadows, talking on a cell phone. His voice was low, making it impossible to eavesdrop on the conversation. The intensity of his tone and the rigid way he held the phone made Quinn pause. The man's back was to him, so he ducked behind a parked car to wait and watch. Had the gunman tracked Sammy to this area already? Or was his paranoia getting the better of him? This guy could be dealing with a personal issue, not looking for Sammy. Yet, he didn't move, straining to listen. After a minute, the low voice stopped as the unintelligible conversation ended. Easing along the side of the truck, away from the road, he tried to get closer to see what the guy was up to. The stranger was still there, standing in the shadows. Was this one of the gunmen waiting to be picked up? Quinn glanced around searching for a partner. Sammy's comment about taking one of these guys in to question them made him consider approaching the guy. Before he could act on that thought, he heard the rumble of a car engine. 
Keeping his head low, Quinn silently prayed the approaching headlights wouldn't reveal how he was crouched there alongside the parked truck. The headlights grew brighter as the vehicle moved down the street toward the man on the phone. Quinn tensed, ready to spring out and fight if these guys found him. The sound of a car door opening reached his ears, then a curt tone. It's about time. I last tracked her at the lakefront. A car door slammed, and the vehicle rolled away. Quinn scrambled around to the front of the truck to stare at the vehicle moving down the street. He only caught the first two letters of the license plate, A.G. The make and model of the car were impossible to pinpoint. They were heading to the lakefront. He leaped up, intending to follow. Quinn? Sammy's voice came from the general direction the car had taken. What are you doing out here? He stared in surprise as she ran down the street toward him. I saw this guy walking past the motel talking on his phone. I decided to follow him. Her gaze was difficult to read in the darkness. They're heading to the lakefront. I know. Let's go. As they ran, he took out his phone and powered it up, wishing he hadn't shut it off earlier. They couldn't confront these guys without having backup. He was about to dial 911 to report the vehicle and the two letters he'd gotten off the plate when another pair of headlights slashed through the darkness. He and Sammy were on the sidewalk, well off the road, but the lights grew brighter at an alarming rate of speed, and they were heading straight toward them. The gunman? Look out! He snagged Sammy's arm and pulled her off the sidewalk and across the front lawn of a nearby home. Without hesitation, he ducked between two houses, cutting through to the backyards. He didn't stop there, but kept going, across the road and between two more houses. Once they'd gone several blocks in the opposite direction of where the motel and the lakefront were located, he slowed to walk. He and Sammy were both breathing heavily from their mad dash, but he intended to keep moving, taking whatever shortcuts they could. Was that the gunman? If so, how did they know to turn around? Sammy asked, between gasping breaths. They saw one of us, or maybe both of us. He shook his head, sharing her frustration. Either way, we can't stay here, Sammy. And I'm concerned about heading back down to the marina for the Malibu, too. It's our only ride, she protested. We can't protect ourselves or investigate this case on foot. We need to be able to get from one place to another. What case? The annoyed question left his mouth before he could prevent it. Never mind. I didn't mean that the way it sounded. No, you're right to be upset. She sounded exhausted. I'm likely working a case undercover, but without knowing any of the players, not to mention what crime I'm trying to prevent. He caught her hand and stopped, turning her so they faced each other. There were no streetlights in this neighborhood, but some of the homes had lights on, providing just enough ambient light for him to see her features. We're going to get through this, Sammy. Together. I want to believe that, she whispered. Have faith, he murmured, pulling her close. He hugged her, needing the physical contact in the face of the non-stop danger. I'll call my brother Colin. He offered to help, and I'm sure he'll give us a lift. Maybe it's time to get away from the lakefront for a while. And, on the bright side, the gunmen can't track us anymore. Your brothers are incredible. It's nice to have someone to count on in times like this. They are. He pulled out his phone to make the call. Colin sounded half asleep, but he didn't hesitate to drive out to meet them. Thankfully, he still had the rental SUV, which would help provide anonymity. He'll be here in 15 to 20 minutes. He slid his phone back into his pocket. Come on, we'll need to keep moving just in case. Okay. Sammy sounded uncharacteristically subdued. He was concerned her headache was growing worse. He preferred her spunky take-no-prisoners attitude. Are you okay? It would be best if we kept moving. Sure. Her one-word answers were even more worrisome. This way. He tugged on her hand, 
guiding her toward a bright sign in the distance. As they grew closer, he noticed it was a gas station slash convenience store. The area around the gas pumps was brightly lit, so he gestured to the back of the building. We'll wait over here. Sammy nodded and leaned against the side of the building. She massaged her temple but didn't voice a complaint. He quickly called Colin. Hey, we're at a gas station slash convenience store called Lucky Lou's. I'll find it, Colin assured him. According to the GPS, I'm still a solid 15 minutes away. No problem. He disconnected from the call and stood alongside the wall by Sammy. We'll get you some rest soon. My headache is getting worse, she confided. I really intended to sleep, but when I saw that guy, my instincts told me he was up to no good. You have amazing instincts. He slipped his arm around her shoulders and urged her closer. Lean on me. That she did so without hesitation was cause for concern. Sammy turned in his arms, resting her head in the hollow of his shoulder. I don't know why I'm so tired. Hey, running from the bad guys is enough to drain anyone, and you've been suffering a concussion combined with amnesia. He kissed her temple, ignoring the flash of desire, longing for more. I hate feeling weak. Sammy, cut yourself some slack, okay? You are one of the strongest women I know. He ran his hand down her back. She rested against him for several long minutes before lifting her head to look up at him. I must have been nuts to have walked away from you, Quinn. It wasn't easy to make light of their devastating breakup, at least on his side, but he did his best. Oh, I'm sure you'll remember all of my annoying faults soon enough. She stared up at him, but he couldn't read her expression in the darkness. Unless I caught you cheating with my best friend, I can't imagine why I'd leave you. I didn't cheat. The words came out sharper than he intended. Why was he defending himself to a woman who'd left him? Really, Sammy, don't worry about that now. We need to stay focused on the gunmen threatening you. Her brow furrowed. I can't help but think about you, our failed relationship, and the gunmen. There doesn't seem to be a logical explanation for any of it. He wanted to assure her there was, but the answers would only be revealed once her memory returned. Not if it returned, but when. He was more convinced than ever. She'd remember more once she was given more time to rest and recover. Quinn? Her tentative tone made him look down on her. Without warning, she went up on her tiptoes and kissed him. A real kiss, not the pretend one they'd shared back in Shady Lane to avoid being recognized. The feelings he thought were long buried, boiled up to the surface. This, he wanted her more than ever. He hauled her close and kissed her back, wishing for the first time that her memory wouldn't return. Maybe this time, Sammy would fall in love with him again, and they could have the future they'd once dreamed about. One in which they were together again. Chapter 11 The heat of Quinn's kiss made stars explode in the darkness of her mind. Clutching him close, she reveled in his embrace. Being held in Quinn's arms as he kissed her as if his life depended on it felt like coming home. When he broke off the kiss, she wanted to cry out in protest but she forced herself to wrestle her emotions under control. Her visceral response proved her feelings for him were not dead and buried. Yet she'd returned his ring and walked away from him, had moved across the country to Los Angeles, California. Why? The confounding question had no answer. Her pulse beat rapidly in her chest, as if she'd run a mile rather than spent a few minutes in Quinn's arms. I, uh, that was amazing. Lifting her head, she met his dark gaze. Being with you feels right, Quinn. Yeah, well, that might change once your memory returns. His wry tone made her frown. Kissing me didn't bring back your memories of our time together, did it? No. 
His question had her stepping back, gathering her strength to stand on her own two feet. Was that the reason behind their sizzling embrace? Just the thought of Quinn kissing her to spark memories made her angry. She was about to snap at him, but caught herself. This wasn't his fault. She'd instigated the kiss, not him. She put a hand to her head, massaging her temple. The nagging headache just would not go away. How long before Colin arrived? Having a Finnegan sibling as a buffer between them suddenly seemed like a good idea. As if in answer to her prayers, headlights brightened as a car pulled into the parking lot of the gas station. Stay here. Quinn's voice was a low whisper. I wasn't expecting him this early. I need to be sure it's Colin. She nodded, moving to the side to give him room to edge along the back of the building. The headlights went off, leaving them in darkness. Holding her breath, she waited for Quinn to verify their ride. Coast is clear, Sammy. Let's go. She quickly followed Quinn to the SUV. He slid in beside his brother, leaving her to take the back seat. How did you get here so fast? Quinn asked as Colin flicked on the headlights and turned around in the parking lot. No traffic, Colin grinned. Besides, firefighters like to drive fast. Except being in a car and exceeding the speed limit is a good way to get stopped by the cops, Quinn shot back. Colin shrugged. It was worth the risk. His gaze found hers in the rearview mirror. What happened to you two anyway? Long story. Quinn sighed. We discovered a tracking device in a small wad of cash that Sammy was carrying since she'd landed in the water after her boat engine exploded. We ditched it, but haven't dared return to the boat we'd been using. Colin whistled. Not good. But you're safe now, right? Hopefully, Sammy said. But without my memory returning in full, I still have no idea who the bad guy is and why he's coming after me. I'm sorry to hear your memory hasn't returned, Sammy. Colin's friendly tone was a welcome surprise. Did this mean he finally believed her? Okay, Quinn, where do you want me to go? Drop us at the American Lodge for now, Quinn said. When Colin groaned, he added, I know that's backtracking and out of your way, but we need time to rest and regroup. That's our best chance of getting Sammy's memory to return. It's fine. Colin quickly assured him. I'm happy to help, and I know Gary won't mind either. Gary? Sammy echoed. Do I know this guy too? No, Gary is a retired firefighter. He opened the American Lodge several years ago after he was injured in the line of duty, Quinn explained. Rye and Tara know him fairly well, as do our cousins, the Callahans. Callahans? That name didn't sound familiar either. Her frustration with her foggy brain grew more acute by the second. Did I meet them? No, we just learned about them a few months ago. Well, back in January. Quinn tossed a reassuring smile over his shoulder from the passenger seat. Ellie did a DNA test and began creating our family tree. Maddie Callahan did the same thing. Apparently, both sets of DNA revealed the family connection. Nice. She swallowed a surge of impatience. The idle chit-chat about cousins and family shouldn't annoy her. It wasn't as if she could remember anything useful to continue their investigation. Taking a deep breath, Sammy forced herself to relax. She closed her eyes and cleared her mind. The snippets of memory were encouraging. Quinn was right about the need for her to get some rest. That seemed to be the only thing that had worked so far. It still smarted to know he'd kissed her to spark memories of their time together, not because he wanted to. Yet, in a way, she couldn't blame him for not wanting to become emotionally involved, not when she'd left him, for reasons she couldn't begin to fathom. The red fire tower where he'd apparently proposed flashed in her mind. She had to force herself to think of something else, anything but her former relationship with Quinn. The brothers fell silent, making it easier for her to quiet her mind. She must have dozed because when she heard Quinn's voice, she blinked, realizing they'd reached their destination. The American Lodge was a two-story white building, 
There were rooms on both the first and second floors, a balcony walkway lining the second row of rooms. I can pay, Quinn protested, but Colin was already pushing out of the car. Gary knows me, Colin grinned. This way we'll get the Finnegan discount. You mean the law enforcement and firefighter discount, Quinn said. Whatever works. Colin shut the door and hurried inside. Looks like a nice place. Sammy leaned forward to touch Quinn's shoulder. Is he getting one room or two? Hopefully two connecting rooms on the first floor, if they're available. Quinn shrugged. It's summer, and while Summerfest is over, there are still many other festivals that will bring tourists to the area. We may not have many options. I understand. His comment about Summerfest, a large music festival that took place over ten days each year near the lakefront, caused a memory to flash in her mind. She was dancing in the aisle, listening to music from a band called The Love Monkeys, laughing up at Quinn. We went to Summerfest, she peered at him in the darkness. To see The Love Monkeys? Yes, Quinn twisted around so he was facing her. Excitement brightened his gaze. You remember that? I remember dancing with you, she admitted. You had a great time that night. Quinn's smile widened. You didn't often let your guard down, Sammy, but we spent that night dancing and singing to our favorites. Singing? She wrinkled her nose. That's hard to believe. I didn't say we were talented, just that we sang and danced. Quinn grinned. It's not like we were asked up on stage to join the band or anything. The thought of that made her chuckle. All that matters is that we had fun. We did. The humor in his expression faded. I'm glad you remember some of the good times we had. One good time, she thought with a sigh, but she didn't correct him. Me too. Colin returned, sliding in behind the wheel. Only one room available, but it has two beds and is on the ground floor, he grimaced. Sorry about that. No worries, Quinn assured him. We'll make it work. As long as I can get some sleep, I'll be fine, Sammy added. I would love nothing more than to wake up without a pounding headache. It's still that bad? Quinn's brow furrowed in concern. We should have bought more over-the-counter meds at the gas station. Sleep will help, I'm sure, she forced a smile. I'll be fine. Colin drove to the last room on the first floor. Here's the motel room keys and the keys to the SUV. How are you getting back? Quinn asked. Rideshare, Colin shrugged. I figure you need the rental more than I do. Besides, I picked up an extra shift tomorrow morning. No one will get to me while I'm at the firehouse with the rest of the guys. Thanks, Colin. This means a lot. Quinn reached over to grab his brother's hand, giving it a brotherhood shake. I owe you big time. Where have I heard that before? Oh, wait, was that just earlier today? Hmm. Colin laughed and slid out of the vehicle. Sammy did the same, heading over to stand beside Quinn. Take care of yourself, bro, Colin added. Will do. Quinn took the key and unlocked the door. Sammy cast one last look at Colin, then followed Quinn inside. The closeness between the brothers was heartening. Quinn had mentioned she was an only child, and she wondered if his family was part of her attraction. Not that Quinn alone wasn't handsome enough, because he was. But his interactions with his family, the way they supported each other without question, only added to his incredible personality. Enough. This was hardly the time to think about what her life would have been like if she hadn't left Quinn. Glancing around the room, she was glad to see it was clean and smelled like lemon. Gesturing toward the bed closest to the bathroom, she said, I'll take that one. Sounds good. Quinn seemed to be avoiding her gaze. You can have first dibs in the bathroom, too. Thanks. She didn't linger in using the facilities. Her head ached badly enough that she couldn't wait to stretch out and close her eyes. When she finished, she waved at the door. Your turn. 
Okay. Quinn came toward her, his dark brown eyes full of concern. Get some rest, Sammy. We're safe here. I will. She set her weapon on the nightstand within easy reach. Exhausted, she crawled into the bed with her clothes on, out of modesty and to be ready in case they had to leave quickly. But even though she knew Quinn was right, that they were safe now that she'd gotten rid of the tracker, it took a while for her to relax. She conjured the memory of dancing with Quinn at Summerfest, hoping for more. But the memory of their recent kiss was much clearer in her mind, and she found herself silently praying that when her memory did return, she still cared for Quinn as much as she did right now. Quinn stretched out on the bed closest to the window, listening to Sammy's breathing. He prayed that her memory would return by morning. They couldn't hide out forever. Eventually, he'd be ordered by his commander to return to duty. He needed a plan. Too bad his brain was fried. It seemed they'd spent far too much time running from danger than figuring out who wanted Sammy dead. When he could tell she'd fallen asleep, he sat up and reached for his phone. Tiptoeing past her, he went into the bathroom and closed the door, hoping she wouldn't hear him. He hoped Brady wasn't asleep, but when his brother answered, his tone was groggy. Quinn? What's wrong? Sorry to wake you, but I need some help. He took a few moments to bring his FBI agent brother up to speed on what had transpired over the past 24 hours. I'm wondering if you have contacts within the DEA that you trust. I do. Brady yawned loudly. Or rather, Mark Callahan does. We worked with the DEA a while back, when Taryn was helping Joy solve the case of her brother's murder. Guy by the name of Doug Bridges. Are you sure he's clean? Quinn pressed. I can't afford to trust the wrong guy. I'm sure. Brady sounded more awake now. You really think Sammy is working undercover for the DEA? It's the only thing that makes sense. Yet, I can't say I have any proof of that. Just a guy who called her Angelina. And of course, the nonstop danger. It's thin, Brady agreed. And there's no guarantee that Bridges will be aware of this particular undercover operation. That level of intel is usually only on a need-to-know basis. I have to try. Quinn knew it was probably a dead end, but it was the only plan he could come up with. Can you get me his contact information? And is it okay if I use your name and Mark Callahan's? Yes, you should give both of our names. I'm sure he'll do his best to help you out, Quinn. Hang on a minute. Quinn waited for Brady to pull up the information. Just sent you his direct line via text. His phone vibrated at the incoming message. Great. Thanks, Brady. Appreciate this. Do you need anything else? Brady asked. Money? A car? A gun? Quinn couldn't help but smile. His brothers were always thinking ahead. Got those covered for now, but thanks. Be careful, and I'm not just talking about keeping your head down when the bullets are flying, Brady said somberly. I know Sammy broke your heart when she left. I would hate to see you suffer again once this is over. Their heated kiss rose front and center in his mind. He appreciated his brother's concern, but he was pretty sure Brady's warning was too little, too late. Don't worry about me. Our focus is on staying alive. Yeah, brave words, but I'm not buying it, Brady shot back. I was in your shoes not that long ago, so I know what you're going through. Thankfully, things worked out for me and Grace, but I don't want you to get hurt. I hear you. His situation with Sammy was different from what Brady had with Grace, but he understood what his brother was trying to say. He frowned, hearing a low moan. Had he woken Sammy? He lowered his voice. I'm okay, but I have to go. Thanks again. Without waiting for Brady to respond, he ended the call. Quinn eased the door open, listening intently. He quietly left the bathroom, tiptoeing to his bed. Sammy stirred in her sleep, 
then her breathing settled into an easy rhythm. He considered texting Doug Bridges from the DEA now, but decided to wait until morning. To be fair, he should include Sammy in this plan. She wouldn't like it, having already vetoed the idea of going to the DEA earlier, based on her unwillingness to trust anyone within the agency. Yet, they couldn't go on like this. If more of Sammy's memory returned, then they could work from that intel. They'd have to trust someone within the agency at some point. Better to start with Doug Bridges, an agent recommended by his brother. Removing his gun, wallet, and keys, he stretched out on the bed and closed his eyes. One minute, Quinn was thinking about the conversation he'd have with Bridges. The next, he was waking up to the dim light of dawn shining through the curtains. The clock on the nightstand between the beds indicated it was almost six in the morning. Nearly six hours of sleep felt amazing. He rolled out of bed, moving silently as Sammy was still asleep. He tried to wash up as quietly as possible, but by the time he emerged from the bathroom, freshly showered but still wearing the wrinkled borrowed clothes from Aiden, Sammy was sitting on the side of her bed. How are you feeling? Better, she smiled. My headache is gone, at least for now. That's wonderful, Sammy. I'm so glad. Me too. She stood and edged past him. I wish I could take a shower too, but I don't have those clear bandage things Ellie gave me. They're in the duffel we left in the motel. Sorry about that, but you look beautiful as always. She arched a brow but didn't say anything before ducking into the bathroom. He made two cups of coffee provided by the motel as he waited patiently for her to get ready his fingers itching to make the call, to DEA agent Doug Bridges. Sammy hadn't mentioned remembering anything new, so he decided not to ask. Now that they had Colin's rental SUV, they could head out to grab breakfast, then hopefully meet up with Bridges. He set one cup of coffee on the desk for Sammy, sipping from the other. Moving the curtain aside, he peered out the window to scan the area. It was too early for any of the patrons to be up and about, he didn't see any new vehicles in the parking lot either. Always a good sign. A sense of hope welled within him as to what the day would bring. It felt good to have a plan, even if that was just to make contact with the DEA. Granted, it was possible he was wrong about Sammy working undercover for the agency. One guy calling her Angelina didn't mean her case involved drugs. Still, he couldn't imagine what else she'd be doing, crossing the lake. Drugs were being moved across the country these days by a variety of transportation avenues, and the fentanyl being manufactured first in Mexico and now in other U.S. cities was highly addictive and small enough to transport easily. Quinn? Sammy's voice interrupted his thoughts. I'm ready. Great. He gestured to the coffee. I need to talk to you for a moment. I have a plan. I haven't remembered anything new, sorry to say. She added creamer to the coffee, then sat on the edge of the bed. I know we can't hide out here indefinitely, so I'm all ears. I spoke to my brother Brady last night. Brady works for the FBI, right? Yes. He almost asked if that was from a recent memory or from when he'd listed his siblings. I should have thought of contacting him sooner. He and our second cousin, Mark Callahan, worked with a DEA agent by the name of Doug Bridges a few months ago. Doug Bridges? Sammy's brow furrowed. I don't remember anyone by that name, and I already told you I don't trust anyone within the agency. He drained his cup, set it aside, and came over to sit next to her. I know, but my brother and Mark both worked closely with him, and they believe Bridges is clean. She stared down at her coffee for a long moment. I don't like it. I trust your family, but this Bridges guy could be a dirty agent really good at covering his tracks. Maybe. He hated to admit anything was possible. But we need answers. Driving around to spur your memory isn't an option anymore. I only have three more days of leave before I have to report in for duty. We need to get to the bottom of this. 
She was silent for a long time, then finally nodded. Okay, go ahead and call him. But if you set up a meeting, choose some place public. That works. He was relieved she'd agreed to take this step forward. I'll call him now, then we'll head out to grab breakfast. Okay. She watched nervously as he pulled out his phone. He already had Bridges' contact information up and ready to go, so he didn't hesitate to push the call button. Unfortunately, the call went to the agent's voicemail. Maybe it was too early for Bridges. He tried to keep his message succinct. Agent Bridges, this is Lieutenant Finnegan with the Coast Guard. I was given your name by my brother Brady with the FBI. I understand you worked with our cousin Mark Callahan, too. I need to talk to you about a possible undercover operation taking place in the Great Lakes area. It's rather urgent we speak soon. Please call as soon as possible. Thanks. Well, that's a letdown. Sammy shook her head when he ended the call. I was hoping he'd answer. I'm glad you didn't use either of my names in the message, though. I'm not sure how much to tell him about me and my amnesia up front. He slipped the phone into his pocket. Would you rather I meet with Bridges alone? Keep you out of it completely? Maybe. Her expression turned thoughtful as she sipped the coffee. If you meet with him in a large restaurant, I could take a seat in the back, watch from a safe distance in case things go south. It went against the grain to leave her alone, even on the other side of a restaurant, but he understood her need for caution and nodded in agreement. I'd ask that you call me with the disposable phone if you recognize him. Of course, she shrugged. That may be a good thing or a bad one, depending on what I remember. But I like that plan. I'd rather hang back to see what happens. Great. He rose to his feet and walked back to check the parking lot. There was a family out there now, two adults getting a couple of kids packed up in the back seat. He eyed the clock wondering how long it would be before Bridges got back to him. Brady mentioned giving him the DEA agent's direct line, but did that mean the phone was in an office somewhere? What if the guy didn't go in until later? He sent Brady a quick text, asking for Bridges' cell number. Brady shot it back seconds later. Quinn made a second call, but that one also went to voicemail. He left the same message, then turned back to face Sammy. Ready for breakfast? Sure. She rose to her feet, casting a glance around the room. They hadn't brought much with them and hadn't left anything behind either. She rested her hand on her weapon for a moment, then started for the door. Quinn opened it for her, glancing around before stepping outside. Using the key fob, he unlocked Colin's rental. As they were getting settled, his phone rang. For a moment, he thought it was Bridges, but it was his boss instead. Finnegan? What happened last night? There's a slug embedded in the side of our headquarters. He winced, having forgotten to fill his commander in on the events. He started the engine and carefully backed out of the parking space. Sorry, it's a long story. I'm on the road. Can I call you back? No, you should have called me before now. Calderon shouted in his ear. Swallowing a sigh, Quinn drove down the street a few blocks, then pulled over to the side of the road. He filled his boss in on the gunmen who'd found them and how they'd escaped via boat. He didn't add the part about the tracking device, unwilling to spark another shouting match. It took him several minutes of answering questions before his boss calmed down enough to end the call. As he put the SUV into gear, he noticed a truck coming down the road toward them. He didn't think much of it at first until it slowed and turned into the parking lot of the American Lodge. Quinn? Sammy's voice was a hushed whisper. Get us out of here, right now. He'd already put the SUV into gear and slowly pulled away from the curb. He didn't want to peel away at high speed, fearing that would draw their attention. But they'd barely gone 50 feet when he heard the distinct sound of a door being kicked in. In the rearview mirror, he realized it was the door to the motel room where they'd been less than ten minutes ago. 
Chapter 12 Hurry, she whispered, as Quinn rolled slowly away from the American Lodge. Her heart thudded painfully in her chest at the realization they'd been found in Brookland. Again. I don't want to draw their attention to us. Quinn turned left at the next intersection, then made another quick right. There were lots of cars in the parking lot back there. I don't think they know what we're driving. That fact was only slightly reassuring. Twisting in her seat, she stared out the back window. Pick up the pace. I'll watch for a tail. Understood. He did as she suggested. Obviously, he knew the area better than she did, as it didn't take them long to reach the on-ramp for the interstate. Still, she kept an eye on their tail until she was certain they hadn't been followed. Then, she grabbed Quinn's arm. The only way they could have found us is by tracing the call you made to the DEA. She scowled and added, That agent, Doug Bridges, must be dirty. Hold on, Sammy, we don't know that, Quinn protested. I left two messages, one on his direct line at the agency. Maybe that call was intercepted. And they traced us here that fast? She shook her head vehemently. No way, Quinn. I'm not buying it. He frowned but didn't argue. After several minutes of driving east, heading, she hoped, back to the lakefront, he finally said, I'd still like to meet with Bridges. Have you lost your mind? The incredulous comment popped out of her mouth before she could stop it. That would be feeding intel to the enemy. I understand your position, Sammy, but my brother and my cousin vouched for him. His jaw settled in a stubborn line. We can't just keep running and hiding. We need to do something. He lifted his hand when she opened her mouth to argue. I'll meet with him alone. You can hide out in the back of the restaurant. And if he has other agents with him who surround the building? She strove to keep her voice even. Then what? He nodded. I thought of that. I planned to ask Brady and Mark to help keep an eye on the place. She relaxed into her seat, her mind whirling. That could work. I just don't know if we can trust whatever intel he gives us. True, but I still don't think my brother would have given me his name if he didn't believe him to be one of the good guys. He shrugged. Maybe Bridges will talk more if I mention how we were almost found at the American Lodge. Proves someone within the DEA is dirty. Sammy nodded slowly. He made some good points, and honestly, it was worth a shot. They were running out of options. Her headache was gone, which was a relief, but she hadn't experienced the rush of memories the way she'd hoped. Glancing over at Quinn's handsome profile, she couldn't help but wonder if part of the reason her memory was locked behind a cloud of fog was because of whatever it was that had forced her to walk away from their engagement. He'd said he hadn't cheated, and she believed him. Had she? She couldn't fathom why she would. But then again, what did she know about herself? So far, only what Quinn had told her, and the few brief glimpses of memory. It made her feel sick to think she'd done something so awful, but it was difficult to imagine another scenario. Reminding herself that her relationship with Quinn wasn't a priority, she focused on the upcoming meeting. Bridges hasn't called you back yet. Maybe he's on vacation. It is July, after all. She straightened. Maybe his call was bounced to another agent because he's out of the office. It's possible, Quinn admitted. But it's early. Let's give him a little time. Okay. When Quinn exited the freeway, she frowned. Where are you going? I'd like you to drive. Quinn took the exit and then pulled over onto the shoulder, placing the gear shift into park. I need to talk through this with Brady, and hopefully Mark. Easier for me to do that if I'm not behind the wheel. I can do that. She pushed out of the SUV and rounded the vehicle. Quinn smiled at her as they exchanged seats. After moving the seat up, she merged into traffic. I was thinking we might want to head down to the lakefront. If for no other reason than if this is about drugs, that will be where the action is. That's fine. As soon as I have finished making arrangements, we'll grab breakfast. As if on cue, his stomach rumbled. I could use more coffee, too. Ditto. She headed east, squinting in the bright light of the sun.
When they stopped for breakfast, she planned to find a place to buy sunglasses. They would be a necessity to cut the glare from the water if they headed out in the Malibu again. She hoped they would. Despite her near-death experience on the lake, she enjoyed being on the water, especially with Quinn. And just like that, her thoughts went back to their failed relationship. Get a grip, she silently admonished. As Quinn began explaining their current situation to Brady, she gestured with her hand. Speaker, please? Hang on, Brady, I'm putting you on speaker so Sammy can listen in. A moment later, Quinn said, I left Bridges two messages, one on his personal cell and one on the direct line you gave me. Within 15 minutes, two men showed up at the American Lodge to kick the door in. I don't believe Bridges is dirty. Brady's voice was taut with concern. He's always had a personal stake in the war against drugs. His older brother used heroin and died of an overdose. I find it difficult to think he'd go for easy money to work with the drug runners bringing in fentanyl. Died of an overdose. The words echoed through her mind. A vision of a pretty Hispanic girl lying dead on a slab in the coroner's office flashed in her mind. On the heels of the image came a name. Rita Gomez, her foster sister. Her pulse quickened at the snippet of memory. Had Rita gone to live in California? Maybe. It would make sense that Sammy had decided to work undercover with the DEA after Rita's death. I hear you, Quinn was saying. But we need to take precautions. I need you and Mark to stake out the restaurant to let us know if there's trouble. Sure thing, Brady assured him. I know Mark will help. He was there for me when I needed him to help find Caleb. That was a name she couldn't remember, but she didn't ask for clarification as they were still discussing details. Brady, I'm letting you go to pick up a call from Bridges. I'll be in touch. Quinn quickly switched to the incoming call. Agent Bridges? Lieutenant Finnegan, I must say I'm intrigued by your message. Seeing a family restaurant up ahead, Sammy quickly pulled into the parking lot and put the car in park. Turning in her seat, she met Quinn's gaze. Thanks for returning my call, and please call me Quinn. I understand you know my brother Brady and our cousin Mark Callahan. I do. That's the main reason I'm returning your call. There was a brief silence before Bridges continued. You can call me Doug. We absolutely need to talk, but not over the phone. Better to do that in person. I agree, but I'm concerned about my safety. She appreciated the way Quinn left her out of the conversation, at least for now. I've had more than one gunman come after me, not to mention a bomb hidden beneath my car. I had no idea things had gotten that bad. Bridges audibly sighed, then added, Okay, here's what we'll do. We'll meet in two hours. That way we can both make sure we're not followed upon reaching our destination. I'd like to meet at Welch's Family Restaurant, Quinn said. I know it pretty well. That's in Greenland, right? Fine with me, Doug agreed. Two hours. Thanks. Quinn disconnected from the call and looked over at her. Give me a minute to update Brady, then we'll head inside. She nodded, her stomach tightening at the thought of meeting DEA agent Doug Bridges in two hours. If he was dirty, their meeting could get messy. Yet she had faith in the Finnegan family. She hadn't met any of the Callahans, but it sounded as if they'd been working together for months, so she wasn't about to question Mark's ethics. Quinn quickly finished his call, tucking the phone away. Ready? Let's eat. Once they were seated, provided coffee, and had placed their order, she leaned forward. You know the Welch's family restaurant well? He grinned. Troy Welch is a childhood friend from the neighborhood. He and his wife, Becky, opened the restaurant five years ago. I figure it can't hurt to have another friendly face nearby. She frowned. But he's not a cop, right? I doubt he'll be much help. Not a cop, no, but he knows regular clientele and might be able to identify someone who seems out of place, he grinned. Other than us, of course. Cradling her mug, she eyed him over the rim. 
How much do you plan to tell Bridges? My goal is to make him do most of the talking, he shrugged. I already mentioned the danger, and I may reference you in general terms without giving specifics. The bottom line is that we need to know if there's an undercover operation going on and what it entails. Yes, we do. She sipped her coffee, then asked, What did I tell you about the time I spent in foster care? Not that much, other than you were very close with one of the other foster girls living there. Rita Gomez? She tried to gauge his reaction. That sounds familiar. Then his eyes widened. You remember her? Rita, your foster sister. Yes, I do. She carefully lowered her coffee mug. She's dead, Quinn. I think she may have died of a drug overdose. Listening to your discussion with Brady helped spark the memory of me seeing her dead body in the morgue. He nodded slowly. That makes sense, Sammy. It explains why you agreed to go undercover for the DEA. I think so too, she grimaced. I just wish I could remember more about the op itself. You will. Quinn reached over to take her hand. We're getting closer to the truth, Sammy. I feel it. I hope so. She stared at their joined hands for a moment, praying he was right. If she had something important to do, the sooner she figured out what that was, the sooner they'd be safe. Yet deep down, she hated knowing that once they'd uncovered the truth, her time with Quinn would be over. For good. Quinn watched Sammy closely as they quickly ate breakfast. She'd prayed with him before the meal, her expression heartfelt. He no longer had a single doubt about her amnesia and was thrilled some memories were starting to return. Interesting that she remembered Rita Gomez. Was her foster sibling part of the reason she'd left town two years ago? But why not just tell him she needed some time? There was no reason to break off their engagement, unless her plan all along was to go undercover. He wasn't sure if he should be mad or glad about that possibility, that she would toss their love away to do something so drastic. Then again, what if one of his siblings had died of an overdose? He had no doubt he and the rest of the family would do whatever was necessary to help find those responsible, even moving all the way across the country to take up the war on drugs. He told himself there was no point in ruminating over this, especially since he wasn't sure exactly what had happened. Glancing at his watch, he realized they'd been there for almost 30 minutes. Finish your coffee, he pulled cash from what Rye had given him to pay the tab. We need to get set up at the restaurant. I'm ready, she stood. We need to stop at the drugstore across the street first. Your headache? He hadn't noticed she'd been in pain. No, sunglasses and maybe a baseball hat, she shrugged. Best I can do to help hide my features. The trip didn't take long. With both of them sporting new sunglasses and a pink breast cancer ball cap for Sammy, he took a winding route to the restaurant. He took several evasive maneuvers, just to be sure they weren't followed. Satisfied they were in the clear, he pulled into the parking lot. You jump out and get a table. I'm going to park across the street at the strip mall. Sounds good. She slid out of the passenger seat. I guess this means I'll have to order more food. At least for show, yes. He waited for her to shut the car door, then backed out of the parking lot. Five minutes later, he lightly ran back to the restaurant. He didn't see Brady or Mark, but when his phone buzzed, he glanced at the text message. We have the front and back covered. He smiled and texted back. Thanks. Feeling reassured, he went inside. He caught a glimpse of Sammy in a rear booth, kitty corner from the hostess stand. He approved of her choice. The seat provided her a perfect view of the front door. He asked for a table near the front indicating he had a friend joining him. Sipping more coffee, he pretended to read his phone while subtly scanning the dining room. Troy Welch caught his eye and instantly moved toward him. Quinn stood to greet him. Hi, Troy. Hey, Quinn, it's been a while. The men clasped hands in a quick shake. What brings you to my humble business? Meeting a friend. He glanced around. Nice place. 
Seems like you're doing well. We are, thanks. Troy beamed. It's hard work, though, but we have a nice customer base, which is very helpful. Great. He considered asking his friend if he noticed anything out of the ordinary, but decided that would raise too many questions. You and Becky work hard for this success. We do. Troy clapped him on the back. I need to get back to work, but don't be a stranger. I won't. Quinn shook Troy's hand again, taking a quick glance over at Sammy. She was leaning forward to chat with the kids of a family seated next to her. The animation in her features as she spoke with the kids gave the impression that she knew them personally. Obviously, that wasn't the case, but he was impressed with how easily she blended into her surroundings. He took his seat, satisfied that he'd chosen a good location to meet Doug Bridges. He kept his phone close so he could check for text messages. Brady and Mark would let him know when the DEA agent arrived, especially if he brought company along for the ride. He silently prayed he wasn't making a mistake in trusting Doug Bridges. This meeting had to give them something to go on. If not, he had no idea what they'd do next. Learning that Sammy's foster sister, Rita Gomez, had died of a drug overdose was a start, but it wasn't enough. They needed more. He'd hoped Sammy would have remembered her past by now, especially after their heated kiss, a kiss he wished they could repeat very soon. Don't go there, he silently warned. This wasn't the time or the place. Stay focused on the mission. Ten minutes later, his phone vibrated with an incoming text from Brady. Bridges just drove past the restaurant, heading around the block. No sign of a tail. No surprise, the DEA agent showed up early. Quinn responded. Thanks for the heads up. Keep your eyes peeled for a late arrival. Will do. Quinn shot another glance over his shoulder at Sammy. She must have sensed his gaze because she looked over at him. He gave a small nod, silently telling her it was almost go time, then turned his attention to the main doorway. The seconds dragged by to a full five minutes before a tall man with dark hair entered the restaurant. He was dressed casually in a black t-shirt and jeans, but the way he held himself reminded Quinn of his brother Brady and Mark Callahan. No doubt in his mind he was a DEA agent. The newcomer swept his gaze over the room, settling on Quinn. He smiled at the hostess and gestured toward his table before heading over. I recognize a Finnegan when I see one, Doug said by way of greeting. He held out his hand. Quinn rose to his feet and took it. I figured you'd show up early too. As you did, Quinn said with a wry smile. They both dropped into seats across from each other. Quinn's expression sobered, and he lifted his coffee cup. I appreciate you taking the time to meet with me. Doug narrowed his gaze. Yeah, well, I didn't have much of a choice, now did I? I'd like to know how you learned about our secret undercover op. I'd like to understand why you're running a secret undercover op in the Great Lakes without including the Coast Guard. Quinn countered. Doug sighed, but didn't respond as their server brought him some coffee. Once they were alone, Doug leaned forward, propping his elbows on the table. Fair question. The truth is that we suspect someone is leaking intel, so when we set up this particular operation, we decided to keep the information circle very small. This op was deemed to be on a need-to-know basis and the Coast Guard did not need to be included. At least, not yet. Quinn digested that bit of information. How do you know there's a leak? One of our ops went sideways at the last minute, Doug admitted. We lost one agent and two civilians. The news was troubling. What was Sammy thinking when she decided to sign up for this? Unless her boss hadn't provided a full briefing on the previous failed op, who else knows about the op? Now Doug frowned. I answered your questions, Quinn. It's time for you to answer one of mine. How did you hear about our undercover operation? For all I know, you're working with the leak. Quinn had already thought through how much he'd tell him. He kept his gaze on Bridges, ignoring Sammy behind him so as not to draw unwanted attention. 
I was working two nights ago when we received a call from a deep fishing crew about a boat explosion, the location being way out in the center of the lake during an incoming storm. We towed the vessel to shore, only to discover the wires to the radio were cut. He drilled Doug with a hard gaze. The explosion was no accident. The agent winced. That's not good. No, it's not. I assume this is about drugs, or the DEA wouldn't be in the middle of things. How many people know about this op? Quinn asked again. Obviously something went wrong. Doug paused for a long moment, likely debating how much to reveal. It felt a bit like a game of cat and mouse, which honestly wasn't Quinn's forte. From what he'd seen of Sammy mingling with the family beside her, this was her area of expertise. Only three of us, Doug finally admitted. Me, my boss, Hugh Morey, and our DEA liaison in the L.A. office, a guy by the name of Jay Mendez. He filed the names away, hoping Sammy would recognize one of them. Although she hadn't recognized Bridge's name, which seemed odd, since she was clearly working here in the Great Lakes region. Who does your undercover officer report to? Mendez. Doug stared at him for a long moment. There are a total of two officers working undercover, along with a few insiders within the cartel. And what's the cartel running? Fentanyl? Bridges nodded, then scowled. Are you sure you don't know more about the boat explosion? No survivors? Quinn didn't want to give up Sammy's identity yet. He was taught not to lie, but he hoped God would forgive him as he did so now. I'm not aware of any. I assumed the boat occupants were picked up by another vessel. The flash of doubt in Doug's gaze indicated he wasn't buying his story. In the middle of a storm? Hey, I'm not in the loop, remember? Quinn's phone vibrated, his brother's name coming up on the screen. You have company. Two men in a truck parked right next to Bridges' vehicle. Get out of there. Callahan will meet you out back. Quinn surged to his feet, tossing cash on the table to cover their coffee. Two men outside parked their truck next to your vehicle. Doug didn't hesitate. Take the back. I'll head out front. Quinn turned, catching Sammy's gaze. She was already on her feet, smiling at the family as she paid for her tab. She headed toward the restrooms, and Quinn quickly met up with her. Without having to say anything, she followed as they went into the kitchen. His buddy Troy was there, gaping in surprise when he saw them. Quinn, what are you doing back here? Sorry, we have to go. Quinn didn't slow his pace, striding purposefully to the back door. Thankfully, Troy didn't try to stop him. His phone buzzed again with another text. He glanced at it as he headed outside, assaulted by the horrible stench coming from the dumpster where the garbage had baked in the sun. The men split up. One heading your way. Callahan pulled up near the doorway. Quinn grabbed the back door and practically pushed Sammy inside the vehicle before climbing in after her. Go! Callahan hit the gas, just as a man wearing black rounded the corner. When the assailant lifted his hand, revealing a weapon, Quinn pulled Sammy down in the seat. Gun! Callahan aimed the SUV directly at the gunman forcing him to jump to the side to avoid being hit. For what seemed like the umpteenth time, the sound of gunfire reverberated through the air. Chapter 13 Shoving Quinn's arm aside, Sammy lifted her head to see what was happening. Mark took the corner so fast, she feared the SUV would topple over, but his maneuver worked as the gunman missed. Just then, she saw two men fighting in the parking lot, she gasped as one of them was thrown to the ground. Was that Agent Bridges? Mark, stop the car. We need to help him. No need. Bridges has the second gunman under control, Quinn assured her. He frowned. Bridges doesn't look familiar? No. She wished more than anything he did. Where's your brother? Quinn's frown deepened. Probably taking care of the other gunman. Sammy's stomach clenched at the thought of something bad happening to Brady Finnegan. If he was injured, or worse, she'd never forgive herself. 
Mark, please let us out here, Sammy said urgently. We can find our way back to our ride. You're needed to help Brady and Bridges. No can do. Brady gave me strict instructions to get you both to safety. Mark's gaze met hers in the rear view, and she saw the flash of worry. Brady and Doug are both well-trained agents. They can handle this. I insist you let us out, Quinn said, obviously on her side. I can watch over Sammy. Annoyed, she almost pointed out that she was the cop here. But thankfully, Mark pulled over to the side of the road. Fine, go. I'll head back to offer my assistance. Thanks. Quinn pushed out of the car. Sammy quickly followed, slamming the door shut behind her. Mark took off, turning around and driving back to the restaurant. Hearing the sound of police sirens was somewhat reassuring. Quinn's friend and restaurant owner must have called 911 upon hearing the gunfire. She silently prayed no innocent lives had been taken as she followed Quinn down the street. The strip mall parking lot where they'd left Colin's rental SUV was in the opposite direction. She grabbed his arm. Maybe we should split up. The gunmen could have others backing them up. No, we stay together, Quinn argued. Listen to me. That's exactly the problem. They're looking for the two of us together. She scanned their surroundings, feeling certain there would be more gunmen. They must have followed Bridges to the restaurant. We need to split up, see if we can identify any other bad actors, then rendezvous back at the rental. Have you remembered something you're not sharing? Quinn asked. Because splitting up makes no sense to me. No! She was weary of defending herself. But my cop instincts are telling me we need to split up. Before Quinn could argue, she saw a guy wearing a black t-shirt and jeans, exactly like the other gunmen had been wearing. Check our two o'clock, she said in a low voice. And another at ten o'clock, Quinn said grimly. Two gunmen searching for them, just as she'd feared. Time to move. She darted away from Quinn, ducking behind a parked vehicle. Quinn took cover near a tree on the other side of the road. She gave him a quick thumbs up, indicating she'd see him soon then swiftly made her way through the parking lot of a big box store using a variety of cars as shields. When she was close enough to the door, she jutted that way to head inside. Her goal was to draw the gunman along, giving Quinn time to escape his perp. There was no doubt in her mind that drawing the gunman apart was their best chance at survival. Weaving through the store, she kept a casual eye on the doorway, hoping the assailant would follow her. After the way they'd escaped out the back of the restaurant, she was banking on the fact that this guy would want to keep eyes on her. She paused, taking cover near a wide display. Doubt assailed her when the door didn't immediately open. Come on, she silently urged. Play your hand and show yourself. Still no movement of the sliding door. Had she made a wrong move? What if both gunmen had gone after Quinn instead? After a long minute, her patience was rewarded. The door finally slid open, and the gunman stepped inside. His hands were empty now, but even from here, she could see the bulge beneath his t-shirt where his weapon was. His vanity had gotten the better of him. He shouldn't have worn a tight shirt showing off his muscles. She quickly shifted her position, keeping the display between herself and the gunman. Scanning the store, she searched for a customer service rep. When she saw a larger guy working near the phone display, she hurried toward him, her expression full of concern. Excuse me, I need your help. Her gaze clung to his. My ex-husband is following me, and he has a gun. He's back there. Her voice trailed off as she glanced furtively over her shoulder. Dirty blonde hair, black t-shirt. There, do you see him? She scooted over to stand beside him. You can see his gun, she whispered. I see him. Stay here. The guy used his earpiece and mic to alert other sales reps to the threat. Sammy ducked behind the counter, staying out of sight as the large man moved toward the gunman. She was banking on the gunman, not wanting to cause a scene, but still took a moment to send up a silent prayer. Please, Lord, keep everyone in the store safe. 
When the gunman was preoccupied with the sales reps bearing down on him, she left the phone section and made her way through the appliance area toward the exit. No one stopped her as she ducked outside. Despite having evaded the gunman, there was no time to celebrate her accomplishment. Striving to appear casual, she walked around the side of the building to reach the next street. She was heading in the completely opposite direction of the SUV, but that couldn't be helped. It wasn't easy to keep going without knowing how Quinn was doing. He had military training, but that wasn't exactly the same as being a cop, especially since he'd spent the last few years patrolling the Great Lakes, not deployed overseas to fight on the front lines. His training had already saved them numerous times before. Lord Jesus, keep Quinn safe in your care. The prayer helped calm her fears, but she wouldn't be able to relax until she knew for sure he was safe. She hadn't been able to hear his conversation with Bridges. The DEA agent's body language, though, had supported their belief that she was working undercover in an op that had gone wrong. Since she didn't die in the boat explosion, the bad guys were coming after her to finish the job. Sammy continued making her way through stores and even local neighborhoods doubling back several times to make sure she hadn't picked up another tail. She hoped the customer service reps in the store had called the police on the gunman, but they easily could have simply let him go, especially since she hadn't stuck around to press stalking charges against her fake ex-husband. After 15 minutes of evasive walking, she pulled out her cheap, disposable phone and sent Quinn a quick text. You okay? A long minute passed, her anxiety over his safety growing to massive proportions before he replied. Yes, you? Staggering under a wave of relief, she responded. Lost my tail. What about yours? He's taken care of. For a moment, she hesitated, struck by the possibility that the gunman had taken Quinn out and was using his phone to lure her in. She walked over to stand in the alcove of a grocery store carefully considering her response. She needed to prove this was really Quinn. Okay, meet at the boat? The response came back quickly. What? No, the SUV. She relaxed her death-like grip on the phone. Right, just checking to make sure. See you soon. They should have come up with a key phrase that would have ensured they were speaking to each other. Then again, it wasn't as if they'd planned to split up. Quinn must have read her mind, though, or considered the same possibility of someone rendering her unconscious and using her phone to communicate, because another text came through. What do we call the house in Brookland? A smile curved her lips as she typed. The Finnegan Homestead. Glad it's you. Same goes. Sliding her phone into her pocket, she left the grocery store and began walking around the block. Now that they'd eluded their respective tails, they needed to get far away from this area of the city. The sooner they were in the SUV and heading out of town, the better. Sammy continued to double back on occasion, though, along with using the glass windows of the occasional storefronts to check behind her. As she headed toward the street that would take her to the side of the strip mall parking lot, it occurred to her she must have done this a lot during the time she'd been working undercover because she'd performed each of the various maneuvers automatically. Being this close to the rental SUV sent her tension skyrocketing. If there was any possibility their vehicle had been compromised, there could be someone lying in wait for them. Or they may have planted a tracking device. Or worse yet, another bomb. The idea sent a shiver of fear down her spine. She entered one of the strip mall clothing stores taking a moment to rifle through the racks as if searching for something to buy. From here, she couldn't see their SUV, but there were a few other cars parked out front. All of them appeared to be empty. After another few minutes, she went back outside. She pulled her sunglasses out of her pocket, taking a moment to glance around as she slid them on. She didn't see anything out of the ordinary, but she also didn't see any sign of Quinn either. Was he already waiting for her at the SUV? Meandering down the row of stores, she was about to walk between cars toward the SUV when someone stepped out of the candle store. She whirled a second too late. A large man grabbed her arm.
shoving the blunt edge of a gun into her ribs. Keep walking, he said in a guttural tone. Fine with me. She glanced over at her assailant, hoping she'd recognize him. But the face was that of a stranger. A wave of despair hit hard. These guys were going to kill her before she ever discovered who was responsible. Quinn saw Sammy heading toward the SUV. His relief was short-lived, though, because a man stepped out of a store and grabbed her. No! He ducked behind the SUV and grabbed his phone. Brady, I need help tailing Sammy. The bad guys have her. Where? Brady's voice was tense. We have these guys arrested, but they're not talking. I can leave this for Mark to clean up. Give me your 20. I'm in the strip mall across the street. He watched the guy escort Sammy the rest of the way down the sidewalk in front of the stores. Then they disappeared around the corner. He jumped up, ran around to the driver's side door and slid inside. They're taking Sammy around the side of the building. I'm sure they have a vehicle waiting. On my way. Quinn didn't bother to respond. He backed out of the parking spot and drove down toward the side of the building. A large black SUV was pulling away, and he could see the back of Sammy's head in the rear seat next to the thug who'd taken her. He hit the gas, trying to close the gap between them. Heart racing, he wondered how they'd known to stake out the strip mall in the first place. They'd each taken care of their own gunmen, yet there'd been another one lying in wait for Sammy to show up at the SUV. Was Bridges the leak? Maybe this was an elaborate scheme. The DEA agent could have easily told someone else when to head to the restaurant, and he could have also told them to bring plenty of backup. He kicked himself for believing Bridges to be one of the good guys. He never should have agreed to the meeting. Never. The summer traffic made it difficult to keep up, especially as the black SUV sped faster, darting in and around slower vehicles. Quinn copied the gunman's actions. He wrenched the wheel, wedging his car into a narrow gap, earning himself a loud honking in protest from the driver. Quinn, you there? Brady's voice asked from the speaker. I'm following a black Honda SUV. License plate, DRW, I can't see the rest. Talking while trying to get caught up to the vehicle wasn't easy. His gut churned at the thought of losing Sammy. Run the partial plate, see if you can identify the driver and get us some backup. Working on it. Keep the line open. I'll put you on hold for a minute. Hurry. The SUV abruptly turned and headed toward the interstate. He followed, earning more honks of anger as he ran a red light. Once he hit freeway speeds, he frantically searched for the SUV. There were so many black cars. Too many. Brady, he shouted. I've lost them. There's no black SUV with those letters as a plate number. The plate must be stolen. Brady's voice was as tense as he felt. Where are you now? Interstate 94, heading east to the lakefront. Was that the destination of the black SUV? He imagined the gunmen taking Sammy out on the water to finish what they started. Unless that was what the gunmen wanted him to believe. For all he knew, they'd already taken one of the next exits. Please, Lord Jesus, keep Sammy safe in your care. The prayer did not ease his concerns. The only reason Sammy had gotten caught in the first place was because he'd set up a meeting with Doug Bridges. A black vehicle moved from the center lane over to the right lane. Quinn punched the gas to catch up, desperate to see the license plate. Yes, the first three letters were B-R-W. He frowned, realizing he'd read the first letter wrong. Brady, the first letter is Bravo. Bravo Ranger Wayne. Okay, checking. Bridges was dirty, Quinn said, keeping pace now with the SUV. He didn't dare to do anything that would cause the vehicle to crash, injuring Sammy. I don't think so. Bridges was shot by one of the gunmen, Brady said. He was taken to Trinity Medical Center. Then how were we found? Quinn demanded. The SUV abruptly sped up and switched lanes, going all the way to the left. This guy knows I'm on his tail and is doing his best to lose me. Where's the rest of our backup? 
I've called Rye to get his guys on scene, but as they're on the move, it's not going to be easy to coordinate a takedown. We need the Coast Guard chopper, Quinn muttered. The SUV abruptly exited the freeway. Quinn quickly followed. The phone was tucked in the cup holder, so he grabbed it with one hand and quickly used his thumb to type in his commander's phone number. Since he was using a disposable phone, his boss didn't recognize the number and didn't pick up. This is Finnegan. Two gunmen have kidnapped Sammy Lopez. I'm following a black SUV with the first three letters of the license plate as BRW. Call me. The SUV had a head start, but based on the way they were driving directly east, there was no doubt in Quinn's mind their ultimate destination was the lakefront. If he wasn't careful, they'd have Sammy tossed into a boat and taken out on the water before he could stop them. He took the same exit, scanning the vehicles for the SUV. No, was he already too late? Then he saw it, heading past the bus depot that wasn't far from the Summerfest grounds. Did they have a boat there waiting for them? There were many smaller docks where tour boats were stationed during the summer months. He frantically tried to consider which one they'd use to get a hostage out, but there were too many options. For what seemed like the tenth time, he lost sight of the black SUV. Swerving around cars, he sped through red lights without caring about being pulled over. The more cops following him now, the better. The sun glinted off a car window as the SUV abruptly turned right, cementing Quinn's belief they were heading for a boat. When his phone rang, he pounced on it. Finnegan. Lieutenant Commander Calderon. His boss's voice sounded concerned. What's this about a kidnapping? I set up a meeting with DEA agent Doug Bridges, and we were burned. Get the chopper in the air. I need to have eyes in the sky. Okay, I'll get the bird up. Where are you? I'm following the SUV through the third ward, but I lost them again. He tightened his grip on the wheel. There were so many side streets in this area of the city that the SUV holding Sammy could be anywhere. He turned to ride along the lakeshore, scanning for boats. I know they're taking her out on the water. It's the best way to evade us. What's the ETA on the chopper? Ten minutes. Maybe less. Bring it to this area. I want to be picked up. There was no way he was letting that chopper head out without him. If Sammy was out there, he intended to be with her the entire way. That's not happening, his boss said curtly. Please, sir. Quinn didn't bother to hide his acute desperation. I'm your lead officer and the most experienced in performing helicopter rescues. There was a brief pause as his boss considered his statement. Quinn wasn't looking for praise. He was only stating the facts, and his boss knew it. Fine. I'll be in touch. Quinn quickly called Brady. I'm downtown in the third ward. I lost them, but the Coast Guard chopper is heading this way. Rise guys are trying to find this SUV too, Brady said. I still think the plates are stolen because there's nothing coming up on a black Honda with those three letters. He swallowed hard, hating the way these guys had covered their bases. They'd had at least six bad guys out near the restaurant. No wonder they'd gotten to Sammy. Quinn saw a black boat heading away from shore. He wrenched the wheel toward the side of the road, nearly causing the guy in the car behind him to rear-end him. Without hesitation, he pushed open the door and leaped out, running across the street toward the lakeshore. He saw at least three people in the boat, two larger men and one smaller person. When the smaller person turned to look back, he saw Sammy's unsmiling face. He was too far away to read the boat registration numbers. He called his commander again. I see three people in a boat leaving one of the tour boat piers. It's a black and silver speedboat. Unknown registration. Destination? Commander Calderon asked. I don't think they have one. They're heading due east to the center of the lake. It was all Quinn could do not to scream in frustration. Raking his gaze over the immediate area, he searched for anyone on a similar size boat that he could take possession of, but there was nothing nearby. Where's the chopper? En route. You should hear the bird soon. He didn't want to take his gaze off the boat that was growing smaller in the distance. 
but when he heard the faint thump-thump of a helicopter, he could have wept in relief. I see it. Who's the pilot? Simon Porter. He knows to make a quick pit stop to pick you up. Who else is on board? He had to shout now to be heard over the noise. Ensign Jimmy DuPont. Quinn winced. Jimmy and Cal were both green as grass as the newest members of their team. No wonder his boss had given them the okay to pick him up. Thanks, they're almost here. Bring her back, Commander Calderon said. That's the plan. Quinn slid the phone into his pocket and impatiently waited for the bird. Scanning the area, he found a pier, maybe even the one the gunman had used to moor the boat, far enough away from any tall buildings. Then he stood and waved his arms over his head to signal the crew. The chopper banked toward him, dropping to hover roughly a hundred feet above where Quinn stood. He waited as they lowered the cable and harness. Once they were within reach, he quickly fastened the harness tightly around his torso, then gave the signal to bring him up. The winds picked up a bit, causing him to sway on the end of the cable. After all these years, he was accustomed to helicopter rescues, so the height and the wind didn't bother him but the wind could wreak some havoc when it came to rescuing Sammy. Don't think about that now, he silently cautioned, one step at a time. It seemed to take forever for the crew to bring him in. Finally, his progress slowed to the point he looked upward. Ensign DuPont leaned out of the chopper opening, offering a hand. Quinn grabbed it, then reached for the edge of the chopper. With the ease of practice, he pulled himself up and into the bird. He plunked a helmet over his head so he could communicate to the pilot. Go! Due east! Roger that, Porter responded. The bird rose in the air, then banked in order to head east. A moment later, they were flying fast over the bright blue water. We're looking for a hostage on a black and silver speedboat. Quinn peered out over the water as he spoke. The helmets were worn for safety, but they also had internal communication systems built in. Lots of boats down there, Porter said. Won't be easy to spot it. I'll find it. Quinn had the image of the boat imprinted on his mind. How much time had he lost getting into the chopper? There was no time to second guess his decision now. The helicopter could go much faster than a speedboat. If they knew where to look. Bring her down a bit, Quinn said. Just as Porter did so, he saw it. There. I see it. The vessel was still pretty far in the distance. Roger that. I see her. Porter's tone was unflappable. What's the plan, Lieutenant? Good question. Quinn needed to figure out how to take the gunmen out before they killed Sammy and dropped her overboard. Chapter 14 Her undercover DEA partner, Jeb Hale, had purposefully blown her cover. The moment Sammy had seen Jeb on the boat, memories came tumbling back. She and Jeb were both recruited to work together in this undercover operation to find the source of the fentanyl traffic coming in through the Great Lakes region. Jeb had been her friend, and she'd confided in him about her broken engagement with Quinn and her concern over Rita's death. She'd trusted him, and had been excited when she'd told Jeb about the guy she believed to be in charge of the drug trafficking operation. That's when everything began to unravel. Two cartel thugs had tried to kill her, one of them calling her a punta cop. In that moment, she'd realized the truth. Jeb had ratted her out to the cartel bad guys, completely blowing her cover. By some miracle, she'd managed to escape the two thugs who'd come after her using Emilio's boat to get away. Unfortunately, she was halfway across the lake when she'd realized Jeb had sabotaged the radio and set a bomb in the boat's engine. If she hadn't jumped into the water when she had, she'd already be dead. Now, Jeb's plan was to finish the job, to shoot her and dump her body in the middle of the lake. She scanned the area, but there were no other boats to be seen this far from shore a fact that would work in Jeb's favor. She'd mentally kicked herself for getting caught so easily. Quinn had been right. They should have stuck together. 
Her stupid plan to separate had landed her in this situation, and now she would pay the ultimate price. The assailant who'd grabbed her outside the strip mall had confiscated her weapon, but had not bound her hands. A small thing, especially as she was forced to grip the side of the boat to avoid being tossed overboard as they flew across the water. But something to be grateful for. Even so, Sammy knew her options were limited. Both the big guy who'd grabbed her and Jeb were armed and extremely dangerous. She might be a cop, but her strength was no match against these two men. Worse, the sense of urgency she'd experienced over the past few days had been to warn her inside source, Emilio Vasquez, of the danger. Emilio was the Hispanic man who'd called her Angelina, and she felt sick to her stomach at the thought that Jeb had already silenced Emilio. Permanently. Killing her and Emilio was obviously Jeb's way of tying up the loose ends. With them gone, he'd set her up as the leak while continuing to keep his criminal activities a secret. If she couldn't find a way to stop him, his personal portfolio would grow even larger than it already was with the cash he was taking in from the Robles drug cartel. No, she couldn't let that happen. Not when the Robles cartel had killed Rita. Now she remembered that her foster sister hadn't died of an overdose of fentanyl, the way she'd thought, but had been murdered. Rita had worked for the Robles cartel, but had escaped the drug life. She'd married a nice guy and had a son named Mateo. Robles didn't let people quit the cartel, though, so he'd made it a point to find her foster sister, brutally shooting Rita, her husband, and their two-year-old son, execution style. The entire family was gone in the blink of an eye, and when Sammy had learned her foster sister had died at the hands of the Robles cartel, She'd vowed to do something about it, even if that meant giving up her future with Quinn, the man she loved and promised to marry. Drawing in a deep breath, she struggled to remain calm and to stay focused on her precarious situation. This was no time to traipse down memory lane. There had to be a way to bring Jeb Hale to justice. There just had to be. Did you kill Emilio? She shouted over the roar of the boat engine. Jeb was driving, while the big guy kept his weapon trained on her. What do you care? Jeb shot back over his shoulder. You're not going to live past the next ten minutes. The threat sent a cold chill down her spine. She lifted her gaze to the cloudless sky, so different from the night she'd escaped via Emilio's boat and sought solace in prayer. Lord Jesus, please grant me the strength to escape. She wasn't worried about dying. She knew she would be home with her lord. But it burned to know Jeb might escape. What she wanted more than anything was to take Jeb the traitor down with her. But how? The wind rushing past, blowing her hair into her face, didn't provide an answer. I'm sorry, Quinn. I never meant to hurt you. If only she'd remembered everything sooner. She could have explained to Quinn why she'd left the way she had, her choice had seemed noble at the time, but now she feared it was all for naught. She'd hurt Quinn and his family, especially Ellie, and had nothing to show for it. Nothing. The wave of despair was overwhelming. Keeping a wary eye on the big guy with the gun trained on her, she gauged the best time to make her move. Howling wind grew louder until she realized the roaring sound in the distance wasn't the wind. It was a helicopter. The Coast Guard? It had to be. Who else would be flying this far out over the water? Sammy swallowed a groan, knowing Quinn would risk his life to save her. In that moment, she knew what she needed to do. The big guy holding his weapon on her must have heard the chopper too. When he looked up toward the sky, she pivoted and pushed herself off the boat and into the water, silently praying she'd avoid the rotating blades of the Mercury Marine motor. The cold water closed over her head, stealing her breath. With a sense of deja vu, she kicked off her shoes and swam underwater for several yards before she struggled to reach the surface. Her head broke through the water, but waves crashed over her, making her cough and gag. Sammy wasn't wearing a life jacket this time. It wasn't easy to tread water while fighting to keep her head above the choppy waves. 
the boat with Jeb and the big guy had kept moving across the lake, thanks to the fact they had been traveling at a high speed. But watching it now, she noticed the vessel was slowing and turning in a wide arc. He was coming back for her. On the heels of that thought came a crack of gunfire. Sammy gasped in horror as the water sprayed up just two feet from her. Drawing in a deep breath, she went below the surface and swam beneath the water, desperate to put distance between them. There was no way she could outswim a speedboat, and she would have to come up for air soon, giving the big guy another target to shoot at. Sammy used her arms and legs to propel herself through the water until her lungs burned. With one last thrusting kick, she broke the surface, gulping for air. Crack, crack. More gunfire had her ducking back beneath the water. How much longer could she hang on? The cold temperature of the water was already sapping her strength. Gritting her teeth, Sammy pushed on, staying below the surface as much as possible. While on the boat, she'd thought the wind was coming in from the east flowing west, providing a current that would assist in pushing her toward shore. Or so she hoped. The thought of drowning out here in the middle of Lake Michigan was only slightly better than being shot to death. Please, Lord, give me strength. Quinn had been shocked when he saw Sammy go over the side of the boat, disappearing into the blue depths of the water. Shortly thereafter, the big guy on the boat had used both his hands to steady his weapon as he fired at her in the water. Without hesitation, Quinn had tightened the harness and had secured himself to the cable. Ensign Jimmy looked pale as he offered his assistance. I need to get her out of there. He still wore his helmet and was connected to the communications system, but with the wind whipping beneath the thundering blades, it was still difficult to hear. Lower me down to the water. They're shooting at her, Ensign Jimmy shouted back. They'll use you for target practice. Quinn couldn't dispute the junior officer's words, but he wasn't leaving Sammy out there a minute longer. She might be a strong swimmer, but the cold water would soon induce hypothermia, and if that happened, she'd stop swimming and drown. He met Jimmy's gaze. As soon as I'm off the chopper, use the M16 to fire back at them. Take out their boat engine first. Jimmy's eyes widened at the order, but he nodded. Roger that. Quinn would have rather been the one to take out the black and silver speedboat, but rescuing Sammy was more important. He gave Jimmy the thumbs up to be lowered toward the water. Jimmy began Quinn's descent toward the water as their pilot, Simon Porter, held the chopper steady in the eastern wind. Once Quinn was halfway down, he heard gunfire. An eerie calm settled over him. Sweeping his gaze over the water below, he ignored the flying bullets to search for Sammy. Her dark head bobbed between the waves for less than a minute before disappearing beneath the surface again. His gut tightened with fear as he gave the hand signal for Jimmy to drop him farther down. More gunfire echoed, but he thought this time the source was Jimmy doing his best to take out the boat engine while lowering him to the water. The sound of a boat engine confirmed Jimmy hadn't accomplished that mission, but Quinn did his best to ignore that tiny problem. Getting Sammy up and out of the water was his primary concern. Then again, he didn't relish the idea of the gunmen on the boat firing at them as they were dangling in the air while being lifted back up into the chopper. One step at a time. The next time he saw Sammy's dark head popping up on the surface, he shouted, Sammy! Her head tipped back to look up, likely because of the sound of the helicopter rather than his feeble attempt to call out to her over the sound of whirling blades. She lifted a hand, acknowledging him, but then vanished beneath the waves. He tried to estimate the amount of time she'd been in the lake. Long enough for hypothermia to set in? Could be all too soon, since Sammy didn't weigh much, her lean figure devoid of excess body fat. Jimmy continued lowering him until he hit the water. Sammy was still out of reach, though, so he signaled Jimmy to keep going. Once he was in the water up to his hips, he shouted again, Sammy, swim this way! Her pale face turned toward him, and she did her best to follow his command, but her arm strength seemed weak, barely propelling her through the water. Come on, swim! He tried not to sound as desperate as he felt. 
He was about to signal for Jimmy to lower him even farther when more gunfire rang out. Quinn set his jaw as he waited for the gunfire to stop. Then he signaled to be lowered again. If Sammy couldn't swim to him, he'd find a way to get to her. At least he was wearing a life jacket with his harness. When the wind kicked up, though, he knew his plan wouldn't be easy to execute. Lord Jesus, we need your strength and guidance now more than ever. Once Quinn was fully submerged in the water, with some slack in the cable still attached to his harness, he kicked his legs to reach Sammy. When she saw him coming closer, a look of relief flashed in her eyes. Then the current pulled her under again. Sammy! Quinn's shout was barely audible even to his own ears. He pushed himself toward her, reaching the area where she'd gone under. Where was she? A hand grabbed his harness, and he instantly reached down to pull Sammy up and out of the water. He held her up against him, keeping her head higher than the waves. She coughed and coughed, then threw up a bit of lake water before resting against him. You okay? he asked. She didn't answer, but managed a brief nod. Thankfully, Sammy was trained in water rescue techniques, so she didn't try to fight him. He turned her body so that her back was up against his chest. Once he'd secured a strap around her waist, he held on with one hand and used the other to give the signal to be lifted up to the chopper. Hurry, he silently urged Jimmy as the slack in the cable slowly tightened up. Get us out of here. Inch by precious inch, he and Sammy were pulled from the choppy water. Sammy was so lax in his arms, he feared she'd lost consciousness again. He didn't dare loosen his hold as he glanced up to where Jimmy was standing in the open doorway of the Coast Guard chopper. He silently begged the junior officer to pick up the pace. Soon, they were completely out of the water, dangling in the wind. The easterly wind was relatively warm, but with Sammy's drenched clothes and chilled skin, he knew hypothermia was still a threat. As they rose higher in the sky, Quinn quickly searched for the black and silver boat, but didn't see it. Was the vessel behind him? He craned his neck, but he still couldn't see it. He mentally braced for the sound of gunfire, expecting to be hit with a bullet at any moment. After what seemed like an eternity, the sound of the chopper blades grew louder. Close. They were so close. Glancing up, he saw Jimmy leaning over to help bring Sammy up into the bird. Quinn forced himself to let her go once the young officer had tucked both his hands beneath her armpits, lifting her easily inside. Thank you, God. Less than a minute later, Quinn was in the chopper too. He unlatched the cable from his harness, then hovered over Sammy. She lay stretched out on the floor, her eyes closed. He felt for a pulse, grateful to feel a rapid, if thready, beat beneath his fingertips. Then he made sure she was breathing. Get the foil blanket! Jimmy turned and tossed one toward him. Quinn caught it, then carefully wrapped the warming blanket around Sammy. Where's the boat? he asked as he gathered Sammy halfway into his lap. He was determined to use his own body as a heat source for her. He hadn't been in the water long enough to lose body heat the way Sammy had been. It's gone, sir. Jimmy grimaced as he met Quinn's gaze. I wasn't able to take out their boat engine. There was no sense in getting upset over the failed mission. Simon, I need you to turn around to find that vessel. After a moment's hesitation, the pilot responded. Yes, sir. Sammy stirred in his arms, shivering during the warming process. Her mouth moved, but the noise level was too high for him to hear her. He glanced at Jimmy, who seemed to understand what he wanted, and reached for a helmet. He lifted Sammy into a sitting position to get the helmet settled over her head. Then he pressed the all-calm switch so she could communicate. Sammy, can you hear me? Yes. Her voice was weak but audible. Where's Jeb? Who? He wondered if she was confused. My dirty partner, the guy driving the boat. I don't know the name of the big gunman who grabbed me outside the strip mall. Now it was Quinn's turn to be confused. You remember Jeb and that he's dirty? Yes. Her voice grew stronger. We can't let him get away. 
He killed Emilio, my contact in Shady Lane. The guy who'd owned the boat she'd been driving the night the engine had exploded. Quinn gently shifted Sammy so she was propped up against the side of the chopper. Okay, Jimmy, Simon, you heard the lady. We need to find that boat ASAP. In answer, Simon banked the chopper in a wide curve to head back in the opposite direction. Quinn hoped they hadn't lost too much time. Jimmy, watch for the vessel. Sammy, what do you remember about the undercover operation? It's a long story, Sammy said. I'll fill you in on the details later. The biggest concern is to find and arrest the guy driving the boat. His name is Jeb Hale, and he was my undercover partner. I didn't realize he was dirty until he blew my cover with the cartel. When they failed to get to me, he sabotaged my boat to finish the job. Jeb Hale wasn't one of the men Bridges had mentioned by name. Then again, Bridges did mention there were other agents and insiders working the case too. This is all related to fentanyl? Yes. Sammy's gaze clung to his. I confided to Jeb about our engagement, so he knew about you. And worse, Jeb killed Emilio Vasquez. He was my contact in Shady Lane. Her voice hitched a bit. The man I couldn't remember. An image of the Hispanic guy who'd called her Angelina flashed in his mind. The same guy who'd owned the boat. No wonder he hadn't opened fire on them when they'd driven off in the Malibu. Quinn felt terrible they hadn't spoken to him at the time, but there was nothing he could do about that now. He didn't like hearing any of this, especially being left out of an undercover operation taking place within Coast Guard jurisdiction. That should never have happened, and the fact that Sammy barely escaped with her life multiple times only reinforced the devastating results of not following normal protocol. Never again, Quinn battled a wave of fury. He didn't care if Bridges was one of the good guys. He'd rake him and his boss over the coals for this fiasco. Then he took a deep breath to shake it off. There was nothing he could do now but stay focused on finding this dirty cop and his gunman partner. Please, Quinn, we must stop Jeb. We can't let him get away with this. Sammy's low voice reverberated with agonizing despair. We won't. He rose and went over to peer through the chopper window. They were headed in the same general direction the boat had taken earlier, but Jeb could be anywhere by now. He could have turned to head north or south rather than going due east. Quinn pulled out a pair of binoculars and began to carefully scan the water for any sign of a wake, indicating a vessel was up ahead. Thankfully, Porter was doing his part pushing the bird so the chopper ate up the nautical miles. Where are you, Jeb? Quinn muttered to himself as he carefully moved the binocs from one area of the lake to another. No way you could have reached the safety of shore yet. One good thing about Michigan was that there weren't any islands out in the middle of the open water. There were a couple near the Door County Peninsula, but nothing here for Jeb and his buddy to use to hide out for a while. Lieutenant Finnegan? Jimmy's voice crackled through his helmet. Check 20 degrees southwest. Do you see it? Quinn carefully moved his glasses in that direction. The faintest sign of a wake rippled in the water. I do. Good eye, Jimmy. Porter, take us 20 degrees to the southwest and keep your current speed. Target is up ahead. Roger that. Porter banked the chopper as requested. After two minutes of flying, the wake in the water grew wider and more visible. Using the binocs, Quinn followed the wide tail of the wake until he had a good visual on the boat. It was the silver and black vessel. Got him in sight, Quinn said. Stay true, Porter. We're gaining on him. What if he shoots at the helicopter? Sammy's voice came through his helmet. His handgun isn't a threat, as long as we keep out of range. Quinn took his eyes off the binocs to glance over at Jimmy. I'll need the M16 locked and loaded. Yes, sir. Jimmy quickly set his binocs aside to ready the assault weapon. Quinn brought the binoculars back up to keep an eye on his target. They were slowly gaining on the boat now, and with the magnified lenses of the binocs, he watched as the man at the wheel glanced over his shoulder to stare at the oncoming chopper. Got you now. Jeb the traitor, Quinn whispered. 
Jimmy, where's the M16? Here, sir. Jimmy handed the assault weapon over. Quinn took the gun, then slid the side door open so he'd have clear access. The M16 had a scope, so he didn't need the binocs to find his target. Both men were still in the boat. Jeb had the wheel, while the other guy lifted his gun and fired off several shots. Quinn moved the weapon so the crosshairs were dead center over the boat's engine. Between the wind and the rotation of the chopper blades overhead, it wasn't easy to keep the gun steady. No wonder Jimmy had missed. He followed the boat for several heartbeats until the usual sense of calm washed over him. Relaxed, he pulled the trigger twice. Instantly, the boat engine sputtered and lost power, a thin black trail of smoke rising from the rear of the boat. Target has been hit. Pull it back, Porter. We don't want to overshoot the target. But don't get any lower either. They're still armed down there. Roger. The chopper's speed slowed while Porter maintained their altitude. Quinn watched both men through the scope. The big guy was still firing at them without striking the bird. Jeb abruptly turned and shoved the big gunman, knocking him off balance. The guy stumbled, then Jeb abruptly pushed him over the edge of the boat and into the water. Quinn inwardly sighed. He did not relish going down on a cable to rescue these guys, if they still had their handguns. Man overboard, he said, for the benefit of the others. Jeb? Sammy asked. Negative. As soon as he'd said the word, Jeb jumped up on the captain's chair and dove over the other side of the boat. Cancel that. Second man is overboard too. What's the point? Jimmy asked. Quinn took a long look at the big guy first, noticing how his arms flailed in the water. No sign that he'd managed to hang on to his weapon. Then he turned his attention to Jeb. He was doing his best to swim while still holding on to his gun. Don't go down, Quinn, Sammy warned. I believe Jeb will try to kill us all if we get too close. He knew she was right, but his job was to rescue those who had gone overboard. The big guy was clearly struggling, but Jeb wasn't. At least, not yet. Jimmy, get my harness connected to the cable ASAP, he ordered. Porter, take the bird down. Jimmy's eyes widened as he glanced helplessly toward Sammy, then back at Gwyn. Ah, uh, sir? Are you sure? You heard me. Quinn didn't like it, but he didn't have much of a choice. He was going down to rescue them. Chapter 15 Wait! Sammy grabbed Quinn's arm. Let's think this through. She understood he couldn't just ignore a drowning man, but she didn't trust Jeb not to shoot him. Handguns could be inaccurate if used while drenched in water, but if Quinn was close enough, she could easily imagine Jeb taking him out. I have to go down, Quinn repeated stubbornly. The big guy isn't going to last much longer. I know that. She glanced at the M16. Shaking off the foil blanket, she went over to grab it. Let me be your backup. I'll use the rifle to keep an eye on Jeb. Jimmy can man the cable. Fine. Quinn gave a curt nod as Jimmy finished fastening the harness to the cable. Ready to go? Yes, sir. Jimmy waved toward the open door. Sammy swallowed hard as Quinn eased out the opening as Jimmy lowered the cable. For a moment, their gazes met and held. She wanted to shout, I love you, but Quinn had already disappeared over the edge. Silently, Sammy prayed for Quinn's safety, even as she scooted forward with the rifle. She was no novice at using weapons, even an M16 but sitting in the opening in the chopper was unnerving. She took a deep breath and did her best to ignore her fear of falling. Jimmy glanced at her, as if worried she wouldn't be able to hold up her end of the bargain. After flashing the young officer a reassuring smile, she lifted the M16 to her shoulder and peered through the scope. It took a minute for her to find Jeb bobbing in the waves. Her trader partner still had his gun in his hand while trying to tread water. Stupid, really, because killing them wouldn't help much. The boat was still useless and stranded in the middle of the lake without a shoreline in sight. Although if the radio was working, 
Jeb could call for his cartel buddies to pick him up. It occurred to her that Jeb had gone overboard just to force Quinn to rescue them. The roar of the chopper engine and rotor blades made it impossible for her to demand Jeb to drop his weapon. The image of Emilio flashed in her mind. A man who tried to do the right thing had died because of Jeb's greed. Strengthening her resolve, she kept her former partner in the crosshairs. If he so much as turned that gun toward Quinn, she'd shoot. She'd never been forced to kill a perp in the line of duty. Personally, she'd rather Jeb spend the rest of his pathetic life in jail, but she would do whatever was necessary to keep Quinn safe. Keeping an eye on Jeb, she leaned against the side of the chopper to help hold the rifle steady. Being in the water for so long had sapped her strength. The M16 already felt heavy in her arms. Please, Lord, give me strength. The seconds passed with agonizing slowness. She had no idea how close Quinn was to being in the water, but she didn't dare take her gaze off Jeb to ask. Moments later, she had her answer. Jeb turned in the water, tipping his head back to look upward. Maybe he hadn't heard Quinn right away because the chopper itself was so loud. Through the scope, she had a clear view of Jeb's face twisting into a flash of rage. He lifted his handgun from the water and pointed it toward the sky. Toward Quinn. She pulled the trigger, the kick of the M16 making her wince. The movement had caused her to lose sight of Jeb. Ignoring the tight muscles in her arms, she quickly moved the scope back to the previous spot that she'd seen Jeb. Only he wasn't there. All she saw was water. Her heart thudded painfully against her ribs. Had she missed? Maybe he'd ducked beneath the surface in time to avoid being hit. Praying she hadn't miscalculated, she slowly tweaked and shifted the tip of the rifle to scan the surrounding area. There. She focused on the dark blob for a moment until she could see that the body was Jeb, floating face down in the water. She hadn't miscalculated or missed. A flash of guilt hit hard, but she shoved it away. Her former partner had made his choice. He'd chosen greed over honor. Easy money over the sanctity of life. Not only had he killed Emilio, he'd attempted to kill her and Quinn multiple times, without caring about the loss of other innocent lives. Still, she wished it hadn't come to this. Hold her steady. We're bringing them up. Jimmy's voice echoed through the helmet. Sammy continued to watch Jeb, half expecting him to surge out of the water and start shooting like the bad guy in a low-budget slasher movie. But he didn't. When her arms couldn't hold the rifle for another second, she dropped the weapon and carefully set it aside. Then she knelt down to help Jimmy pull Quinn and Jeb's accomplice up and into the helicopter. Once they were inside, she picked the rifle up again and moved back, keeping an eye on the guy who'd abducted her from the strip mall parking lot. Jimmy took a minute to secure the big man's wrists behind his back with zip ties. I need to go back down for Jeb, Quinn said when that was finished. I shot him, Sammy said. He's dead. I know. Quinn's gaze held hers again, and the compassion clearly reflected in her eyes. But I need to get him out of the water. I understand. She wanted to throw herself into Quinn's arms. Porter, take her a half mile east. Quinn told the pilot, Jimmy, get ready with the cable. Yes, sir. Jimmy didn't look quite as worried now. This harrowing rescue operation had gone far better than they could have hoped. Sammy wasn't as worried about Quinn going back down into the water this time. Awed by his fearless skill, she watched as he grabbed Jeb's body and secured the dead man to his harness. Quinn gave the signal for Jimmy to bring them up. Again, she reached over to help bring Quinn and Jeb up and into the chopper. Pulling Jeb so that he was lying face up, she took note of the bullet wound in his chest. It didn't have to be this way, she said to her dead partner. I'm sorry, Sammy. Quinn rested his hand on her arm as Jimmy released the harness. I wish you hadn't been forced to shoot. I'm okay, she managed to smile conscious of the fact that both Jimmy and Porter could hear their conversation. Let's get out of here. 
Roger that, Porter drawled. Jimmy grinned as he closed the chopper door. The pilot lifted the bird upward, then banked the nose to head back to shore. Sammy looked from the bound gunman to Jeb's dead body, taking some solace in knowing the danger was over. Yet that meant her time with Quinn would end too. Quinn watched Sammy closely, amazed at her strength and determination. Despite being kidnapped at gunpoint, then suffering hypothermia, she'd stepped up to assist in this risky rescue. The entire time he dangled over the water above the drowning gunman, he'd expected to feel the impact of a bullet. When the shot had rung out, he'd braced for pain. Jeb's body had jolted beneath the impact of an M16 slug. Without that threat hanging over him, Quinn had focused on saving the drowning man Jeb had shoved off the boat. The big man had been pathetically grateful to be rescued, so much so that he'd followed Quinn's instructions to the letter. Glancing at the bound man now, Quinn felt certain he'd confess everything he knew about Jeb's role in leaking information about the undercover op to the Robles cartel. Quinn wished he could talk to Sammy alone, but this wasn't the time or the place, not with the crew listening in. He'd tried to reassure her with his smile, but she still looked sad. Taking a life, even in self-defense or to protect others, had a way of doing that to a person. Porter made good time getting them back to the Coast Guard headquarters. Even then, he needed to hand custody of the big gunman, who finally admitted his name was Will Newton, to the police. Once that had been taken care of, his first call was to his brother Brady. Sammy and I are fine, he quickly assured him. We have one perp in custody, guy by the name of William Newton. Jeb Hale, Sammy's former partner, was killed during the altercation. I'm happy to hear your voice, bro. Relief laced Brady's tone. I have news, too. Looks like Jeb Hale wasn't the only DEA leak. Quinn scowled and instinctively glanced around the area. Sammy was inside talking to his commander, but he worried about another threat. What do you mean? Is someone still coming after Sammy? Not anymore, Brady said. I was at the hospital with Bridges, waiting to hear an update on his surgery when... His boss, Hugh Morey, came in. We hadn't called him, so I didn't understand how he'd known about the meeting at the Welch family restaurant and the exchange of gunfire there. Quinn's pulse quickened. Wouldn't Bridges have mentioned it to him? I know he didn't. Brady's voice was hard. When Bridges was injured, he told Mark at the scene that he didn't understand how this had happened since he hadn't told anyone about it, not even his boss. Mark had told the officers to keep the DEA agent's identity confidential because of the undercover op. The call about gunfire had gone out, but there was no way Maury could have known about Bridges being injured unless he already knew about the meeting. Quinn tightened his grip on his phone. Where is Maury now? I arrested him on the spot, throwing him against the wall and cuffing him. He was so caught off guard that I was able to do that without backup. I called Mark and we dragged him down to our FBI offices. He tried claiming Bridges did update him about the meeting, then shut down when Mark assured him that was not true. Our boss quickly learned that Maury had tapped into Bridges' office line. We're still sorting out the details, but it looks like he's another guilty party. Quinn couldn't believe what he was hearing. With two bad guys working against Sammy, it's a miracle she survived at all. I know. It's a good thing you were the one to rescue her from the boat explosion, Brady admitted. You might want to call Rye. He's worried about you. I will. Quinn knew his being there to rescue Sammy was part of God's plan, and he was grateful to know the danger was truly over. He caught a glimpse of Sammy coming toward him. Her wet clothes still stuck to her skin, despite how they'd used towels on the chopper to take care of most of the water. She'd given her statement to Lieutenant Commander Calderon, and he knew his turn was coming as well. The military needed to justify using expensive resources like the chopper, so he didn't mind. He turned his attention to Brady. It may be a while before I can call him. Then shoot him a text, Brady said firmly. Everyone in the family has been praying for you and Sammy. They need to know you're both safe and unharmed. Will do. Gotta go. Quinn ended the call, 
then sent a quick text on the family loop, assuring each of his eight siblings that he and Sammy were safe. Ignoring the pings of their responses, he hurried over to meet up with Sammy and Calderon. I'll need to report on this ASAP, Finnegan. His boss paused, then added, I'm glad you're both safe. Yes, sir. Thank you. It was a little dicey. Sammy lifted a brow at the understatement. I'm happy to provide my statement now, too. Fine. His boss gestured for Quinn to follow. He caught Sammy's hand in a quick squeeze. Wait for me, please. Sure. She looked exhausted, and he couldn't blame her. At least the heat from the July sun had brought some color back to her cheeks. Quinn stood at attention as he filled his boss in on the chopper rescue and the shooting of Jeb Hale. Calderon didn't ask too many questions, probably because he'd already gotten the details from Sammy. You have two more days of leave, Calderon said when he'd finished. Get me that report, then rest up. I need you fresh for duty, understand? Yes, sir. Dismissed. When Quinn turned to go, he added, Nice work, Finnegan. Thank you, sir. Quinn paused at the doorway. We need to make sure the DEA doesn't pull another undercover stunt like this. We should have been a part of the information loop. Tell me about it, Calderon muttered harshly. My brother Brady has arrested Hugh Morey. He's the DEA agent in charge of the Milwaukee office. The sooner you set up a meeting with the director of the DEA, the better. Quinn abruptly realized he was telling his boss what to do and quickly amended. I mean, if you think that's the right thing to do, sir. Yeah. Thankfully, his boss didn't take offense. Trust me, that was already part of my agenda. Enjoy your two days off, Finnegan. Yes, sir. Quinn hurried back outside, anxious to find Sammy. Scanning the area, he finally spied her sitting out on the pier, her face lifted to the sun. He strode over and dropped beside her. Sammy, how are you holding up? Fine. She turned to look at him, squinting against the bright sunlight. How did it go with the commander? Good. He tried not to frown at the awkwardness between them. By the way, Bridges was clean. My brother Brady and Mark Callahan ended up arresting Doug's boss, Hugh Morey. Sammy's jaw dropped in shock. Jeb wasn't the only traitor working for the cartel? No, he wasn't. Quinn edged closer so he could put his arm around Sammy's slim shoulders. The good news is that you're safe now. With Jeb and Hugh out of the way, I'm sure the Robles cartel will take a break from running fentanyl through the Great Lakes. He scowled. Especially since the Coast Guard will be on hyper alert for anything remotely suspicious. That's good news. Sammy said the words, but her expression didn't look happy. I need to follow up with the L.A. DEA office. I have key information to give them. Quinn didn't want to talk about work, the DEA or the Coast Guard. He drew her closer. Sammy, you said you remembered your foster sister, Rita Gomez, had died because of fentanyl. Is that the only reason you broke off our engagement? She hesitated for a long moment, then leaned against him. Yes, Quinn. Rita didn't die of an overdose of fentanyl, though. She was murdered, along with her husband and two-year-old son. Apparently, they tried to get out of the cartel, so they were shot to death. That's awful, he murmured. I didn't want to leave you, but I felt obligated to head to California to search for the truth. That's when I was approached by the DEA to go undercover to infiltrate the Robles cartel. They faked my death created an identity for me, partnered me with Jeb, and set up Emilio as my contact. They sent me into the organization, and my ability to speak some Spanish, along with my experience here, helped me get embedded in the Great Lakes pipeline. The danger she'd placed herself in made him feel sick to his stomach. He wanted to yell at her for doing such a thing, but managed to bite his tongue. What if Kylie, Alana, or Ellie had been killed by a drug cartel? He would have done the exact same thing without a second thought. No, he couldn't blame her, even if she had hurt him. As if the breakup wasn't bad enough, 
he'd thought she was dead, gone forever. I knew it was a risk, Sammy said, reading his mind. But I thought Jeb had my back. We grew close in those early months. I never suspected he was dirty. Not until the night I confided that I'd learned the identity of the highest level drug cartel leader operating in the region. That night, two cartel members came after me. She shook her head in disgust. I hate to know how many people died because of his greed. Emilio, for sure. But how many others? I don't know, Sammy. He felt bad for her. Being betrayed by someone you trusted was never easy. I'm just glad you're okay. I was scared out of my mind when you were taken from the strip mall. It's my fault for splitting us up. She sighed, looking up at him. I'm sorry you had to be in a position to rescue me for a second time. I'm not sorry. I insisted on being involved in bringing you back. And he'd have done it again in a heartbeat. I feel awful that you found my fake death notice. Her tortured gaze met his. I hadn't anticipated that. Yeah, that was rough. Another understatement, but there was no point in rehashing the past. He was more interested in the future. Their future. If they had one, there was only one way to find out. I'm glad I was here for you because I love you, Sammy. She gaped. You do? Even after everything that happened? You mean ditching me to run across the country to seek justice for a sibling? He kept his voice light and teasing. Yes, I do mean it. I never stopped loving you. Oh, Quinn. She beamed, this time her smile fully reflected in her eyes. I love you too. I didn't want to leave you, but it didn't feel right to ask you to wait for me. Not when I had no idea how long I'd be gone. Say it again he urged. She smiled gently. I love you. I wanted to tell you on the helicopter before you dropped into danger, but... You didn't want everyone else to hear? He chuckled, then shouted at the top of his lungs, I love Sammy Lopez. Quinn, what are you doing? She rolled her eyes. You're such a goof. No, I'm just a man in love. He lowered his mouth and kissed her the way he'd wanted to when they were safely aboard the chopper, and when they'd gotten here to headquarters. And, always, he never wanted to stop kissing her. Well, I see you two patched things up. The familiar dry tone forced them apart. Quinn looked over his shoulder to scowl at Colin. Why are you here? Can't you see we're busy? Go away, come back later. Quinn! Sammy lightly elbowed him in the ribs. That's no way to treat your family. He sighed and reluctantly released her. He stood, then drew her upright beside him, then faced his younger brother. Colin wore his firefighter uniform, indicating he was on the job. A better question is, what are you doing here, Colin? Don't you have fires to fight or people to patch up? Normally, yes, but you didn't answer any of our group text messages. Colin gave Quinn a narrow stare. Since my firehouse isn't too far from here, Rye asked me to check in on you. Colin waved at the boxy fire station ambulance rig. We came over here to fill up with fuel, just so I could make sure you weren't hurt. I told everyone on the text message loop that I was fine. Quinn loved his family, but sometimes their overprotective attitude went a little too far. Yeah, well, Rye takes his role as head of the Finnegan family seriously. Colin shrugged, then grinned. So, what happened? Are you going to fill me in? Not now. Quinn wasn't in the mood to rehash the last few hours all over again, especially since he'd have to have the same conversation with Rye, Taryn, Kylie, Brady, Aiden, Alana, and Ellie, too. I have two more days off work. I'll bring Sammy to family dinner on Sunday. We'll fill the family in then. Cruel to make us wait, bro. Colin protested. How much do you want to bet that Rye will pry the story out of you and Sammy before then? No deal. Quinn made a shooing motion with his hand. Go, get back to work. No malingering allowed. You're such a pain, Colin complained. 
Then he shook his head, clapped Quinn on the shoulder, and smiled at Sammy. See you Sunday. Be safe, Colin, Sammy called as his brother jogged back to the rig. Colin waved a hand, then jumped into the passenger seat. Minutes later, they were gone. Quinn pulled Sammy back into his arms. Now, where were we? He teased. In answer, Sammy wound her arms around his neck, drawing him down for another kiss. Quinn! He wanted to groan when he heard Brady's voice. We're not even at the homestead, and it's still like being in Grand Central Station, Sammy muttered. Sorry. He turned to face his brother. The serious expression on his face made his gut clench. What happened? Did Bridges take a turn for the worse? No, but the FBI received a somewhat cryptic message from a man named Emilio Vasquez. Brady looked at Sammy. Do you know him? I do, but Jeb said he'd killed him. Sammy grabbed Quinn's hand. Wait, Jeb didn't actually say that, but led me to believe it. Emilio is alive? We need to get to Shady Lane. No need. Vasquez is on his way here. He said he didn't trust his former contact and feared for his life. He asked the FBI to keep him safe. Brady sighed. I had a feeling he meant you, Sammy, that you were his former contact. I thought you would want to be involved in this. I am, but I didn't recognize him when we were in Shady Lane. Sammy's gaze was stricken. And yes, of course I want to be involved. Emilio needs to know about my amnesia and that Jeb and Hugh are no longer a threat. Quinn released Sammy and nodded. I agree. As much as he would rather spend his two days off with Sammy, they needed to wrap up the loose ends. Besides, the Sammy he knew and loved had taken her job as a cop just as seriously as he did. Let's go meet with him. Brady flashed a knowing grin. You have a few minutes before we hit the road. You know, in case you'd like to pick up where you left off. Don't be a brat, Brady. Quinn gave his brother a hard stare. First Colin, then you. Should I expect Rye to show up next? Well, Rye is planning to meet us at the Bureau, Brady admitted. He wants to hear the entire story too. Of course he does, Quinn sighed. So much for waiting until family dinner, Sammy teased. Good thing you didn't take Colin's bet. I should have known better. He gathered Sammy close and kissed her again, ignoring Brady's keen gaze. Don't think this lets you off the hook, though. You're still coming to family dinner. She arched a brow and he quickly added, Please, I love you so much. I love you too. And yes, I'll come to family dinner. But I will likely need to head back to L.A. to wrap up some loose ends on the case. I don't mind, as long as you come back to me. Yes, Quinn, I will absolutely come back. Her serious gaze held his. You have my heart. As you have mine, Sammy. Quinn wrapped his arm around her as they headed toward Brady's waiting SUV. He knew the rest of the summer would be busy, with his being with the Coast Guard and her wrapping up things in L.A. But love was worth waiting for. Epilogue Three weeks later Sammy drove up the driveway of the Finnegan homestead, parking behind Quinn's repaired SUV. Her time in L.A. had been spent in endless meetings to assist in getting more members of the Robles cartel arrested and charged with drug trafficking. Taking down the head honcho she'd discovered before Jeb had tried to kill her helped tremendously. Emilio Vasquez had given them some additional information, too. He was then rewarded with a new name and identity. She knew Emilio was currently living someplace in Florida per his request. She kept him in her nightly prayers. Only after all the higher-ups had been satisfied, there was nothing more she could tell them about the Robles cartel, had she been allowed to relocate back to Milwaukee. Quinn had insisted she stay at the family home, rather than moving into a short-term rental. Since she'd needed to get her old job back before she could rent an apartment, she'd agreed. Ellie had been thrilled, and Quinn often stopped over between shifts, which was nice. Rye and Devin had made her feel at home. None of the Finnegans had held her previous breakup with Quinn against her, especially after hearing the entire story. 
she was touched by their sweet acceptance of her being back together with Quinn. While Sammy enjoyed Ellie's company, and getting to know Devin too, she knew this arrangement couldn't last forever. She'd need to find a place to live very soon. It was Friday evening, and this was Quinn's first full weekend off since the five-day emergency leave he'd taken to keep her safe while she had amnesia. He'd had other days off, of course, but not over the weekend. Quinn had assured her he wasn't being punished by his commander, but that he was doing his part to pay his teammates back for the extra shifts they'd taken for him. Fair enough, she'd thought. This weekend, Sammy intended to ask Quinn to help her find an apartment close to his condo. He wouldn't want her to leave the homestead, but that was too bad. The Finnegans were great, but they were always around. She and Quinn needed time alone together to reestablish their relationship. Although personally, she had fallen back into the old routine so easily, it almost felt as if she'd never left. As if that time she'd spent in L.A. and those endless months, 18 of them working undercover, were nothing but a blur. Even the nightmares she'd experienced after killing Jeb had faded. She tapped the code into the alarm system and went in through the garage door. Quinn jumped to his feet and swept her into his arms. After a long kiss, he pulled back to look down at her. Well, how did it go? They gave me my old job back. She grinned when he let out a whoop. Apparently, working undercover and nearly getting killed was a boost to my resume. Hey, they know a great cop when they see one, Quinn said proudly. That they do, Rye agreed. We're happy for you, Sammy. Thanks. Rye and Devin were so sweet the way they clung to each other, Rye's hand often resting over Devin's slightly rounded stomach. Their shining love was the gold standard for the rest of the family, even for her and Quinn. Quinn grabbed her hand. Come on, let's go outside. Dinner in an hour, Devin called as they headed to the back door. Sammy raised her hand to indicate she'd heard. Quinn deactivated the alarm, then drew her outside. He took a moment to reactivate it, then tugged her into the shade of the large maple tree. Finally some alone time, he whispered, before kissing her again. When they needed to breathe, she said, Yeah, about that. I think it's time to find a place of my own. I'd rather you wait a bit. Quinn reached into his pocket and pulled out a small velvet box. I thought about taking you back to the fire tower for this, but figured we should start fresh, here, near our family. I love you, Sammy. Will you please marry me? Oh, Quinn. Tears misted her eyes when she saw her old engagement ring nestled inside. You kept it. It's yours, Sammy. I bought it for you. He took the ring out and slipped it onto her ring finger. Marry me. Yes, Quinn. She wound her arms around his neck. I love you. Promise me you won't leave without telling me what's going on, he murmured. I promise. She gazed into his warm brown eyes. I'm never leaving you again. I like the sound of that. He cradled her close, kissing her again. After a few minutes, he said, Oh, and one more thing. Should I start making a list? Maybe. His smile faded. Let's have a small wedding at the church. No big extravagant ceremony, just our family and closest friends. A September wedding would be good, don't you think? This fall? She tried not to stare at him as if he were crazy. So soon? Yes, the sooner the better. He tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear. Stay here for a few more weeks. I'll put my condo up for sale, and we'll find a nice place that we both love. A small, intimate wedding and a house of our own, she murmured. Her heart swelled with love. Sounds perfect, Quinn. Not as perfect as you. She wasn't perfect, and neither was he. But together, they were complete.